The Travels of Ibn Battuta, translated by Samuel Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta, Chapter 1. Tangiers, Tillemson, Miliana, Algiers, Bijana, Cosentina, Buna, Tunis, Susa, Sajakas, Cabas, Tripoli, Meslata. In the name of the compassionate and merciful God, praise be ascribed to God, the Lord of the Worlds, and the blessing of God be upon our Lord Muhammad and upon all his posterity and companions. But to proceed, the poor and the needy of the forgiveness of his bountiful Lord, Muhammad ibn Fatah Allah al Baluni, states that the following is what he extracted from the epitome of the Khatib Muhammad ibn Jazi al Kelbi, upon whom be the mercy of God, from the travels of the theologian Abu Abd Allah Muhammad ibn Abd Allah al Lawati of Tangiers, known by the surname of Ibn Battuta and that he did not extract anything except what he believed was strange and unknown, or known by report but not to be believed on account of its rarity, and the frequent carelessness of historians in delivering down what has been reported, but what he himself considered as true, in consequence of the fidelity of the traveler, and because he had written down what he believed to be credible from histories of various nations and countries and because that which has been reported by faithful witnesses generally receives credit and excites inquiry some of his statements indeed are opposed to the statements of others as for instance his account of what he saw in the aromatic roots of hindustan which differ from those given by the physicians and yet his accounts are probably the true ones the sheikh ibn battuta the author of these travels left his native city tangiers for the purpose of performing the pilgrimage in the seven hundred and twenty-fifth year of the hajira a d thirteen twenty four to thirteen twenty five i shall mention here only the names of some of the districts through which he passed although this may contribute but little towards impressing the reader with the greatness of his courage his religious confidence or his indefatigable perseverance in overcoming the difficulties of passing deserts and of crossing mountains the first city, therefore, at which he arrived was Tilimsan, and the next Miljana, and the next Algiers, and the next Bijana, and the next Cosentina, and the next Buna, and the next Tunis, and the next Sawasa, and the next Safakus. Ibn Jazil Kelbi states that on this place the following verses were written by Ibn Habib el Tanuki. May showers enrich thy happy soil, fair land, where fanes and towers arise. On thee let sainted pilgrims pour the richest blessings of the skies. The wave that round thy bosom plays, conscious of its endearing retreat, when rude tempest rocks thy domes, in sighs resigns its happy seat. Yet urged another glance to steal, of thy loved form so good, so fair, flies to avoid the painful view of rival lovers basking thence. And on the other hand, Abu Abd Allah Muhammad ibn Abi Tamin has said, See the swelling angry tide, rage and beat against her side, but only ask a moment's stay. It hisses, foams, and rolls away. The next city was that of Cabas, the next Tripoli. Ibn Battuta has stated that he passed on to Meslada and Mezurata, and the Khazra Surt, or the palaces of Surt. We then passed, says he, the low grounds, which may also mean the forest, and proceeded to the palace of Barsis the Devotee, to the Kabat el Islam, and to the city of Alexandria, where we saw one of the most learned men, the judge Fakir Odin el Riki, whose grandfather is said to have been an inhabitant of Rika. This man was exceedingly assiduous in acquiring learning. He traveled to Hejaz, and thence to Alexandria, where he arrived in the evening of the day. He was rather poor, and he would not enter the city until he had witnessed some favorable omen. He sat accordingly near the gate until all the persons had gone in and it was nearly time for closing the gate. The keeper of the gate was irritated at his delay and said to him ironically, Enter, Mr. Judge. He replied, Yes, Judge, if that be God's will. After this, he entered one of the colleges and attended to reading, following the example of others who had attended to eminence, until his name and reputation for modesty and religion reached the ears of the king of Egypt. About this time the judge of Alexandria died. The number of learned men in Alexandria who expected this appointment was large, 
but of these the sheik was the only one who entertained no expectations of it. The sultan, however, sent it to him, and he was admitted to the office, which he filled with great integrity and moderation, and hence obtained great fame. Chapter 2 Alexandria, Taruja, Tamanhur, Fawa, Faraskur, Ashman al Roman, Samanud, Cairo. One of the great saints in Alexandria at this time was the learned and pious Imam Borhan Odin el Araj, a man who had the power of working miracles. I one day went to him when he said, I perceive that you are fond of traveling into various countries. I said yes, although I had at that time no intention of traveling into very distant parts. He replied, You must visit my brother Farid Odin in India, and my brother Roku Odin ibn Zakaria in Sindia, and also my brother Borhan Odin in China, and, when you see them, present my compliments to them. I was astonished with what he said, and determined myself to visit these countries, nor did I give up my purpose till I'd met all three mentioned by him and presented his compliments to them. Another singular man was Sheikh Yakut, the Abyssinian, disciple of the Sheikh Abu Abbas al-Mursi. This Abu Abbas was the disciple of the servant of God, Abu el-Hassan al-Shadali, the author of the Hizb el-Bar, famous for his piety and miracles. I was told by the Sheikh Yakut from his preceptor Abu al-Abbas al-Mursi that the Sheikh Abu al-Hassan al-Shadali performed the pilgrimage annually, making his way through Upper Egypt and passing over to Mecca in the month of Rajab, and so remaining there till the conclusion of the pilgrimage, that he visited the holy tomb and returned by the great passage to his city. On one of these occasions, and which happened to be the last, he said to his servant, Get together an axe, a casket, and some spice, and whatever is necessary for the interment of a dead body. The servant replied, And why, sir, should I do this? He rejoined, You shall see Homaitara. Now, Homaitara is situated in Upper Egypt. It is a stage of the great desert of Idhab, in which there is a well of very pernicious and poisonous water. When he had got to Homaitara, the sheikh bathed himself, and had performed two of the prostrations of his prayers, when he died. He was then buried there. Ibn Battuta states that he visited the tomb, and saw upon it an inscription tracing his pedigree up to Hussein, the son of Ali. I heard, continues the traveler, in Alexandria, by the sheikh el Sali el Abid el Munfiq, of the character of Abu Abd Allah el Murshidi, and that he was one of the great interpreting saints, secluded in Minyat of Ibn Murshid, and that he had there a cell, but was without either servant or companion. Here he was visited daily by emirs, viziers, and crowds of other people, whose principal object it was to eat with him. He accordingly gave them food, such as they severally wished to have, of victuals, fruits, or sweetmeats, a circumstance which has seldom taken place in any days but his. To him also do the learned come for patents of office or dismissal. These were his constant and well-known practices. The Sultan of Egypt, too, El Malik El Nazar, often visited him in his cell. I then left Alexandria, says the traveler, with the intention of visiting this sheik, may God bless him, and got to the village of Teruja, then to the city of Damanhur, the metropolis of the Delta, then to Fawa, not far from which is the cell of Sheikh Abu Abd Allah El Murshidi. I went to it and entered when the Sheikh arose and embraced me. He then brought out victuals and ate with me. After this I slept upon the roof of his cell and saw in a dream the same night myself placed on the wings of a great bird, which fled away with me towards the temple at Mecca. He then verged towards Yemen, then towards the east. He then took his course to the south. After this he went far away into the east and alighted with me safely in the regions of darkness, or the Arctic regions, where he left me. I was astonished at this vision, and said to myself, No doubt the sheik will interpret it for me, for he said to do things of this sort. When the morning had arrived and I was about to perform my devotions, the sheik made me officiate. After this his usual visitors, consisting of emirs, viziers, and others, made their calls upon him, and took their leave, after each had received a small cake from him. When the prayer at noon was over, he called me. I then told him my dream, and he interpreted it for me. He said, You will perform the pilgrimage and visit the tomb of the Prophet. You will then transverse the countries of Yemen, Iraq, Turkey, and India, and will remain in these some time. In India you will meet my brother Dilshad, who will save you from a calamity in which you will happen to fall. He then provided me with some dried cakes and some dirhams, and I bade him farewell. Ever since I left him, I experienced nothing but good fortune in my travels, but never met with a person like him, except my lord El-Wali Muhammad El-Mawala in India, 
I next came to the city of Narait, and then Al Mahala El Cobra, or the Great Station. From this I went to El Barlas, then to Damieta, from which is the cell of Sheikh Jamal Odin El Sawi, the leader of a sect called the Karenders. These are they who shave their chins and their eyebrows. It is said that the reason which induced the Sheikh to shave off his beard and his eyebrows was the following. He was a well-made and handsome man, and one of the women of Sawa consequently fell in love with him. After this, she was constantly sending to the sheik, presenting herself to him in the street, and otherwise soliciting his society. This he completely resisted. When she was tired of this, she suborned an old woman to stop him on his way to the mosque, with a sealed letter in her hand. When the sheik passed by her, she said, "'Good sir, can you read?' "'Yes,' he replied." She said, This letter has been sent to me by my son. I wish you would read it for me. He answered, I will. But when she had opened the letter, she said, Good sir, my son has a wife who is in yonder house. Could I beg the favor of your reading the letter at the door, so that she may hear? To this he also assented. But when he had got through the first door, the old woman closed it, and out came the woman with her slaves, and hung about him. They then took him into an inner apartment. The mistress began to take liberties with him. When the sheikh saw that there was no escaping, he said, I will do what you like. Show me a sleeping room. This she did. He then took in with him some water and a razor, which he had, and shaved off his beard and both his eyebrows. He then presented himself to the woman, who, detesting both his person and his deed, ordered him to be driven out of the house. Thus, by divine providence, was his chastity preserved. This appearance he retained ever after, and everyone who embraced his opinions also submitted to the shaving off of his beard and both of his eyebrows. It is also said of the Sheikh Jamal Odin that after he had gone through Damietta, he consistently attended the burial grounds of that place. There was at that time in Damietta a judge known by the name of Ibn Omayyid, who, attending one day at the funerals of one of the nobles, saw the Sheikh in the burial ground, and said to him, You are a beastly old fellow. He replied, And you are a foolish judge, who can pass with your beast amongst the tombs, and know at the same time that the respect due to a dead man is just as great as that due to a living one. The judge replied, Worse than this is the shaving off of your beard. The sheikh said, Mark me, and then he rubbed a little alcohol on his eyebrows, and lifted up his head, presenting a great black beard, which very much astonished the judge and those with him, so that the judge descended from his mule. The sheikh applied the alcohol the second time, and lifting up his head, exhibited a beautiful white beard. He then applied the alcohol a third time, and, when he lifted up his head, his face was as beardless as before. The judge then kissed his hand and became his disciple, and building a handsome cell for him became his companion for the rest of his life. After a while, the sheikh died and was buried in his cell. And when the judge died, he was buried, as it had been expressed in his will, in the doorway of the cell, so that everyone who should visit the tomb of the sheikh would have to pass over his grave. I then proceeded from this place to the city of Fariskur, then to Ashmun al roman and then to the city of Samanud, then to Cairo, the principal city of its district. The Nile, which runs through this country, excels all other rivers in the sweetness of its taste, the extent of its progress, and the greatness of the benefits it confers. It is one of the five great rivers of the world, which are itself the Euphrates, the Tigris, the Shahun, and the Jaihan, or the Gihon. Five other rivers, too, may be compared with them, namely, the river of Sindhya, which is called the Punjab, or Five Waters, the river of India, which is called the Gung, or the Ganges, to which the Indians perform their pilgrimage, and into which they throw the ashes of their dead when burnt. They say it descends from paradise. Also, the river Jun, or Jumna, the river Athil, or Volga, in the desert of Kifchuk, and the river of Sarv in Tartary, upon the bank of which is the city of Kanbalik, and which flows from that place to Elkansa, and thence to the city of Zaitun in China, of which we shall give accounts in their proper places. The course of the Nile, moreover, is in a direction from the south to the north, contrary to that of all other rivers. When I entered Egypt, the reigning prince was El-Malik El-Nasir Muhammad ibn El-Malik El-Mansir Kalawan. The learned men then in Egypt were Shams Odin Isfahani, the first man in the world in metaphysics, Rokan Odin ibn al Qariya, one of the first leaders in the same science, and the Sheikh Athir Odin Abu Hainan of Granada, the greatest grammarian. End of chapter 1 and 2. The Travels of Ibn Battuta, translated by Samuel Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta, Chapter 3 Upper Egypt, Bausch, Dilas, Biba, Banasa, Minyat, Ibn Kasib, Manlaz, Manfalut, Ensoyut, Ekmim, Hawa, Kana, Kaus, El Aksar, Armanat, Esna, Edfu, Ajarna, El Fil, El Atwani, Dugain, Homaitara, Aidhab, Cairo. The traveler continues, I then left Cairo with the intention of going on pilgrimage by way of Upper Egypt, and then came to Der el Tin, or the Monastery of Clay. From this place I went to Bausch, then to Dilas, then to Biba, then to Banasa, then to the Minyet of Ibn Kasib, which was formerly attached to the government of Cairo. It is said that one of the caliphs of the house of Abbas was displeased with the people of Egypt, and took it into his head to place over them one of the meanest of his slaves by way of punishment, and that he might afford an example to the others. At this time Kasib was the lowest slave in the place, and his business was to get the baths warmed. He was accordingly appointed to the government with the hopes that he would sufficiently punish them by his tyranny, as it is usual with those who have not been brought up for such a station. But when Kasib was established in Egypt, his conduct was exemplary in the extreme, and for this his fame was spread far and wide. The consequence was that he was visited by the relations of the caliph and other persons attached to the court, and these he loaded with presents. On one of these occasions the caliph missed some of his relations, and upon inquiry found that one of them had absented himself. After a time this man presented himself to the caliph, who interrogated him as to his absence. The man replied that he had been paying a visit to Kasib in Egypt. He then told him of the gifts he had received, which were indeed of great value. This enraged the caliph, so that he ordered the eyes of Kasib to be put out, that he should be expelled from Egypt and cast out into one of the streets of Baghdad. When the order for his apprehension arrived, it was served to him by an artifice at some distance from his palace. He had with him, however, a large ruby which he had hidden by sewing it up in his shirt during the night. His eyes were then put out, and he was thrown out in a street of Baghdad. Upon this occasion, a poet happened to pass by, who said, O Kasib, it was my intention to visit thee in Egypt in order to recite thy praises, but thy coming hither is more suitable to me. Will you then allow me to recite my poem? How, said Kasib, shall I hear it? You know what circumstances I am in. The poet replied, My only wish is that you hear it. But as to reward, may God reward you as you have others. Kasib then said, Go on with your verse. The poet proceeded. Thy bounties like the swelling Nile made the plains of Egypt smile. When he had got to the end of the poem, Kasib said, Open the seam. He did so, and Kasib then said, Take this ruby. The poet refused, but being adjured to do so, he complied. He then went to the street of the jewelers and offered it for sale. He was told that such a stone could belong to none other but the caliph. The account of it was accordingly carried to him, who ordered the poet to be brought into his presence. When he came there, he was interrogated on the subject, and his answer developed the whole matter. The caliph was then sorry for what he had done to Kasib, in order that he should be brought before him. When he came, the caliph gave him some splendid presents, and ordered that he should be given whatever he might wish. Kasib requested to have this minette given to him, which was done and he resided there until the time of his death. After this, his descendants held it until the family became extinct. I then proceeded to the city of Manlawi, then to Manfalut, then to Esuyut, then to Ekmim, then to Hawa. Here I visited the sheikh Sayyid Abu Muhammad Obaid Allah El Hassani, who was one of the great saints. When he asked me what my object was, I told him that it was my wish to perform the pilgrimage by way of Jeddah. He replied, You will not succeed in this upon this occasion. You had better return, therefore, for the first pilgrimage you will perform will be the plain of Syria. When I left him, I made no effort to follow his advice, but proceeded on my way until I arrived at Idhab, and I found that I could not go on. I then returned to Cairo, and after that to Syria or Damascus. And the way I took in my first pilgrimage was just as the Sharif had told me, by the plain of Syria. From Hawa, therefore, I proceeded to Kana, then to Kaus, then to the city of Al-Aksar, then to Armanat, then to Esna, then to Edfu, then to Ajarna el fil then to the village of El-Atwani, in the company of a tribe of Arabs known by the name of Dugaim. 
Our course was through a desert in which there were no buildings for a distance of fifteen days. One of the stages at which we halted was Homaichara, the place in which the grave of El Wali Abul Hassan El Shadheli is situated. After this, we came to the city of Aithab, the inhabitants of which are the Beja, who are blacks. Among these people, the daughter never succeeds to property. At this time, two-thirds of the revenue of Aithab went to the king of the Beja, whose name was El Hadrabi. The remaining third went to the king of Egypt. The cause of Renat proceeding thence to Jeddah was a war that had broken out in these parts between the Beja and the Barnau. I accordingly returned with the Arabs to Kaz in Upper Egypt and descended by the Nile to Cairo where I lodged one night and then set out for Syria. This happened in the month Shaban in the year 26. Anno Hijrai 726 or Anno Domini 1326. Chapter 4 Bulbis, El Salihia, El Sawada, El Warid, Kataya, Matilab, El Arish, El Karuba, Rafaj, Gaza, El Khalil. After this I arrived at Balbis, then at El Salahia. From this place I entered the sands, or desert, in which are the stages El Sawada, El Warid, Kataya, Matilab, El Arish, El Karuba, and Rafaj. At each of these there is an inn, which they call El Khan. Here the travelers put up with their beasts. Here are also watering camels, as well as shops, so that the traveler may purchase whatever he may either want for himself or his beast. I next arrived at Gaza, and from there proceeded to the city of El Khalil Ibrahim, Abraham the friend. In the mosque of this place is the holy cave, and in this are the tombs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with those of their wives. This cave I visited. As to the truth of these being the graves of those persons, the following is an extract made by me from the work of Ali ibn Jafar al-Razi, entitled El Musfir Likulab, on the true position of the graves of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and which rests on a tradition from Abu Huraira, who has said, it was related by the prophet that when he was on his night journey to Jerusalem, Gabriel took him by the grave of Abraham and said, Descend and perform two prostrations, for here is the tomb of Abraham thy father. He then took him by Bethlehem and said, Perform two prostrations, for here was born thy brother Jesus. He then went on with him to El Sakrat and so on, as recorded in the tradition. In the city of El Khalil was the aged saint and imam, Borhan Odin El Jabari. Him I asked respecting the truth of the grave of Abraham being there. He answered, Every learned man I have met with has considered this as fact, that these three graves are the grave of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the three graves opposite to them are those of their wives. Nor does any one, continued he, think of the contradicting accounts so generally received from the ancients but the heretics. Chapter 5 Jerusalem, Ascalon, El Ramla, Naplus, Bawad, El Gar, El Kosair, Aka, Tyre, Sidon, Tiberias, Beirut, Tripoli, Emesa, Hama, Marat El Numan, Sarmin, Aleppo, Tisin, Antioch, Sayun, Jabala, Laodicea, Mount Lebanus, Baalbek, Damascus. I then passed on to Jerusalem, and on the road visited the tomb of Jonas, and Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. But, as to the mosque of Jerusalem, it is said that there is no greater upon the face of the earth. And in sacredness, and privileges conferred, this place is the third. From Jerusalem I paid to visit to Ascalon, which was in ruins. In this place was the Meshed, famous for being the head of Hossein, before it was removed to Egypt. Without Ascalon is the Valley of the Bees, said to be that mentioned in the Quran. I next proceeded to El Ramla, then to Naplus, then to Eglon. From this place I set out for the maritime parts of Syria, passing by the route of Bawad between two mountains, and called El Gar. Here was the tomb of the guardian saint of this people, Abu Obedat Amir ibn El Jara, which I visited, and then passed by a village called El Kosair, in which was the tomb of Moad ibn Jabali, which I also visited. From this place I proceeded to Akka. In this is the tomb of Salih the prophet, which I visited. After this I arrived at the city of Tyre, 
which is a place wonderfully strong, being surrounded on three sides by the sea. Its harbor is one of those which has been much celebrated. I next visited Sidon, and from this place went to the parts of Tiberias, which it was my wish to see. The whole was, however, in ruins, but the magnitude of it was sufficient to show that it had been a large place. The place is wonderfully hot, as are also its waters. The lake is well known. Its length is six parasangs, its width three. In this town is a mosque, known by the Mosque of the Prophets, and in this is the tomb of Shoab, or Jethro, which I visited. I also visited the well of Joseph, which is famous in these parts. I next arrived at Beirut, which is on the seashore, and then set out to visit the tomb of Abu Yaqob Yosef, who is supposed to have been one of the kings of the West. It is situated in a place called Karknu, and upon it is a cell endowed by the Sultan Salah Odin ibn Ayyub. It is said that this Abu Yaqob lived by weaving mats. It is also said that he was hired to keep some orchards in Damascus for the Sultan Nur Odin the Martyr, the preceptor of Salah Odin. After he had been some time in this situation, Nur Odin happened to come into the orchard and ask of the keeper for a pomegranate. He brought several, one after another, each of which, however, had the appearance of being sour. It was said to him, Have you been all this while in the orchard and do not yet know a sweet pomegranate from a sour one? He replied, I was hired to keep the orchard, not to eat the pomegranates. By this the sultan knew who he was and sent for him accordingly, for he had had a dream in which he thought he had met Abu Yaqob and derived some advantage from him. When he was come, he believed he knew his countenance too and said, Are you not Abu Yaqob? He replied, I am. The sultan then rose and embraced him and made him sit by his side. After this, Abu Yaqob took the sultan into his house and entertained him out of his honest earnings, and with him the sultan remained some days. After this, Abu Yaqob escaped and could nowhere be found. The weather was, at this time, exceedingly cold, and Abu Yaqob had betaken himself to a village where he was honorably entertained by one of the villagers. This man had a daughter, whom he wished to dispose of in marriage, and on this account represented to Abu Yaqob the difficulty he experienced in affording him support. Upon this he was ordered to bring together all of the copper furniture he had provided for her dower, and, moreover, to borrow as much money as he could from his neighbors. The villager accordingly got together a considerable quantity of this metal. Abu Yaqob then dug a pit and put the hole into it. Upon this he made a fire which fused the metal. He then took out some elixir which he had had with him, and put it on the metal, and the hole became pure gold. When the next morning had arrived, Abu Yaqob wrote a letter to his host for Nur Odin the martyr, telling him to take out of this gold as much as he would need to make a handsome portion for the young woman also to give as much as would be sufficient to her father, and to expend the remainder in pious uses. He then made his escape by night. With this gold, Nur Odin built the infirmary which is at Damascus. I next arrived at Terabalus, or Tripoli, in Syria, which is a large city and may be compared with Damascus. From this place I went to the fortress of the Kurds, then to Emesa, and visited the tomb of Khalid ibn el-Walid, which is in its environs, I next arrived at the city of Hamah. The epitomator, Ibn Jazi al-Kelbi, says that the following verses were composed on this place by Abul Hassan ibn Said of Granada. May heaven from the seed of fair Hamah divide, the breath, thought, or glance which makes her repine. Wreak its vengeance on him who would part from her side, for the smiles of the fair or the juice of the vine. But when through her streets rolls triumphant along, Rebellion's foul tide in all currents so fair. Then who shall refrain from the glass and the song, When banquet is spread and so plentiful there? Yet when the full goblet goes round, let me view. Her breasts flow with sweets for her children within. Mark the tear of the mother, and then say, Oh, how true, how vile, yet how lovely's the city of sin. The following, too, has been composed on the same place. Heroes of Hama's happier days... Yours my theme, my tribute praise. Of you the recollections sweet, Hang on my heart and still we meet. And should the forgetfulness despoil, The flower it reared with so much pain, A sinner's tear shall drench the soil, And then twill sweetly bloom again. The Asi, sinner or ripple, Is a river of Hama. I next went to the city of Marat el-Numan. 
the place from which the patronymic of Abu el Ala el Mari is derived. It was named Marat el Numan because el Numam ibn Bashir, the Ansar and companion of the Prophet, lost a son there when he held the government of Amessa. Before this time, it was called Dat el Kusir, or endued with palaces. It is also said that it is so called from a mountain named Numan, which overhangs it. Without this place is the tomb of Omar ibn Abd al-Aziz, the commander of the faithful. After this I arrived at Sarmin, and then at Halib, or Aleppo. Its citadel is large and strong, and within it is a meshed, in which Abraham is said to have performed his devotions. On this place, al khalidi the poet of Saif al-Dalat ibn Hamdan, has said, Land of my heart, extended wide, rich in beauty, great in pride, around whose head to brave the storm, the rolling clouds a chaplet form. Here tis the imperial fires glow, anticipate the gloom below. About thy breast in harmless blaze the lightning too forever plays, and like the unveiling beauty's glance spreads round its charms to astonish and entrance. The following lines are by Jamaluddin Ali ibn Abu Mansub. Thy milky towers in proud array stop in its course the galaxy. When see the child at thy side, rise and sip the ambrosial tide. See to thy flocks the glory share, and crop the gems that glitter there. I then left Aleppo for Tizine, and soon after came to Antioch, before which is the river el -Asi. In this place is the tomb of Habib el najr which I visited. After this I arrived at the fortress of Bugras, next at that of el Kosair, then at that of el Shaghar. I next came to the city of Sayun, then to the fortress of El Kadmus, then to that of El Alikat, next to that of El Manikat, next to that of Maziaf, then to that of El Kaf. These fortresses all belong to the people called the Ismaila. They are also called the Fidawiya. No person can go amongst them except one of their own body. These people act as arrows for El Malik El Nasir. And, by their means, he comes at such of his enemies as are far removed from him, as in Iraq and other places. They have their various offices, and, when the sultan wishes to dispatch one of them to waylay any enemy, he bargains with him for the price of his blood. If the man succeeds and comes safely back, he gets the reward. But if he fails, it is given to his heirs. These men have poison knives, and with these they strike at the persons they are sent to kill. From the fortresses of the Fidawiya, I went to the city of Jabala, where I visited the tomb of Sheikh Awali al Sali Ibrahim ibn Adham, who had not succeeded to the kingdom from the father's, but from the mother's side. The father was originally one of the pious wandering fakirs. His story of giving up the throne is generally well known. I then proceeded to Laodicea, the king of which is said to seize by violence every ship within his power. I then proceeded to the fortress of El Markab then to the mountain of El Akra, then to Mount Libanus, which is the most fruitful mountain in the world, and on which are various fruits, fountains of water, and leafy shades. Nor is it destitute of those who have retired from the world and devoted themselves to God, numbers of which I saw. From this place I proceeded to Baalbek, and thence to Damascus in the month of Ramazan, and in the year 26. It has been said by the epitomator, Ibn Jazi al Kelbi that the Sharf Odin ibn Anin wrote the following lines on this place. Damascus, though the slanderer fill, worlds with thy blame I love thee still. Spot where alone the traveler meets, balmy winds in burly streets, where tearful streamlets weave their chains, yet joy and freedom bless the plains. Where to the gales with lusty love, fan into bloom the fainting grove. The following was written on the same place by the eminent judge Abd el Rahim el Basani. Lightning with thy pouring rain, how dost thou befriend the plain? Why, ere the morning's dawn arise, spreads terror through the Damascus skies? Is that thy flames may bid her glow, or gild her flowers' opening blow? Or that her plains refreshed be seen, filled with fruits and clothed in green? Yes, tis that blessings round may spring, and verdure make the valley sing.
The mosque of Damascus, termed El Amawi, is too well known to need descriptions here. Of its learned men, professors, and theologians of the sect of Hanbal, Taki Odin ibn Tamiya may be mentioned as one in great repute for his lectures, if we accept a few of his peculiarities. The people of Damascus, however, think very highly of him. In many instances, he has preached things to which the theologians have objected, and hence an information was laid against him to El Malik al Nasir, who sent for him to Egypt and there imprisoned him. When in prison, he published a commentary on the Quran in forty volumes entitled El Bar al Muhit. After this, he was liberated, but going again to Damascus, he returned to his old practices of preaching heterodoxy. I happened one Friday to be present when he was addressing a congregation from the pulpit, and this was one of his assertions. God came down, said he, to the heaven of this world, just as I now go down. And upon this he descended one of the steps of the pulpit. A theologian of the sect of Ibn Malik happened to be present, contradicted this, for which he was beaten by the congregation. The opponent, however, lodged an information with El Malik al Nasir who again cited the sheikh and put him in prison, where he continued till his death. He was afterwards buried at Damascus. Without the gate called El Jabiat are the tombs of Om Habiba, wife of the Prophet, and of her brother, Moawiyah, of Balal, the Moazin of the Prophet, and of Awis el Karani. The grave of the last, however, is said to be in the burying ground between the city and Syria, in which there is no building. It is also said to be in Safin with that of Ali. It is said by Ibn Jazi al Kelbi, the epitomator, that the latter is the truer opinion. Ibn Battuta proceeds Without Damascus on the way of the pilgrimage, it is the Mosque of the Foot which is held in great estimation, and in which there is a stone having upon it the print of the foot of Moses. In this mosque they offer up their prayers in times of distress. I myself was present at this mosque in the year 746, or A.D. 1345, when the people were assembled for the purpose of prayer against the plague, which had ceased on that very day. The number that died daily in Damascus had been 2,000, but the whole daily number, at the time I was present, amounted to 24,000. After prayers, however, the plague entirely ceased. On the north of Damascus is the mountain of Kasayun, in which is the cave where Abraham was born. From this cave he saw the sun, moon, and stars. There is also a village in Iraq called Burz, between El Hila and Baghdad, which is said to be the birthplace of Abraham. This is the truer notion. On the farther part of the Kasayun is the Mount of Flight and Assistance, the Asylum of Jesus. End of chapters 3 through 5「Section 3 of the Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta, translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 6, 7, and 8. Iraq, Persia, and Turkey. Chapter 6. El Arus, Nejd, El Kadesia, Meshed, Ali, Basrat, Kafaja, Kawarnak, Wazit, El Obala, Abadan, El Lar, Iraq, Magun, Ramin, Tostar. When things were ready, the Syrian pilgrims proceeded on their pilgrimage, and I myself with them, with the same intention. This turned out well, for, thank God, I duly performed the pilgrimage, and then proceeded with the pilgrims of Iraq to the tomb of the prophet at Medina. After three days, we descended into the valley of El Arus. We then entered the territory of Najd, and proceeded on in it till we came to El Kadizia the place in which the remarkable event happened, by which the fire worship of Persia was extinguished and the interest of Islamism advanced. 
this was at that time a great city but it is now only a small village we next proceeded to the city of meshed ali where the grave of ali is thought to be it is a handsome place and well peopled all the inhabitants however are of the hafiza or shia sect there is no governor here except a sort of tribune the inhabitants consist chiefly of rich and brave merchants about the gardens are plastered walls adorned with paintings and within them are carpets couches and lamps of gold and silver within the city is a large treasury kept by the tribune which arises from the votive offerings brought from different parts for when any one happens to be ill or to suffer under any infirmity he will make a vow and thence receive relief the garden is also famous for its miracles and hence it is believed that the grave of ali is there of these miracles the night of revival is one for on the seventh day of the month Rejeb, cripples come from the different parts of fars rum khorazan iraq and other places assemble in companies from twenty to thirty in number they are placed over the grave soon after sunset people then some praying others reciting the koran and others prostrating themselves wait expecting their recovery and rising when about night they all get up sound and well this is a matter well known among them i heard it from creditable persons but was not present at one of these nights i saw however several such afflicted persons who had not yet received but were looking forwards for the advantages of this night of revival i next arrived at basra and proceeded on with the badawin arabs of kafaja for there is no travelling in these parts except with them we next came to kawarnak the ancient residence of el numan ibn mond or whose progenitors were kings of the tribe beni ma el sama sons of heavenly seed there are still traces of his palace to be seen it is situated in a spacious plain and upon a river derived from the euphrates we left its place and came next to the city of was it it is surrounded by an extensive tract of country and abounds with gardens and plantations its inhabitants are the best of all iraq from this place i set out to visit the tomb of el wali el arif my lord ahmed of Rafat, which is situated in a village called om obaida at the distance of a day from wazit at this place i arrived and found that the grandson of the sheikh upon whom the dignity of sheikh had also devolved had come thither before me for the same purpose he was also named sheikh ahmed and held the dignity of his grandfather which he exercised in the cell formerly occupied by him in the afternoon and after the reading of the koran the religious attached to the cell got together a great quantity of wood to which they set fire they then walked into it some eating it others rolling in it and others trampling upon it till they had entirely extinguished it such is the sacred called el refaya and this the custom by which they are particularized some of them too will take great serpents in their teeth and bite the head off it happened that when i was in a certain part of india there came to me a company of the religious of the 
Hidaria sect, having in their hands and about their necks iron chains. Their leader was a black of a filthy color. They requested me to solicit the governor of the place to bring them some wood, to which they may set fire, and then sing and walk into it. I did so, and he brought them ten bundles. They then set fire to it, and commencing their song, went into it. Nor did they cease dancing and rolling about in it until they had extinguished it. The leader then asked me for a shirt. I gave him a very fine one, which he put on, and then proceeded to roll about in the fire and to strike it with his sleeves until he had put it out. He then brought me the shirt upon which the fire had not made the least impression. At this I very much wondered. After visiting this sheikh, I proceeded to Basra, a place much abounding with palms. The inhabitants are so friendly to strangers that a traveler has nothing to fear among them. We have here the mosque of Ali, in which prayers are said every Friday. It is then closed to the next. This was formerly in the middle of the town, but is situated two miles from its present population. In this is the Koran which Othman had sent for the use of the inhabitants and in which he was written when he was killed. The marks of his blood are still visible in the words. I then went on board a Sambuk, Turkish Senbuki, which is a small boat, and proceeded to El Obala, which was once a large city, but is now only a village which with its gardens about it is about ten miles from Basra. I then sailed from El Obala in an arm of the Persian Gulf and arrived the next morning at Abadan, which is a village situated in a salt marsh. It was my intention to have gone to Baghdad, but a person at Basra advised me to go on to the country of El Lar, then to Iraq, El Ajam, then to Arabian Iraq, and I did so. I then proceeded from Abadan by sea, and after four days arrived at the city of Magun, or Magul, of the quantity Faul, with the G pronounced hard. This is a small town on the Persian Gulf. I passed from this by land during a journey of three days through a plain inhabited by Kurds and came to the city of Ramin, a beautiful place abounding with fruit and rivers. I then proceeded on through a plain in which were villages of the Kurds and in three days arrived at the city of Tostar, which is at the extremity of this plain. On the first of the mountains there is a large and beautiful city, abounding with fruits and rivers, surrounded by a river known by the name of El Azraq, the Blue. This river is wonderfully clear and is cold in the summer season. Chapter 7 Idaj El Lur Ushturkan Fairuzan Tashnia Firus Shiraz Kalil Yezd Gaz Majd Odin, founder of the college El Majia, Mohammed Kuda Banda becomes a Sunni, Abu Is Haq, his liberality. Abu Abd Allah Kafif, the first Mohammedan who went from India 
to Ceylon, Kazerun, El Zaidan, El Hawaiza, Kufa. I then traveled for three days over high mountains and found in every stage in these countries a cell with food for the accommodation of travelers. I then came to the city of Idash, which belongs to the Sultan Atabek, Afraziab. With these people, the word Atabek means anyone governing a district. The country is called Elur. It abounds with high mountains and has roads cut in the rocks. The extent in length is seventeen days' journey, in breadth ten. Its king sends presents to the king of Iraq and sometimes comes to see him. In every one of these stations in this country, there are cells provided for the religious, inquirers, and travelers. And for every one who arrives, there are bread, flesh, and sweet meats. I traveled for ten days in this country over high mountains with ten other religious, one of whom was a priest, another a muezzin, a person who calls the people to prayers, and two professed readers of the Koran. The Sultan sent me a present containing money for traveling expenses, both for myself and my companions. Having finished the districts belonging to this king, on the tenth day we entered those of Ispaham and arrived at the city of Ushtorkan, after this at Firuzan, the name of which had been Tashnia Firuz, and then at Ispahan, one of the cities of Iraq El Ajam. This is a large and handsome city. I remained in it some days. I then set out for Shiraz, between which and Ispahan there are twenty stations. With the intention of visiting the Sheikh Majd Odin at that place. In my journey, I passed by the towns of Khalil and Yezd Khaz, the latter of which is small, and arrived at Shiraz. It is an extensive and well built city, though inferior to Damascus in the beauty of its streets, gardens, and waters. The inhabitants are people of integrity, religion, and virtue, particularly the women. For my own part, I had no other object than that of visiting the Sheikh Majd Odin, the paragon of saints and worker of miracles. I came accordingly to the college called El Majidia which had been founded by him. He was then judge of the city, but on account of his age, the duties of the office were discharged by his brother's sons. I waited on him. When he came out, he showed me great kindness, and, embracing me, asked me about different places, to which I gave suitable answers. I was then taken into his college, the sheikh is much honored by the emirs of these parts, insomuch that when they enter his company, they take hold of both their ears, a ceremony of respect paid only to the king. They therefore pay him the respect due to their king. The reason of this is that when the king of Iraq, Mohammed Kuda Banda, received Islamism, he had a favorite of the Rafiza, followers of Ali named Jamal ibn Mutaha, who induced him to join the Shia sect, which he willingly did. The king then wrote to Baghdad, Shiraz, and other places, inviting them to be of this sect. The people of Baghdad and Shiraz, however, refused to do so, and continued to be of the sect of the Sunni. He then commanded the judges of these districts to be brought to him, and the first who arrived was this of Shiraz. The king ordered him 
to be thrown to some great dogs which he had and which were kept with chains about their necks for the purpose of tearing to pieces any one with whom the sultan should happen to be angry when therefore the kazi majd odin was thrown to the dogs they came and looking upon him began to wag their tails making no onset upon him nor in any way molesting him this was told to the sultan Udabanda, who came running to him in a great fright he then kissed his hands and stripping off all his own robes put them upon the sheikh he then took him by the hand and led him to his mansion this therefore became the source of great dignity to the sheikh his children and to all belonging to him which is the case with every one upon whom the sultan puts all his robes the king then gave up the shia sect and became a sunni and to the sheikh he gave a hundred villages in the district of shiraz thus both the king and his courtiers bestowed the greatest honors upon the sheikh and upon his successors i also visit this sheikh after my return from india in the year seven hundred forty eight of the hegira anno domini one thousand three hundred forty seven and for this purpose i travelled a distance of five and thirty days i once saw the sultan of shiraz abu ishaq holding his ears before him by way of respect the sultan of shiraz on my first arrival at that place was mohammed abu ishaq ibn shah yanju he was one of the best of princes his father shah yanju was governor of shiraz under the king of iraq but when he died the government was put into the hands of another when however the king of iraq died and left no issue each of the governors assumed the government of the district over which he had been placed and in this way the government of shiraz etc came under the control of abu ishaq he was a man much beloved on account of his courage and good conduct and possessed a territory of a month and a half's journey with an army of fifty thousand men in liberality abu ishaq imitated the king of india for on one occasion he gave to a person who had come before him the sum of seventy thousand dinars no one however can be compared to the king of india for he will give sums equal to this many times in the same day particularly to those who come from the parts of Khorasan. he once said to one of his courtiers go into the treasury and bring as much gold as you can carry at once the courtier filled thirteen purses with gold and tying them on his shoulders attempted to go out but fell through the weight of the purses the king then commanded him to take and weight it which he did and found it to be thirteen mounds of delhi the mound of delhi being equal to five and twenty rattles of egypt on another occasion he placed one of his emirs namely sharf ul mulk emir bakht of khorasan in a pair of scales putting gold in the opposite part till the gold preponderated he then gave him the gold and said give alms out of this for your own salvation he also appointed to the theologian and collector of traditions abd el aziz el ardabili for his daily expenses the sum of one hundred dinars of silver five and twenty of which are equal to the golden dinar upon one occasion 
the above-mentioned sheik entered into the presence of the king who rose and having kissed his feet poured it upon his head with his own hand a vessel full of gold and said both the gold and the vessel which is gold are thine the most famous meshed of shiraz is that of ahmed ibn musa the brother of el riza which is indeed held in the highest estimation in this is the tomb of the imam el kot el wali abu abd allah ibn kafif who is the great exemplar of all the region of fars this abu abd allah is the person who made known the way from india to the mountain of serendib and who wandered about the mountains in the island of ceylon of his miracles he is entering ceylon and wandering over its mountains in company with about thirty fakirs is one for when these persons were all suffering from extreme hunger and had consulted the sheikh on the necessity of slaughtering and eating an elephant he positively refused and forbade the act they nevertheless impelled as they were by hunger transgressed his commands and killed a small elephant which they ate the sheikh however refused to partake when they had all gone to sleep the elephants came in a body and smelling one of them put him to death they then came to the sheikh and smelled him but did him no injury one of them however wrapped his trunk about him and lifting him on his back carried him off to some houses when the people saw him they were much astonished the elephant then put him down and walked off the infidels were much delighted with the sheikh treated him very kindly and took him to their king the king gave credit to his story and treated him with the greatest kindness and respect when i entered ceylon i found them still infidels although they had given great credit to the sheikh they also very much honor the mohammedan fakirs taking them to their houses and feeding them contrary to the practice of the infidels of india for they neither eat with a mohammedan nor suffer him to come near them i then left shiraz intending to make kazerun situated at the distance of two days journey in order to visit the tomb of the sheikh abu ishaq el kazeruni this sheikh is held high in esteem both in india and china and even the sailors when laboring under adverse winds make great vows to him which they pay to the servants of his cell as soon as they get safely to shore i accordingly visited the tomb of the sheikh i then left kazarun and went to the city el zaidan the city of the two zaids it was so called because zaid ibn tabat and zaid ibn Ahkam, two of the companions of the prophet were buried there i then went to el huayza a small town inhabited by persians between which and basra is the distance of four days but from kufa that of five from this place i went to kufa through a desert in which water was only to be found at one of its stages this is one of the mother cities of iraq but it is now very much in ruins in the mosque is the oratory in which ali was killed by the vile ibn molgim in the back part of the mosque is the place in which noah is said to have grown warm from the oven in the time of the deluge chapter eight el hila 
Karbela, Baghdad, Abu Said, now king of Iraq, Ibrim Batuta accompanies his army, Samara, Tekrit, island of Ibn Omar, Nizibin, Sinjar, Dara, Mardin, Baghdad, Mosul, Mecca. I next arrived at the city of El Hila, which runs far along by the side of the Euphrates. Its inhabitants are all followers of the twelve imams. We have here a mosque, over the gate of which is an extended veil of silk. They call it the mosque of the last imam. It is said that Muhammad ibn el Azan el Askari entered this mosque and became concealed in it. This person is, according to them, the imam Merdi or leader, who has long been expected. It is a practice with them to come daily, armed to the number of a hundred, to the door of this mosque, bringing with them a beast saddled and bridled. A great number of persons also with drums and trumpets, and to say, Come forth, Lord of the age, for tyranny and baseness now abounds. This then is the time for thy egress, that by thy means God may divide between truth and falsehood. They wait till night and then return to their homes. I next came to Karbela and there visited the Meshed of the Imam El Hossein, the son of Ali. This is one of the greatest Mesheds. The inhabitants are of the sect of the twelve Imams. I next arrived at Baghdad, which, notwithstanding the injuries it has sustained, is still one of the largest of cities. Its inhabitants are mostly of the sect of Hambal. In this place is the grave of Abu Hanifa, over which is a cell and a mosque. Not far off is the grave of the Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal as also that of el shibali of sari el sakti of bashar el hafi of daud el tai and of abu kasim el Jonaid, all of them imams of the sufis when i entered baghdad the sultan of the two iraqs and khorazan was abu said bahadur khan son of mohammed kuda banda which last was one of those Tartar kings who embraced Islamism, and with his brother, Kazan, ruled in these parts. When this Abu Said died, he left no issue, and the consequence was his emirs each claimed and exercised the rule in those parts in which he had been placed. When Abu Said left Baghdad for his own country, I traveled for ten days with him, and saw the wonderful arrangement of their march, and their numerous army. I then went with one of his emirs to Tebris, which is a large and beautiful city. In this I lodged one night, but when an order came from the sultan commanding the emir Allah Odin's presence in the camp, he set out the next day and took me with him. The sultan, however, became acquainted with my being there, and sent for me accordingly. I presented myself to him, and was honored with a dress and other large presents. The emir Allah Odin told him that it was my intention to go on the pilgrimage. He accordingly ordered such conveyances and provisions for me as would be necessary for the undertaking. He also wrote to the same effect to the emir of Baghdad. I then returned to Baghdad and claimed the royal bounty from the emir. But as the time for the pilgrimage was distant, I set out for Mosul and Diyarbakir. I then went from Baghdad to the city of Samara, which was in ruins. 
there had been a meshed in it dedicated to the last imam by the Rafiza, as in el hila i then proceeded to tekrit a large city then after many stages to mosul this is an ancient and strong place its citadel el hadba is splendid from this i went to the island of ibn omar where i arrived after two days this is a large city surrounded by a valley and has thence been called the island the greatest part of it is now in ruins the inhabitants are well informed and are kind to strangers from this place i went to nizibin where i arrived after a journey of two days this is an ancient city but is now mostly in ruins it abounds in water and gardens and is surrounded by a river as with a bracelet rose water incomparable in scent is made here i then went to the city of sinjar a place abounding with fountains and rivers much like damascus the inhabitants are kurds a generous and warlike people at this place i saw the sheikh el sali el wali el abid abdallah el kurdi the theologian i met him with a party on the highest part of the mountain they say that he does not break his fast of forty days except with a crust of barley bread many miracles are ascribed to him i then went to the city of dara then to mardin in which there is a very celebrated and strong citadel the sultan of mardin at the time i entered it was el melik el sali the son of el melik el mansur this is a very generous prince and much praised by the poets on whom he bestows splendid gifts i now returned through mosul to baghdad and there found the conveyances ready for the pilgrimage with these i proceeded and arrived at mecca in the same year and remained there during another in the second year arrived the caravan from iraq with a great quantity of alms for the support of those who were staying at mecca and medina end of section three section four of the travels of ibn battuta this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ernst schnell the travels of ibn battuta by ibn battuta translated by samuel lee chapter 9 mecca jada sawakin hali saraja sabid khasana jabala kias sana aden zaila Maktashu, Mombasa, Kalwa, Safar, Hadramaut, Amman, El Ahaf, Fruits, etc., El Hasik, the island of Tair, Kolhat, Amman, Naswa. At this time, that is in the year 729 AD 1328, prayer was made during the sermon for the king of Iraq, Abu Zaid, and after that for El Malik El Nasir. I remained there during the third year also, and then left Mecca with the intention of visiting Yemen. I arrived accordingly at Jeddah. From this place I went with a company of merchants who were going to Yemen. But as the wind changed upon us, we put into the island of Sawakin, the sultan of which was al-Sharif Said ibn Abu Noma, son of the emir of Mecca. Sawakin fell to him on the part of the Beja, who were nearly related to him, 
and from whom he had an army attending upon him. From Sawakin I set out for Yemen with the merchants and came to Hali, a large and handsomely built city. The inhabitants are aboriginal Arabs governed by the Sultan Amir ibn Duwaib of the tribe Beni Kanana. He is one of the most elegant, generous, and poetical geniuses of his time. He took me with him and entertained me very hospitably for some days. From this place I traveled with the merchants to the town of Sarja, a small place inhabited by merchants of Yemen, a liberal and hospitable people. From this place I went to the city of Sabid, where I arrived in two days. This is one of the primary cities of Yemen. It is large and handsome and abounding with every commodity. The inhabitants are generous, well-informed and religious. In its environs, the village of Ghassana is the grave of Al-Wali al-Sali Ahmed ibn al ujail al-Yemeni. The doctors of Sabit told me of one of his miracles, which was this. The doctors and great people of the Saidiya sect once came to his cell. The sheikhs sat without the cell and received and returned their salutations. At length, a question arose on the subject of predestination. The Saidiya affirming that there was no such thing and that every man was the author of his own actions. The sheikh replied, If the matter be as you say it is, get up from the place where you are now sitting. They all endeavored to rise, but not one of them could do so. The sheik left them in the situation and went into his cell. They accordingly remained in the state, subject to the burning rays of the sun and lamenting their sad condition, till after sunset, when some of the sheik's companions going in to him told him that the people had repented and turned from their corrupt creed. He then came out to them, and taking them by the hand, joined them in their conversion to the truth and the reliction of error. They arose and entered the cell, where he hospitably entertained them and sent them home. I went to the village in order to visit the grave of the sheikh, which I did, and met his son, el Kashia Ismail, who entertained me very hospitably. I then went to Jabala, which is a small town, and from there to the city of Tias, the residence of the king of Yemen. This is one of the most beautiful and extensive cities of Yemen. The sultan of this place was al-Malik al-Muhajid Nur Odin Ali, son of the sultan al-Mawayi Daud, son of Rasul, sent or commissioned. The grandfather of these sultans was called Rasul because one of the caliphs of the house of Abbas had sent or commissioned him as the emir of Yemen, after which his descendants kept possession of this government. I was introduced to the king with the kazi of the place. Their custom in saluting their king is this. Any person coming before him first places his forefinger on the ground and then, putting it on his head, says, May God perpetuate thy power. I was received very courteously and then invited to a banquet. After this I traveled to the city of Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. It is a large and well-built city. From this place I went to the city of Aden, which is situated on the seashore. This is a large city, but without either seed, water or tree. They have, however, reservoirs in which they collect the rainwater for drinking. Some rich merchants reside here, and vessels from India occasionally arrive here. The inhabitants are modest and religious. I then went from Aden by sea, and after four days came to the city of Zaila. This is a city of the Berbers, a people of the Sudan of the Shafia sect. Their country is a desert of two months' extent. The first part is termed Zaila, the last Magdashu. The greatest part of the inhabitants of Zaila, however, are of the Rafisa sect. Their food is, for the most part, camel's flesh and fish. The stench of the country is extreme, as is also its filth from the stink of the fish and the blood of camels which are slaughtered in its streets. I then proceeded by sea for fifteen days and came to Magdashu, which is an exceedingly large city. The custom here is that, whenever any ships approach, the young men of the city come out and each one addressing himself to a merchant becomes his host. If there be a theologian or a noble on board, he takes up his residence with the kazi. 
When it was heard that I was there, the Kazi came with his students to the beach, and I took up my abode with him. He then took me to the Sultan, whom they style Sheik. The custom is that a noble or a theologian must be presented to the Sultan before he takes up his abode in the city. When, therefore, the Kazi came to the palace, one of the king's servants met him. The Kazi was then Borhan Odin el-Misri of Egypt, and to him he mentioned my having come. The servant then went to the Sultan and informed him, but soon returned to us with a basket of vegetables and some for walnuts. These he divided among us and then presented us with rose water, which is the greatest honor done among them to any one. He then said, It is the command of the king that this person should reside in the student's house. The Kazi then took me by the hand and conducted me to it. It was near the palace, was spread with carpets and prepared for a feast. The servants then brought meats from the palace. Their meat is generally rice, roasted with oil and placed in a large wooden dish. Over this they place a large dish of il kushan, which consists of flesh, fish, fowl and vegetables. They also roast the fruit of the plantain and afterwards boil it in new milk. They then put it on a dish and the curdled milk on another. They also put on dishes some of preserved lemon, bunches of preserved pepper pods salted and pickled, as also grapes, which are not unlike apples, except that they have stones. These, when boiled, become sweet like fruit in general, but are crude before this. They are preserved by being salted and pickled. In the same manner, they use the green ginger. When therefore they eat the rice, they eat after it these salts and pickles. The people of Magdeshu are very corpulent. They are enormous eaters, one of them eating as much as a congregation ought to do. The Sultan then sent for me and for each of my companions a dress, after which I was presented to him. The custom in giving a salute is the same as with that among the kings of Yemen. I remained some days the king's guest and then set out for the country of the Sanuj, proceeding along the seashore. I then went on board a vessel and sailed to the island of Mombasa, which is large, abounding with the banana, the lemon and the citron. They also have a fruit which they call the jamun, jambu. It is like the olive with a stone, except that this fruit is exceedingly sweet. There is no grain on this island. What they have is brought to them from other places. The people are generally religious, chaste and honest, and are of the sect of Shafia. After lodging there one night, I set out by sea for the city of Kulwa, which is large and consists of wooden houses. The greater part of the inhabitants are Sanuji, of the sect of Shafia, of religious and peaceful habits. The king of this place, at the time I entered it, was Abu el Mosafir Hassan, a person who had obtained great victories over the countries of the infidel Sanuj. He gave much away in arms. The greatest gift bestowed by the people of these countries is ivory, which is the elephant's tooth. They seldom give gold. I then proceeded to the city of Safar by sea. This is the farthest city of Yemen and situated on the shore of the Indian Sea. From this place they carry horses to India, and when the wind is fair they pass from it to the Indian shores in a full month. Between Safar and Aden by land is the distance of a month, but between it and Hadramaut that of sixteen days, and between it and Amman twenty days. This city of Safar stands alone in a large plain, in which there is no other village or governed district. It is a filthy place and full of flies on account of the great quantity of fish and dates which are sold there. They feed their beasts and flocks also with fish, a custom witnessed by me nowhere else. Their money is made of copper and tin. They bath several times in a day on account of the heat of their country. The diseases are generally the elephantiasis and hernia. The greatest wonder among them is that they injure no one unless he have previously injured them. Many kings have attempted their country but have been forced to return with the effects of their devices upon their own necks. At the distance of half a day from this place is the city of El Ahav, the residence of the people of Ad. 
In this city there are many gardens in which there is the large and sweet fruit of the banana, the seed of one of which will weigh ten ounces. There is also the betel tree and that of the coconut, which are generally found nowhere else except in India, and to those of India may these be compared. I shall now describe both. With respect to the betel leaf, its tree is supported just as that of unripe grapes generally is. They prop it up with reeds. It is planted near the coconut and is sometimes supported by it. The betel tree produces no fruit, but is reared merely for its leaf, which is like the leaf of the thorn, and the smallest are the best. These leaves are plucked daily. The people of India esteem it very highly, for whenever any one of them receives a visit from another, the present made is five of these leaves, which is thought to be very splendid, particularly if the donor happened to be one of the nobles. This gift is esteemed among them as being much more valuable than that of gold or silver. Its use is as follows. A grain of farewell, which is in some respects like a nutmeg, is first taken and broken into small pieces. It is then put into the mouth and chewed. A leaf of the betel is then taken and when sprinkled with a little quicklime is put into the mouth and chewed with the farewell. Its properties are to sweeten the breath, help the digestion and to obviate the danger incident to drinking water on an empty stomach. It also elevates the spirits and stimulates to venery. As to the coconut, it is the same with the Indian nut. The tree is very rare and valuable. It is something like the palm. The nut is like a man's head, for it has something like two eyes and a mouth, and within, when green, is like the brains. Upon it too is a fiber like hair. From this they make cords with which they sew their vessels together instead of iron nails. They also make great ropes for their anchors out of it. The properties of this nut are to nourish and quickly fatten the body, to make the face red and greatly to stimulate to venery. Milk, oil, olive and honey are also made out of it. They make the honey thus, having cut off the tendril on which the fruit would be formed, leaving it however about the length of two fingers, they then suspend a larger or smaller pot to it and into this a kind of water drops, which they collect morning and evening. They then expose it to the fire, just as they do dried grapes, and it becomes stiff and exceedingly sweet honey. Out of this they make sweetmeats. As to the making of milk, they open the side of the nut, take out the whole of the inside with a knife, and put it on a plate. This they macrate well in water. It then becomes milk, both as to taste and color, and is eaten as such. The oil olive is thus made. When the nut is ripe and has fallen from the tree, they peel off the bark and cut it into pieces. It is then placed in the sun, and when it is withered, they heat it in a pot, and having extracted its oil, eat it with their breakfast and other meals. The Sultan of Safar is Al-Malik al, al uncle's son to the king of Yemen. Leaving Safar, I proceeded by sea towards Amman, and on the second day put into the port of Hasik, where many Arab fishermen reside. We have here the incense tree. This tree has a thin leaf, which when scarified produces a fluid like milk. This turns into gum, and is then called loban, or frankincense. The houses are built with the bones of fish, and are covered with the skins of camels. Leaving this place, we arrived in four days at the mountain of Loma'an, which stands in the middle of the sea. On the top of it is a strong edifice of stone, and on the outside of this there is a reservoir for the rainwater. After two days I arrived at the island of Tair, in which there is not a house. It abounds with such birds as the sparrow. After this I came to a large island in which the inhabitants have nothing to eat but fish. I then arrived at the city of Kulhat, which is situated on the top of a mountain. The inhabitants are Arabs, whose language is far from elegant and who are, for the most part, schismatics. This, however, they keep secret, because they are subject to the king of Hormuz, who is of the Sunni sect. 
I then set out for the country of Amman, and after six days' journey through a desert arrived there on the seventh. It abounds with trees, rivers, gardens, with palms and various fruit trees. I entered one of the principal cities of these parts, which is Nazwa. This is situated on a hill and abounds with gardens and water. The inhabitants are schismatics of the Ibazia sect. They fall in with the opinions of the base Ibn Muljam and say that he is the saint who shall put an end to error. They also allow the caliphates of Abu Bakr and Omar, but deny those of Otman and Ali. Their wives are most base, yet, without denying this, they express nothing like jealousy on the subject. The Sultan of Amman is an Arab of the tribe of El-Azd, named Abu Muhammad ibn Naban. But Abu Muhammad is with them a general title, given to any ruler, just as Atabek and other titles are to sultans of other places. The inhabitants eat the flesh of the domestic ass, which is sold in the streets and which they say is lawful. Chapter 10 Hormuz, Harauna, Janjabal, Kuzistan, Lar, Kaisa or Siraf, Fars, Pearl Fisheries, Kosair or Hoair, El Kotaif, Hajar or Haza, Yemama, Razdawair, Aidab, Egypt, Cairo, Syria, El Ramla, Tripoli, Jabala, Ladikia, Kum, El Alaya. From this place I went to Hormuz, which is a city built on the seashore. Opposite to which, but within the sea, is New Hormuz. This is an island, the city of which is called Harauna. It is a large and beautiful place, and here the king resides. The island is an extent about a day's journey, but the greatest part of it consists of salt earth and of hills of Darani salt. The inhabitants subsist upon fish and dates, the latter of which is brought from Basra or Amman. They have but little water. The most strange thing I saw here was the head of a fish which might be compared to a hill. Its eyes were like two doors, so that people could go in at the one and out at the other. The Sultan of Hormuz was at this time Kotb Odin Tamatas, son of Turan Shah, a most generous and brave prince. Under his control were the pearl fisheries. From Harauna I proceeded to Janjabal for the purpose of visiting a certain saint. I accordingly crossed the sea and then hired some Turkomans who inhabit these parts and without whose assistance there is no traveling on account of their courage and knowledge of the roads. We have now a waterless desert, four days in extent, over which the Badawin Arab caravans travel. In this, the Somum blows during the months of June and July, and kills everyone it meets with, after which his limbs drop off. Over this I traveled and arrived at the country of Kauristan, Kuzistan, which is small. From this place I proceeded for three days over a desert like the former, till I came to Lar which is a large and beautiful city, abounding with rainwater and gardens. I now went to the cell of the holy Sheikh Abu Dolaf, the person whom I intended to visit at Janjabal. In this cell was his son, Abdel Rahman, with a number of fakirs. In the same place resides a sultan whom they call Jalal Odin el Turkumani. I next went to the city of Janjabal, in which the Sheikh Abu Dolaf resided. I went to his cell and found him alone sitting on the side of it upon the ground and clothed in an old woolen garment. I saluted him, he returned the salute, and then asked me about my coming thither and of my country. He afterwards made me stay with him and by one of his sons, who is a pious, humble, abstemious and very good man, he sent me meat and fruits. This sheik is an astonishing man. He has a very large cell and bestows costly presents, and moreover clothes and feeds all who visit him. I saw no one like him in these parts, nor is it known whence his income is derived, unless it is brought to him by the brotherhood. 
Most people, however, think that it is from miraculous operations. The people of these parts are of the sect of Shafia. I then bade farewell to the sheikh and traveled on to the city of Kaisa, which is also called Siraf. It is situated on the shore of the Indian Ocean and near to the Sea of Yemen. Fars is a good and extensive district. Its gardens are wonderfully rich in scented herbs. The inhabitants are Persians. Those, however, who dive for the pearls are Arabs. The pearl fisheries, which are between Siraf and Bahrain, are situated in a quiet gulf of the sea, not unlike a large valley. To this place comes a great number of boats, and in these are the divers with the merchants of Fars and Bahrain. When one of the divers intends to go down, he places something upon his face made out of tortoise shell, and in this a place for the nose is cut out. He then ties a rope round his middle and goes down. The time they will remain under water varies. Some will remain an hour, others two, others less. When the diver gets to the bottom of the sea, he finds the shells firmly fixed in the sand among trees of coral. He then either tears them off with his hands or cuts them away with an iron knife and puts them into a leathern bag which hangs to his neck. When he begins to experience a difficulty of remaining under water, he shakes the rope and the man who holds it draws him up and puts him into the boat. The bag is then taken and the shells opened, and they find in each a piece of flesh which being cut away with a knife and exposed to air hardens and becomes a pearl. After this both great and small are collected together and one-fifth goes to the king, the rest are sold to the merchants present. To many of these merchants, however, the divers are generally in debt, and in this case the pearls are taken by way of payment. I next proceeded from Siraf to the city of Bahrain, which is a large and handsome place, abounding in gardens and water. It is wonderfully hot, and so very sandy that the houses will sometimes be overwhelmed with sand. There is at both the eastern and western side of it a hill or bank, the one they call Kosair, the other Hawaiir and on these they have an adage and say, Kosair and Hoire, and indeed every opponent brings advantage. I then travel to the city of Kotaif, as if it were a word of the diminutive form of Kotf. It is, however, a large and handsome place, inhabited by Arabs of the Rafisa sect, extremely enthusiastic, publishing their sentiments and fearing no one. From this place I proceeded to the city of Hajar, which, however, is now called al Hassan. We have here a greater abundance of dates than is to be found elsewhere, and which are used as fodder for the beasts. The inhabitants are Arabs of the tribe of Abdel Qais. From this place I travelled to Yamama, which is also called Hajr, a beautiful and fertile city, abounding with water and gardens. The inhabitants are, for the most part, of the tribe Beni Hanifa. They are the ancient possessors of this district. From this place I went on pilgrimage and arrived at Mecca in the year 733 of the Hejra, A.D. 1332. In this year the Sultan of Egypt, al-Malik al-Nasir, also performed the pilgrimage. After finishing the pilgrimage I proceeded towards Jada, intending to go by way of Yemen to India. But in this I failed. I then proceeded by sea towards Aidab, but was driven by the wind into the port called Rastawai. From this place I travelled by land with the Beja and passed over a desert in which there was a great number of ostriches and gazelles and some Badawin Arabs subject to the Beja. After a journey of nine days I arrived at Aidab and leaving this place and passing through district after district in Upper Egypt arrived at last at Cairo where I remained some days. Hence I proceeded to Syria and then to Jerusalem. From this place I went to El Ramla, Akka, Tripoli, Jabala and El Larikia, Laodicea. And from this I went by sea to the country of Rum, which has been so called because it formerly belonged to the Romans, and even now they are here in considerable numbers under the protection of the Mohammedans. Here are also many Turkomans. I next arrived at El Alaya, which is a large city upon the seashore, inhabited by Turkomans. The present sultan is Yusuf Beg, son of Karman. I was introduced to him. Our meeting was pleasant, and he furnished us with provisions. End of section 4. Recording by Ernst Schnell. Section 6. 
Section 5 of The Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 11 Anatolia, Berdur, Sabarta, Ekridur, Akshahar. Kara Ilisar, Lodik, Fortress of Tawaz, Milas, Kunia, the grave of Mabalana Rumi, Laranda, Aksara, Nicola, Sivas, Amasia, Sunuza, Kumash, Arzanjan, Arsarum, Birki, remarkable piece of meteoric stone seen here, Tira, a Usuluk, Yasmir, Magnesia, Bergama, Barusa, Yasnik, Bustuni, Buli, Barlu, Kastamunia. From this place I proceeded to the district of Anatolia, which contains some handsome cities. In all the Turkoman town there is a brotherhood of youths, one of whom is termed my brother. No people are more courteous to strangers, more readily supply them with food and other necessaries, or are more opposed to oppressors than they are. The person who is styled the brother is one about whom persons of the same occupation, or even foreign youths who happen to be destitute, collect and constitute their president. He then builds a cell, and in this he puts a horse, a saddle, and whatever other implements may be wanting. He then attends daily upon his companions, and assists them with whatever they may happen to want. In the evening they come to him, and bring all they have got, which is sold, to purchase food, fruit, etc., for the use of the cell. Should a stranger happen to arrive in their country, they get him among them, and with this provision they entertain him, nor does he leave them till he finally leaves their country. If, however, no traveller arrive, then they assemble to eat up their provisions, which they do with drinking, singing, and dancing. On the morrow they return to their occupations, and in the evening return again to their president. They are therefore styled the youths, their president, the brother. In this city I went to the college of its sheikh, Shahab Adin el Hamawi, and on the second day one of this society came to me. He was addressed by the sheikh in Turkish. The sheik told me that this man came to invite us to a feast. I was much astonished, and said to the sheik, This is a poor man. How can he afford to feast us, who are many? The sheik was surprised at my reply, and said, This is one of the brotherhood, a society consisting of two hundred silk merchants who have a cell of their own. I consented, therefore, and went to the cell, and witnessed the astonishing attention, kindness, and liberality which they showed their guests. May God reward them. The Sultan of Anatolia was Khazar Beg ibn Yunus the Turkoman. I was presented to him. He was then sick. He behaved very liberally towards us, gave us provisions, and sent money for our travelling expenses. I next proceeded to the town of Berdur, which is small and surrounded by trees and gardens. I first went to the house of the Khatib, the preacher, and there met the Society of the Brotherhood who invited us to their feast. The Khatib refused to go. They therefore gave us a feast in a garden without the town. I was truly astonished at their wish to show us every respect and attention, although we were ignorant of their language, and they of ours. From this place I went to the town of Sabarta, which is handsomely built and has good streets. I next went to the city of Akridur, which is large and abounding with trees and water. A lake of sweet water adjoins it over which vessels pass in the space of two days of Akshahar and to other places. I here put up at the lecturers El Fazil Mosli Adin, who treated me very respectfully. The sultan of this place was Abu Ishik Beg, one of the greatest princes of these parts. He gave us protection in his district throughout the month of Ramadan. During my residence I was introduced to him. After this he sent me a horse and some money. He is a condescending and excellent prince. I then went to the city of Karahisar. It is small and surrounded by water on every side. The sultan is Mohammed Chalebi. 
He is the brother of Abu Ishak, king of Akradur. I was introduced to him, and he treated me with great respect and gave me some provisions. After this I proceeded to the city of Ladik, which is a large and fine city abounding with water and gardens. As soon as I had entered it, a number of persons who were in the streets got up and seized upon the bridles of our horses, after which others came and contested the point with them. We were much alarmed at this, but a person coming up who could speak Arabic said they were contending only as to who should entertain us, as they were of the society of youths. Upon this I felt safe. They then cast lots, and we proceeded to the cell of the party on whom the lot fell, and on the day following to that of the other. Both parties showed us the greatest respect. The Sultan Yataj Beg, who is one of the greatest princes of these parts, hearing of us, sent for us and treated us with great respect. I then proceeded to the fortress of Tawas, then to the city of Milas, which is large and beautiful. Its sultan is Urkan Beg, Ibn el Mantasha. When I was introduced to him, he treated me with great respect. He is a very excellent prince. I proceeded from this place to the city of Kunia, which is large and handsome and abounds with water and gardens. This district belongs to the Sultan Badr Adin ib Karman, over which, however, the king of Iraq has occasionally had the rule on account of its proximity to some of his states which are in these parts. I put up at the cell of its Kazi, who is known by the name of Ibn Kalam Shah. He is a member of the Society of Youths. His cell is most beautiful and he has a great number of disciples who trace the authorities for their judicial decisions, as high as Ali ibn Abi Talib. They are clothed as the Sufis are with the Kirks and close trousers. In this place is the tomb of the holy Sheikh Jalal al-Din, better known by the title of Malana or Mala. He is very highly esteemed. It is said that he was at first a mere lecturing doctor who had a large number of pupils, but upon a certain day a stranger came into his lecture-room with a basket of sweetmeats, which he had for sale, upon his head. The sheik said to him, Bring your basket here. The man took a piece of sweetmeat and gave it to the sheik, who ate it. He then went out, no one else having tasted the sweetmeat. The sheik became agitated and went out after him, giving up his reading, and leaving his pupils in a state of expectation. At length, however, they set out in quest of him, but failed to discover the place of his retreat. Some years after he returned with his mind deranged and speaking nothing but Persian verses. These his pupils, as they followed him, noted down and published under the title of the Mathnavi, a book highly esteemed in these parts. I next proceeded to the city of Laranda, the sultan of which is El Malik Badr Adin Ibn Karman, who makes this place his capital. I met him and was entertained with the greatest kindness as his guest. I then proceeded to Exara which is one of the finest districts of Rum and subject to the king of Iraq. I next went to the city of Nikta, then to Kisara, Caesarea, both of which are subject to the king of Iraq. I proceeded to the city of Sivas, which is also subject to the king of Iraq. It is a large place and now the rendezvous of the greater part of the king's army. I next went to the city of Amasia, then to Senuza, then to Kumash, then to Arzanjan, then to Ezerum, all of which are subject to the king of Iraq. In Ezerum I saw the brother Tuman, one of the society of youths whose age exceeded one hundred and thirty years. He was still in possession of all his faculties and could walk wherever he wished. After receiving his blessing I proceeded to the city of Berkey, the king of which was Muhammad ibn Adin. I was in company with the lecturer of this place. Moyi Adin, one of the most celebrated and reputable men of his age, introduced to the presence. The king one day said to me, Have you ever seen a stone that came down from heaven? I answered, No. He continued, Such a stone has fallen in the environs of our city. He then called some men and ordered them to bring the stone which they did. It was a black, solid, exceedingly hard and shining substance. If weighed, it would probably exceed a talent. He then ordered some stone-cutters to come in, when four came forward. He commanded them to strike upon it. They all struck together upon it accordingly with an iron hammer four successive strokes, which, however, made not the least impression upon it. I was much astonished at this. 
The king then ordered the stone to be taken to its place. He sent fruit and food to us during the time we remained there, and when I had bidden him farewell he sent me a thousand dirhams with one hundred mikthals of gold, as also clothing, two horses, and a slave. He also sent for my companions some dirhams and clothing separately. I then proceeded to the city of Tira, which belongs also to this prince. It is large and abounds with gardens and water. From this place I went to the city of Ayasulu, the emir of which is the Sultan Muhammad ibn Aydin, son of the Sultan of Berkey. Then to the city of Yasmir, which belongs to the Sultan of Berkey. Its emir is Omar Beg, one of the Sultan's sons, and a most excellent prince. I then proceeded to the city of Magnesia, the Sultan of which is called Saru Khan. I then went to the city of Bergama, Pergamos, of which the philosopher Plato is said to have been an inhabitant. His house is still seen here. The Sultan of this place is styled Bakshi Khan. I next went to the city of Bali Khazra, which is large and beautiful. Its governor is called Damur Khan. I then went to the city of Barusa, which is a large place and governed by Iktiar Adin Erkan Beg, son of Othman Juk. This is one of the greatest, richest, and most extensive in rule and commanding the greatest army of all the Turkoman kings. His practice is constantly to be visiting his fortresses and districts and to be inquiring into their circumstances. It is said that he never remained a month in any one place. His father had conquered the city of Barusa, and had besieged that of Yaznik nearly twenty years, but did not take it. After this his son besieged it for twelve years, and took it. In this place I met him. He received me very respectfully, and provided me with a considerable number of dirhams. I next went to Yaznik. It has a large lake, eight miles in length. The city is also surrounded with water and trees. I then left this place, and after some days arrived at the city of Bustuni. After this, at the city of Buli, the king of which is Shah Beg. I then went to the city of Berlu, which belongs to the governor of Castamunia. I then went to Castamunia, which is a very large and beautiful city, abounding with every delicacy which may be purchased at a very low rate. I saw an aged sheik among its inhabitants, whose age, as I was told, amounted to that of one hundred and sixty-two years. Its sultan was Suleiman Badshah, a splendid but aged man, he is a respectable and respected person. I was introduced to him and received very honorably. Chapter 12. Sanub, Krim, Kirush, the Desert of Kifjak, al kafa Subject to Muhammad Uzbek Khan, El sarai Azak, El mahar Bishtag, the camp of Muhammad Uzbek. Ceremonies observed here. Bulgar, mode of traveling here. Astrakhan, permission to visit Constantinople, Ukak, mountains of the Russians, Serdak, Baba Saltuk. I then went on to the city of Sanub, which is large and belongs to the governor of Kastamunia, Suleiman Badshah. I remained here some time. Leaving this place, I proceeded by sea for the city of Il Karam, Krim, but suffered considerable distress in the voyage and was very near being drowned. We arrived, however, at length at the port of El Karash, which belongs to the desert country of Kifjak. This desert is green and productive. It has, however, neither tree, mountain, hill, nor wood in it. The inhabitants burn dung. They travel over this desert upon a cart which they call Araba. The journey is one of six months, the extent of three of which belongs to the Sultan Muhammad Uzbek Khan that of three more to the infidels. I hired one of these carts for my journey from the port of Kirash to the city of El Kafa, which belongs to Muhammad Uzbek. The greater part of the inhabitants are Christians living under his protection. From this place I traveled in a cart to the city of El Karam, which is one of the large and beautiful cities of the districts of the Sultan Muhammad Uzbek Khan. From this place I proceeded, upon a cart which I had hired, to the city of El Sarai, the residence of Mohammed Uzbek. The peculiarity of this desert is that its herbs serve for fodder for their beasts, and on this account their cattle are numerous. They have neither feeders nor keepers, which arises from the severity of their laws against theft, which are these. When any one is convicted of having stolen a beast, he is compelled to return it with nine others of equal value. 
but if this is not in his power his children are taken if however he have no children he is himself slaughtered just like a sheep after several days journey i arrived at azak which is a small town situated on the seashore in it resides an emir on the part of the sultan muhammad who treated us with great respect and hospitality from this place i proceeded to the city of el mahar which is a large and handsome place the turkish women of these parts are very highly respected particularly the wives of the nobles and kings these women are religious and prone to almsgiving and other good works they go unveiled however with their faces quite exposed i next set out camp of the sultan which was then in a place called bishtag or five mountains and arrived at a station to which the sultan with his retinue had just come before us at this place which is termed the urdu or camp we arrived on the first of the month ramadan here we witnessed a moving city with its streets mosques and cooking-houses the smoke of which ascended as they moved along when however they halted all these became stationary this sultan mohammed uzbek is very powerful enjoys extensive rule and is a subduer of the infidels he is one of the seven great kings of the world which are the sultan of the west the sultan of egypt and syria the sultan of the two iraqs the sultan of the turks uzbek the sultan of turkestan and mawara el nahar the sultan of india and the sultan of china it is a custom with Mohammed Uzbek to sit after prayer on the Friday under an alcove called the Golden Alcove, which is very much ornamented. He has a throne in the middle of it overlaid with silver plate, which is gilded and set with jewels. The Sultan sits upon the throne. His four wives, some at his right hand, others at his left, sitting also upon the throne. Beneath the throne stand his two sons, one on his right, the other on his left. Before him sits his daughter. Whenever one of these wives enters, he arises, and taking her by the hand, puts her into her place upon the throne. Thus they are exposed to the sight of all without so much as a veil. After this come in the great emirs, for whom chairs are placed on the right and left, and on these they sit. Before the king stand the princes, who are the sons of his uncle, brothers, and near kinsmen. In front of these and near the door stand the sons of the great emirs and behind these the general officers of the army. People then enter according to their rank, and saluting the king, return and take their seats at a distance. When, however, the evening prayer is over, the supreme consort, who is queen, returns. The rest follow, each with their attendant beautiful slaves. The women who are separated on account of any uncleanness are seated upon horses. Before their carriages are cavalry, behind them beautiful mamluks upon this day i was presented to the sultan who received me very graciously and afterwards sent me some sheep and a horse with a leathern bag of kameez which is the milk of a mare and very much valued among them as a beverage the wives of this king are highly honoured each one has a mansion for herself her followers and servants when the sultan wishes to visit one of them he sends word and preparation is made one of these wives is a daughter of Takfur the emperor of constantinople i had already visited each of them and on this account the sultan received me this is a custom among them and whoever fails in observing it suffers the imputation of a breach of politeness i had formerly heard of the city of bulgar and hence i had conceived a desire to see it and to observe whether what has been related of it as to the extremity of the shortness of its nights and again of its days in the opposite season of the year were true or not there was however between that place and the camp of the sultan a distance of ten days i requested the sultan therefore that he would appoint some one who would bring me thither and back which he granted when therefore i was saying the prayer of sunset in that place which happened in the month of ramadan i hasted nevertheless the time for evening prayer came on which i went hastily through i then said that of midnight as well as that termed el vitir but was overtaken by the dawn in the same manner also is the day shortened in this place in the opposite season of the year i remained here three days and then returned to the king in bulgar i was told of the land of darkness and certainly had a great desire to go to it from that place the distance however was that of forty days 
I was diverted, therefore, from the undertaking, both on account of its great danger, and the little good to be derived from it. I was told that there was no travelling thither except upon little sledges which are drawn by large dogs, and that during the whole of the journey the roads are covered with ice, upon which neither the feet of man nor the hooves of beast can take any hold. These dogs, however, have nails by which their feet can take firm hold on the ice. No one enters these parts except powerful merchants, each of whom has perhaps a hundred of such sledges as these, which they load with provisions, drinks, and wood. For there we have neither trees, stones, nor houses. The guide in this country is the dog, who has gone the journey several times, the price of which will amount to about a thousand dinars. The sledge is harnessed to his neck, and with him three other dogs are joined, but of which he is the leader. The others then follow him with the sledge, and when he stops, they stop. The master never strikes or reprimands this dog, and when he proceeds to a meal the dogs are fed first, for if this were not done they would become enraged, and perhaps run away and leave their master to perish. When the travellers have completed their forty days or stages through this desert, they arrive at the land of darkness, and each man leaving what he has brought with him goes back to his appointed station. On the morrow they return to look for their goods, and find instead of them sable, ermine, and the fur of the sinjab. If then the merchant likes what he finds, he takes it away. If not, he leaves it, and more is added to it. Upon some occasions, however, these people will take back their own goods, and leave those of the merchants. In this way is their buying and selling carried on for the merchants know not whether it is with mankind or demons that they have to do, no one being seen during the transaction. It is one of the properties of these furs that no vermin ever enters them. I returned to the camp of the Sultan on the 28th of Ramadan, and after that travelled with him to the city of Ostrakhan, which is one of his cities. It is situated on the banks of the river Atal, which is one of the great rivers of the world. At this place the Sultan resides during very cold weather, and when this river as well as the adjoining waters are frozen, the king orders the people of the country to bring thousands of bundles of hay, which they do, and then place it upon the ice, and upon this they travel. When the king had arrived at Astrakhan, one of his wives, who was daughter to the emperor of Constantinople, and then big with child, requested to be allowed to visit her father, with whom it was her intention to leave her child, and then to return. This he granted. I then requested to be permitted to go with her, that I may see Constantinople, and was refused on account of some fears which he entertained respecting me. I flattered him, however, telling him that I should never appear before her but as his servant and guest, and that he need entertain no fear whatsoever. After this he gave me permission, and I accordingly took my leave. He gave me fifteen hundred dinars, a dress of honour, and several horses. Each of his ladies also gave me some pieces of bullion silver, which they call El Suam, as did also his sons and daughters. I set out accordingly on the tenth of the month Shawal, in company with the royal consort Bailun, daughter to the emperor of Constantinople. The sultan accompanied us through the first stage, in order to encourage her, and then returned. The queen was attended in her journey by five thousand of the king's army, about five hundred of which were cavalry as her servants and followers. In this manner we arrived at Ukak, which is a moderately sized town but excessively cold. Between this place and El Sarai, which belongs to the Sultan, there is a distance of ten days. At the distance of one day from this place are the mountains of the Russians, who are Christians, with red hair and blue eyes, an ugly and perfidious people. They have silver mines, and from their country is the Suam, the pieces of silver bullion, brought. With these they buy and sell, each piece weighing five ounces. After ten days' journey from this place we arrived at the city of Sudak, which is one of the cities of the desert of Kifjak, and situated on the seashore. After this we arrived at a city known by the name of Baba Saltuk. Saltuk, they say, was a diviner. This is the last district in this direction belonging to the Turks between which, however, and the districts of Rum, is a distance of eighteen days, eight of which are over an inhabited desert without water. But as we entered it during the cold season, we did not want much water. Chapter 13. Fortress of Matuli, Constantinople, Ceremonies, etc. 
Return to Tartary, Astrakhan, El Sarai, Kevarizim, Sarai Juk, Bokhara, El Kate, Wabkana, Genghis Khan's Origin and Progress, Nakshab, Camp of Tamasharin Khan, Occurrence at the Mosque, the Yasak, or Regulations of Genghis Khan, Samarkand, Nasaf, Tirmid, Balk, Kuistan, Harait, Nisabur, Jam, Tuz, Serikaz, Zuva, Bastam, Kundus, Bagtun, Berwan, Hindu Kush, El Jark, Giza, Afghans, Kabul, Kirmash, Shishnagar, the Panjab. On the occasion of my preparing to enter this desert, I presented myself before the queen, and paid my respects to her both in the morning and evening. She received me very graciously, and sent to me a good part of every present which then came to her. I then made known to her my want of some horses, and she ordered fifteen to be given to me. After this we arrived at the fortress of Matuli, which is the first in the districts belonging to Rum, but between which and Constantinople is a distance of two and twenty days. Before this time the news of her approach had reached her father, who sent out ladies and nurses to meet her at this fortress, with a large army. From this place to Constantinople they travel with horses and mules only, on account of the unevenness of the roads. She therefore left her carriages behind her. The emir who attended her husband's troops returned when we had arrived at this place, and she was now attended by her own followers only. At this place I also dismissed my carriages and a number of my attendants and companions, recommending them to the returning party who received and treated them courteously. The queen had with her a mosque, which she set up at every stage, just as her husband used to do. In this she had daily prayers. She left it, however, at the fortress. After this the office of the Mosaine ceased. Wine was brought into the banquet, and of this she drank. I was also told that she ate swine's flesh with them, nor did one who prayed remain with her. Some, however, of her Turkish servants daily prayed with us. Thus were the tastes changed by entering into the territories of infidelity. The queen, however, ordered the officer who had come out to meet her to pay every attention and respect to me. When we had arrived within a day's journey of the city, her younger brother came out to meet her, accompanied by about five thousand cavalry all in armor. He met her on foot, on account of his being her junior. When she had kissed his head, he passed on with her. On the next day her second brother, who is the heir apparent, met her, having with him ten thousand horse. Both parties in this case dismounted, and after they had met they remounted and went on. When at length she approached Constantinople, the greatest part of its inhabitants, men, women, and children, came out attired in their best clothes, either walking or riding, beating drums and shouting as they proceeded. The sultan also with his queen, the mother of this lady, attended by the officers of state and nobles, came to meet her. When the emperor drew near, both the parties mixed, and such was the pressure that it was impossible for me to pass between them. I was therefore obliged, at the peril of my life, to see to the carrying of our lady and her companions. I was told that when she met her parents she alighted and kissed the ground before them, as well as the hoofs of their horses. We entered Constantinople about sunset. They were then ringing their bells at such a rate that the very horizon shook with the noise. When we came to the gate of the emperor, the porters refused to admit us without a permission from the emperor. Some of her followers, therefore, went and told her our case, and she requested permission of her father, stating our circumstances to him. We were then allowed to enter, and were lodged in a house adjoining that of Our Lady, who sent our provisions morning and evening. The king also granted us a letter of safe conduct, permitting us to pass wherever we pleased about the city. On the fourth day after our arrival, I was introduced to the Sultan Takfur, son of George, King of Constantinople. His father George was still living, but had retired from the world, become a monk, and given up the kingdom to his son. When I arrived at the fifth gate of the palace, which was guarded by soldiers, I was searched, lest I should carry any weapon with me, which is submitted to by every citizen as well as strangers who wishes to be introduced to the king. 
The same is observed by the emperors of India. I was introduced, therefore, and did homage. The emperor was sitting upon his throne with his queen and daughter, our mistress. Her brothers were seated beneath the throne. I was kindly received and asked as to my circumstances and arrival, also about Jerusalem, the temple of the resurrection, the cradle of Jesus, Bethlehem, and the city of Abraham, or Hebron, then of Damascus, Egypt, Iraq, and the country of Rum, to all of which I gave suitable replies. A Jew was our interpreter. The king was much surprised at my tale, and said to his sons, Let this man be treated honorably, and give him a letter of safe conduct. He then put a dress of honor on me, and ordered a saddled horse to be given me, with one of his own umbrellas, which with them is a mark of protection. I then requested that he would appoint some one to ride about with me daily into the different quarters of the city, that I might see them. He made the appointment accordingly, and I rode about with the officer for some days, witnessing the wonders of the place. Its largest church is that of St. Sophia. I saw its outside only. Its interior I could not, because just within the door there was a cross, which every one who entered worshipped. It is said that this church is one of the foundations of Asaph, the son of Barachias, and nephew of Solomon. The churches, monasteries, and other places of worship within the city are almost innumerable. When it appeared to the Turks who had accompanied our mistress that she still professed the religion of her father and wished to remain with him, they requested permission to return to their own country, which she granted. She also gave them rich presents and appointed persons to accompany them to their homes. She also requested me that she might commend these attendants to me, giving me at the same time three hundred dinars, with two hundred dirhams in money. Likewise dresses of both woolen and cotton cloth, as well as horses on the part of her father. I returned, therefore, after a stay in Constantinople of one month and six days, to the place where I had left my companions, carriages, and other goods. And from this place we travelled upon those carriages, until we arrived at Astrakhan, where I had formerly left the Sultan Mohammed Uzbek Khan. But here I found that he had gone with his court to El Sarai, to which I also proceeded. When I was admitted to his presence, he asked me of our journey, of Constantinople and its king, of all which I told him. He then reimbursed my travelling expenses, as is his usual custom. This city of El Sarai is very handsome and exceedingly large. Of its learned men is the imam, the learned, Numanadin, El Kavarezmi. I met him in this place. He is a man of most liberal disposition, carries himself majestically with the king, but humbly with the poor, and with his pupils. The sultan visits him every Friday, sits before him, and shows him every kindness, while he behaves in the most repulsive manner. I then travelled on to Kavarazim, between which and this place is a journey of forty days through a desert in which there is but little water and grass. There are carriages in it which are drawn by camels. After ten days I arrived at the city of Sarajou, which is situated upon the banks of a large and full river, which they call the Ulusu, or Great Water. Over this is a bridge joining its nearest parts, like the bridge of Baghdad. From this place I travelled for three days, with all the haste possible, and arrived at Kavarazim. This is the largest city the Turks have, and is very much crowded on account of the multitude of its inhabitants. It is subject to the Sultan Uzbek Khan and is governed on his part by a great emir who resides within it. I have never seen better bred or more liberal people than the inhabitants of Kavarazim, or those who are more friendly to strangers. They have a very commendable practice with regard to their worship, which is this. When any one absents himself from his place in the mosque, he is beaten by the priest in the presence of the congregation, and moreover fined in five dinars which go toward repairing the mosque. In every mosque, therefore, a whip is hung up for this purpose. Without this city is the river Gihon, one of the four rivers which flow from Paradise. This river, like the Atoll, freezes over in the cold season and remains frozen for five months, during which time people travel over it. Without this city also is the grave of the Sheikh Najim Adin the Great, one of the great saints over which there is a cell. Here also is the grave of the very learned Jarala el Zamakshari. Zamakshar is a village at a distance of four days from Kavarazim. The prevailing sect at Kavarazim is that of the schismatics. 
This, however, they keep secret because the Sultan Uzbek is a Sunni. They have in Kavarazim a melon to which none except that of Bokhara can be compared. The nearest to it is that of Isfahan. Peel of this melon is green, the interior red. It is perfectly sweet and rather hard. Its most remarkable property is that it may be cut in oblong pieces and dried, and then put into a case like a fig and carried to India or China. Among dried fruits there is none superior to this. It is occasionally used as a present to their kings. From Kavarazim I set out for Bokhara, and after a journey of eighteen days through a sandy and uninhabited desert arrived at the city of el Khat, which is but small, and then at Wabkana, and then after one stage we came to Bokhara, which is the principal city of the country beyond the Gihon. After it had been ravaged by the Tartars it has almost entirely disappeared. I found no one in it who knew anything of science. It is said that Genghis Khan, who came with the Tartars into the countries of Islamism and destroyed them, was in his outset a blacksmith in the country of Kota. He was a liberal-minded, powerful, and corpulent person. His practice was to assemble and feast the people, who in consequence joined him in considerable numbers, and made him their leader. He then conquered the district in which he lived, and with this accession of strength and followers, he next subdued the whole country of Kota, then China, after this the countries of Kashak, Kashgar, and Malik. At this time Jalal Andin Sanjar, son of Kavarazim Shah, was king of Kavarazim, Khorazan, and Mawara el Nahar, a powerful and splendid prince. Genghis Khan, on account of an affair which had happened among the merchants and in which some property had been taken, invaded his territories. This is well known. When, however, Genghis Khan had entered upon the frontiers of Jalal Adin's countries, he was met by the king's army, which after some fighting was put to the rout. After this Jalal Adin himself met him, and some such battles took place as have never been witnessed among the Mohammedans. In the event, however, Genghis Khan got possession of Marara el Nahar, and destroyed Bukhara, Samarkand, and el Termid killed the inhabitants, taking prisoners the youth only, and leaving the country quite desolate. He then passed over the Gihon and took possession of all Khorasan and Iraq, destroying the cities and slaughtering the inhabitants. He then perished, having appointed his son, Hulaku, to succeed him. Hulaku, soon after, entered Baghdad, destroyed it, and put to death the caliph, Omosta Azam, of the house of Abbas, and reduced the inhabitants. He then proceeded with his followers to Syria until divine providence put an end to his career, for there he was defeated by the army of Egypt and made prisoner. Thus was their progress in the Mohammedan countries put an end to. The epitometer Ibn Jazi el Kelbi states that he has been told by the Sheikh Ibn el Haji, who heard it from Abdallah ibn Roshaid, who had met Nur ad Din ibn el Zajaj, one of the learned men of Iraq, with his brother son in Mecca and who told him, as they were conversing together, that in the war with the Tartars in Iraq not fewer than four and twenty thousand learned men perished, and that himself and that man, pointing to his brother's son, were the only learned men who had escaped. I next proceeded from Bukhara for the camp of the Sultan Allah ad Din Tamashirin, and in my way passed by Nakshab, the place to which the patronymic of the sheikh Abu Turab el Nakshabi is referred. From this place I proceeded to the camp of the Sultan, the king of Morara el Nar. This is a powerful prince, who has at his command a large army, and is remarkable for the justice of his laws. The territories of this king occupy a middle station among those of the four great kings of the world, who are the king of China, that of India, that of Iraq, that of the Turks, Mohammed Uzbek Khan, all of whom send presents to him, give him the place of honor, and very highly respect him. He succeeded to the kingdom after his brother Jagatai, who was an infidel, and had succeeded to his elder brother Kobak, who was also an infidel. He was nevertheless just, and much attached to the Mohammedans, to whom he paid great respect. It is said that this king Kobak was one day talking with the doctor and preacher Badr Adin al-Midani, when he said to him, You say that God has left nothing unmentioned in his book. The preacher replied, It is even so. Show me then, said he, where my name is to be found. 
the reply was in the passage in which form he pleased hath he fashioned thee this astonished him and he said bakshi that is well done i spent some days in the camp of tamashiran upon a certain day however i went to the mosque which was in the camp the camp they call the urdu for i had heard that the sultan was to be in the mosque when the service was ended i approached in order to pay my respects to him as he had heard of my arrival he was pleased with me and treated me very respectfully after this he sent for me i went to him and found him in his tent and there paid my respects to him he then asked me of mecca medina jerusalem damascus and egypt as also of el malik el nasir the kings of iraq and persia to all of which i gave suitable answers and received marks of distinctions one of the odd things that happened respecting him was that once when the hour of prayer had arrived and the people were assembled in the mosque the sultan delayed one of his young men coming in said to the priest hasam adin el yagi the sultan wishes you to wait a little upon this the priest got up and said i ask are prayers had here for the sake of god or of tarmashirin he then ordered the mosaine to proclaim the prayers so the sultan came in after two prostrations had been performed and went through his prayers at the extremity of the part in which the people stand and which is near the door of the mosque where they usually leave their mules and there went through what he had missed he then came and seized the hand of the priest who laughed heartily at him he then sat down in the oratory the priest by his side and i by the side of the priest he then addressed me when said he you go back to your own country say that a doctor of the persians sat thus with the sultan of the turks that a poor man of the poor of the persians thus did with the sultan of the turks this priest it was who succeeded in reducing the king to the observance of all the positive and negative commandments the sultan very much respected loved and obeyed him but the sheikh accepted of no gifts from the king nor did he eat anything but what he acquired by the labor of his own hands this king when i wished to travel on provided me with seven hundred dinars for my journey we broke up our intercourse therefore and i set out accordingly this Tarmasherin, it may be remarked, had broken some of the statutes of his grandfather Genghis Khan, who had published a book entitled El Yazak, the Prohibition, which enacted that whosoever should oppose any one of these statutes should be put out of office. Now one of the statutes was this, that the descendants of Genghis, the governors of the several districts, the wives of the nobles, and the general officers of the army, should assemble upon a certain day in the year which they call El Tawa the feast and that should the emperor have altered any one of these statutes the nobles should stand up and say thou hast done so and so upon such and such a day and is made an alteration in the statutes of el yazik that which was not to be changed and therefore thy deposition is a necessary consequence they are then to take him by the hand and remove him from the throne and to place in it another of the descendants of genghis khan and should any one of the nobles have committed any crime he is to be duly adjudged on this occasion now tamar Shireen had entirely abolished the observance of this day which gave very great offence some time therefore after we had left the country the tartars together with their nobles assembled and deposed him appointing for a successor one of his relations and to such an extent was the matter pressed that tamar Shireen took to flight and was put to death I then proceeded to Samarkand, which is a very large and beautiful city. Without it is the tomb of Kotam, the son of Abbas, who was martyred on the day the city was taken. After this, I arrived at the city of Nasaf, to which the patronymic of Abu Jafar, Omar el Nasafi, is referred. I then went on to the city of Termid, to which is referred the patronymic of Abu Isa Muhammad el Termidi, author of the Jamia el Kabir this is a large and beautiful city abounding with trees and water we then passed over the gaihan into khorasan and after a journey of a day and a half over a sandy desert in which there was no house we arrived at the city of balk which now lies in ruins it has not been rebuilt since its destruction by the cursed genghis khan the situation of its buildings is not very discernible although its extent may be traced it is now in ruins and without society its mosque was one of the largest and handsomest in the world its pillars were incomparable three of which were destroyed by genghis khan because it had been told him 
that the wealth of the mosque lay concealed under them, provided as a fund for its repairs. When, however, he had destroyed them, nothing of the kind was to be found. The rest, therefore, he left as they were. The story about this treasure arose from the following circumstance. It is said that one of the caliphs of the house of Abbas was very much enraged at the inhabitants of Balkh on account of some accident which had happened, and on this account sent a person to collect a heavy fine from them. Upon this occasion the women and children of the city betook themselves to the wife of their then governor, who out of her own money built this mosque, and to her they made a grievous complaint. She accordingly sent to the officer who had been commissioned to collect the fine a robe very richly embroidered and adorned with jewels, much greater in value than the amount of the fine imposed. This she requested might be sent to the caliph as a present from herself, to be accepted instead of the fine. The officer accordingly took the robe and sent it to the caliph, who, when he saw it, was surprised at her liberality and said, This woman must not be allowed to exceed myself in generosity. He then sent back the robe and remitted the fine. When the robe was returned to her, she asked whether a look of the caliph had fallen upon it. And being told that it had, she replied, No robe shall ever come upon me upon which the look of any man except my own husband has fallen. She then ordered it to be cut up and sold, and with the price of it she built the mosque, with the cell and structure in the front of it. Still from the price of the robe there remained a third, which she commanded to be buried under one of its pillars, in order to meet any future expenses which might be necessary for its repairs. Upon Genghis Khan's hearing this story he ordered these pillars to be destroyed, but as already remarked, he found nothing. In the front of the city is, as it is reported, the tomb of Akasha ibn Mosin el-Sahabi, who, according to what is related in the Atar, a book so called, entered paradise without rendering up an account of his deeds. After this I travelled from Balkh for seven days on the mountains of Kuistan, which consist of villages closely built. In these there are many cells of religious and others who have retired from the world. I next came to the city of Herat, which is the largest inhabited city in Khorasan. Of the large cities of this district there are four. Two of these are now inhabited, namely Herat and Nisabur, and two in ruins, namely Balk and Marah. The inhabitants of Herat are religious, sincere, and chaste, and are of the sect of Hanifa. The king of Herat was at this time the sultan, the great Hussein, son of the sultan Giath Adin al Gari, a man of tried valor. From Herat I went to Jam which is a moderate-sized city abounding with water and plantations. From this place I went to Tus, one of the largest cities of Khorasan. In this the imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was born, and in it we still find his tomb. From this place I went to the Meshed of Ilriza, of Ali ibn Musa al-Kazim, son of Jafar Sadiq. It is a large and well-peopled city, abounding with fruits. Over the Meshed is a large dome adorned with a covering of silk and golden candlesticks. Under the dome, and opposite to the tomb of El Riza, is the grave of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid. Over this they constantly place candlesticks with lights. But when the followers of Ali enter as pilgrims, they kick the grave of El rashid but pour out their benedictions over that of El Riza. From this place I went to the city of Sarakaz, then to Zeva, the town of the Sheikh Kotbi Adin Hadar from which the fakirs of the sect called the Haidaria take their name. These men place an iron ring on their hands and their necks, and what is still more strange, on their virilia, in order to prevent intercourse with women. From this place I went to Nisabur, one of the four principal cities of Khorasan. It is also called the Little Damascus on account of the abundance of its fruits. The city is handsome and is intersected by four rivers. I met here the sheikh Kotbi Adin el Nisaburi, a learned and accomplished preacher, and he took me to his house. It happened that I had purchased a slave. The sheik said to me, Sell him, for he will not suit you, and I sold him accordingly. I was told after a few days that this slave had killed some Turkish children and had been executed in consequence. This was one of the sheik's great miracles. From this place I proceeded to Bastam, the town to which the patronymic of Abul Yezid el Bastami is referred. His grave is also here under the same dome with that of one of the sons of Jafar Sadiq. I next proceeded to Kunduz and Baglan, 
which are villages with cultivated lands adjoining each other. In each of these is a cell for the sainted and recluse. The land is green and flourishing, and its grass never withers. In these places I remained for some time for the purpose of pasturing and refreshing my beasts. After this I proceeded to the city of Barwan, in the road to which is a high mountain covered with snow and exceedingly cold. They call it the Hindu Kush, i.e., Hindu Slayer, because most of the slaves brought thither from India die on account of the intenseness of the cold. After this we passed another mountain which is called Bashai. In this mountain there is a cell inhabited by an old man whom they call Atta Avila, that is, the father of the saints. It is said that he is three hundred and fifty years old. When I saw him he appeared to be about fifty years old. The people of these parts, however, very much love and revere him. I looked at his body. It was moist, and I never saw one more soft. He told me that every hundredth year he had a new growth of hair and teeth, independently of the first, and that he was the Raja Abba Rahim Ratan of India, who had been buried at Multan, in the province of Sindhya. I asked him of several things, but very much doubted as to what he was, and do so still. I next arrived at the city of Barwan. In this place I met the Turkish emir Barante, the largest and fattest man I had ever seen. He treated me very respectfully and gave me some provisions. I then went on to the village of El Jark, and thanks to Gizna, the city of the warrior of the faith, and against India the victorious Mahmud, son of Subuktagin. His grave is here. The place is exceedingly cold. It is ten stages distant from Kandahar. It was once a large city, but is now mostly in ruins. I then went on to Kabul, which was once a large city, but is now for the most part in ruins. It is inhabited by a people from Persia whom they call the Afghans. Their mountains are difficult of access, having narrow passes. These are a powerful and violent people, and the greater part of them highway robbers. Their largest mountain is called the Mountain of Solomon. It is said that when Solomon had ascended this mountain and was approaching India from it, and saw that it was an oppressive country, he returned, refusing to enter it. The mountain was therefore called after his name. Upon this the king of the Afghans reside. We next left Kabul by the way of Kirmash, which is a narrow pass situated between two mountains in which the Afghans commit their robberies. We, thank God, escaped by plying them with arrows upon the heights throughout the whole of the way. The next place we arrived at was Shishnagar, which is situated at the extremity of the Turkish dominions. From this place we entered the great desert, which is fifteen days in extent. In this no one can travel except in one season out of the four on account of the Samum, by which putrefaction takes place, and the body as soon as dead falls to pieces in its several members. We got to the Panjab, i.e. the five waters, in safety. This is the junction of five different rivers, in which waters all the agriculture of the district. We were comfortable enough when we got on the river, which happened in the beginning of the month of Moharam, A.H. 734, A.D. 1332. From this place the informers wrote of our arrival to the court of the Emperor of India. It is a custom with them that every one who enters India with a wish to see the Emperor must be described in writing from this place, stating the particulars of his person and the objects he has in view, which is sent off by courier. For no one is allowed to appear at court unless the Emperor has been previously acquainted with all the circumstances of his case. End of section 5 Recording by Philip Gould Section 6 of The Travels of Ibn Battuta This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta Translation by Samuel Lee Chapter 14 The River Sind, Multan, Jarai, El Samira, a Hindu sect, Sevastin, Natural Productions, Description of Couriers, Lahari, Bakar, Uja, The Bow, a Measure of Strength, Abuhar, Natural Productions of Hindustan, 
passes a desert infested by Hindu robbers, a Judahan, the custom of burning widows, drowning in the Ganges, Sursati, Masood Abad, Delhi, description of. The river just mentioned is the Sindhi. It is the greatest river in the world, and overflows during the hot weather, just as the Nile does, and at this time they sow the lands. Here also commence the territories of the Emperor of Sindhya and India, who was at this time Mohammed Shah. From this place also is the description of persons arriving, sent in writing to the Emir of Sindhya to Multan. Their emir at this time was one of the Mamluks of the Sultan Muhammad Sartis Shah, i.e. Sharphead, by name, who reviews the armies of the emperor. I next proceeded to the city of Janai, in which is a people called El Samira. They never eat with strangers, nor are seen eating by them, nor do they contract affinities, or suffer anyone to contract affinities with them. It was here I met the Sheikh El Sali El Abed, the religious Boha Odin El Korashi, see page 7, one of the three, of whom the Sheikh El Wali Borhan Odin El Ahraj said in Alexandria that I should meet them in my travels, and I certainly did meet them, may God be praised. I then proceeded to the city of Sevastan, which is large. Without it is a desert, and in this is there no tree except the Egyptian thorn. Nor do they sow anything on the banks of its river except the melon. They generally live upon a sort of millet, peas, fish, and milk of the buffalo, for the buffalo is here in great abundance. The place is exceedingly hot. From Multan, the capital of Sindhya, is at a distance of ten days. But from Multan to Delhi, the residence of the Emperor of Hindustan is a distance of fifty, which, however, will be traversed by the courier with his dispatches in five. There are in Hindustan two kinds of couriers, horse and foot. These they generally term El Wolek. The horse courier, which is part of the Sultan's cavalry, is stationed at the distance of every four miles. As to the foot couriers, there will be one at the distance of every mile, occupying three consecutive stations, which they term El Dava, and making, in the whole three miles, so that there is, at the distance of every three miles, an inhabited village, and without this, three sentry boxes in which the couriers sit, prepared for motion, with their loins girded. In the hand of each is a whip, about two cubits long, and upon the head of this are small bells. Whenever, therefore, one of the couriers leaves any city, he takes his dispatches in the one hand, and the whip, which he constantly keeps shaking, in the other. In this manner he proceeds to the nearest foot courier, and, as he approaches, he shakes his whip. Upon this out comes another, who takes the dispatches, and so proceeds to the next. For this reason it is that the sultan receives his dispatches in so short of time. In Sivastan I met the aged Sheikh Mohammed of Baghdad, who told me that his age was then 140 years, and that he was present when the Caliph el Mostasem was killed by the Tatars in the environs of Baghdad. I then proceeded by the Sindh, to the city of Lehari, which is situated upon the shores of the Indian Sea, where the Sindh joins it. It has a large harbor, into which ships from Persia, Yemen, and other places put. At the distance of a few miles from this city are the ruins of another, in which stones in the shape of men and beasts, almost innumerable, are to be found. The people of this place think that it is the opinion of their historians that there was a city formerly in this place, the greater part of the inhabitants of which were so base that God transformed them, their beasts, their herbs, even to the very seeds, into stones, and indeed stones in the shape of seeds are here almost innumerable. I next proceeded to Bekar which is a handsome city, divided by an arm of the river Sindh. Here I met the religious and pious sheikh Shams Odin Muhammad of Shiraz. This was one of the men remarkable for age. 
He told me that he was something more than 120 years old. I then proceeded on to the city of Uja, which is a large city situated on the Sindh. The governing emir at the time of my arrival was El Malik El Fazil El Sharif Jaal Odin El Kabji, a very brave and generous prince. Between myself and him a friendship arose and was confirmed. After this we met in Delhi. I next travelled on to Multan, which is the principal city of Sindhya, before the emir of which the sultan's soldiers are obliged to appear. This emir had always before him a number of bows of various sizes, and when anyone who wished to enlist as a bowman presented himself, the emir threw one of these bows to him, which he drew with all his might. Then, as his strength proved to be, so was his situation appointed. But when anyone wished to enlist as a horseman, a drum was fixed, and the man ran with his horse at full speed and struck the drum with his spear. Then, according to the effect of the stroke, was his place determined. There were many persons, emirs, nobles, and learned men, who came to this place before us and with us, all intending to be presented to the emperor. After a few days, therefore, one of the chamberlains of the sultan arrived here in order to conduct these persons to the presence. We then hasted on to Delhi, between which and Multan there is a distance of forty days, throughout which, however, are many contiguous houses, and at these we were honored by being invited every morning and evening to feast, prepared by those who came out to meet such as were proceeding to be presented to the emperor. The first city we entered, belonging to Hindustan, was Abuhar, which is the first Indian city in this direction. It is small and closely built, and abounds with water and plantations. There are not in Hindustan any of the trees peculiar to our country, if we except the lot tree, which, however, is larger in the trunk than it is with us and its seeds are like those of a great gall apple exceedingly sweet they have likewise large trees not known among us of their fruit trees the grape is one which resembles the orange tree except that its stem is larger and its leaves more numerous its shade too is extensive and very dense and is apt to affect with fever those who sleep under it the fruit is about the size of a large damask prune, which, when green and not quite ripe, they take, of those which happen to fall, with salt, and thus preserve them, just as the lemon is preserved with us. In the same manner they preserve the ginger, while green, as also the pods of pepper, and this they eat with their meals. When the grape is ripe, which is in the autumn, its seeds become yellow, and this they eat like the apple. It is sweet, but during mastication acquires some acidity. It has rather a large stone, which they sow like the orange seed, and from this a tree grows up. Of their fruits are those termed the shaki and barki, the trees of which are high, and their leaves are like the jaws, or Indian nut. The fruit grows out from the bottom of the tree, and that which grows nearest to the earth is called the barki. It is extremely sweet and well-flavored in taste. What grows above this is the shaki. Its fruit resembles that of the great gourd, its rind the skin of an ox, leather, when it grows yellow in the autumn, they gather and divide it, and in the inside of each is from one to two hundred seeds. Its seed resembles that of a cucumber, and has a stone something like a large bean. When the stone is roasted, it tastes like a dried bean. These, i.e. the shaki and barki, are the best fruits found in Hindustan. They have another sort of fruit, which they call el tand. This is the fruit of the pipercula. Its seed is the size of that of an Armenian peach, to which its color may also be compared. It is exceedingly sweet. They also have the jumun, which is a high tree. The fruit resembles that of the olive and is black, as does likewise its stone. They have also the sweet orange in great abundance, but the acid orange is more esteemed. They also have one between the sweet and sour, which is exceedingly good. They have, too, the fruit called the mahwa. The tree is tall, 
and the leaves are like those of the jaws except that there is a mixture of yellow and red in them the fruit resembles the small prune and is very sweet upon the head of each of its berries is a small seed not unlike the grape both in shape and taste but they who eat it generally experience the headache when dried in the sun its taste is like that of the fig this berry they call el angur the grape however is seldom found in hindustan and then only in delhi and a few other places it produces fruit twice in the year the fig is not found in hindustan they also have a fruit which they call kosaf which is round and very sweet about the tree they dig and heap the earth just as they do about the chestnut they also have in india fruit common with us which is the pomegranate and which bears fruit twice in the year the grain which they sow for subsistence is sown twice in the year and that which is for the autumn about midsummer when the rains fall which they reap in sixty days from the time of sowing it of this grain one is termed the kadru which is a sort of millet this is the most plentiful grain in use among them and of it are the kal and the shamach the latter of which is smaller than a bean the shamach however often grows without culture and is the food of the religious the abstemious the fakirs and the poor generally who go out and gather what thus grows spontaneously and live upon it the year round when this is beaten in a wooden mortar the rind falls off and then the kernel which is white comes out this they boil in the milk of the buffalo and make it into a stew which is much better than when baked of their grain one is the mash which is a sort of pea and of this the munjam is a species the seed is oblong and of a clear green colour this they cook with rice and then eat it with oil it is called el koshira and taken daily for breakfast another species of this is the lubia and another the mohrut which resembles the kudru except that its seed is smaller and is used for fodder for cattle it is pulse they also feed the beasts with the leaves of the mash instead of green corn all these are their autumnal grains and when they cut these they sow the spring grain which consists of wheat barley lentils and pulse on the ground from which the autumnal grain had been gathered the soil of the country is exceedingly good as to the rice they sow it three times during the year on the same ground it is much in use among them the sesame and sugar-cane they cultivate along with the autumnal grain i at length left the town of abuhar and proceeded for one day through a desert enclosed on both sides by mountains upon which were infidel and rebel hindus the inhabitants of india are in general infidels some of them live under the protection of the mohammedans and reside either in the villages or cities others however infest the mountains and rob by the highways i happened to be of a party of two and twenty men when a number of these hindus consisting of two horsemen and eighty foot made an attack upon us we however engaged them and by god's help put them to flight having killed one horseman and twelve of the foot after this we arrived at a fortress and proceeding on from it came at length to the city of adjudhan which is small here i met the holy sheikh farid odin el badhawandi of whom the sheikh el wali borhan odin el araj had spoken to me in the port of alexandria telling me that i should meet him i therefore did meet him and presented him with the sheikh's salutation which surprised him he said i am unworthy of this the sheikh was very much broken by the temptations of the devil he allowed no one to touch his hand or to approach him and whenever the clothes of any one happened to touch his he washed them immediately his patronymic is referred to Badhawand, a town of El Sambal. In this part I also saw those women who burn themselves when their husbands die. The woman adorns herself and is accompanied by a cavalcade of the infidel Hindus and Brahmins, with drums, trumpets, and men following her, both Muslims and infidels for mere pastime.
The fire had already been kindled, and into it they threw the dead husband. The wife then threw herself upon him, and both were entirely burnt. A woman's burning herself, however, with her husband, is not considered as absolutely necessary among them, but it is encouraged, and when a woman burns herself with her husband, her family is considered as being ennobled and supposed to be worthy of trust. But when she does not burn herself, she is ever after clothed coarsely and remains in constraint among her relations on account of her want of fidelity to her husband. The woman who burns herself with her husband is generally surrounded by women who bid her farewell and commission her with salutations for their former friends, while she laughs, plays, or dances to the very time in which she is to be burnt. Some of the Hindus, moreover, drown themselves in the river Ganges, to which they perform pilgrimages, and into which they pour the ashes of those who have been burnt. When any one intends to drown himself, he opens his mind on the subject to one of his companions and says, You are not to suppose that I do this for the sake of anything worldly. My only motive is to draw near to Kisai, which is a name of God with them. And when he is drowned, they draw him out of the water, burn the body, and pour the ashes into the Ganges. After four days' journey, I arrived at the city of Sarsati. It is large and abounds with rice, which they carry hence to Delhi. And after this, at Hansi, which is a very beautiful and closely built city, with extensive fortifications, I next came to Masud Abad after two days' traveling, and remained there three days. The Emperor Muhammad, whom it was our object to see, had at this time left his residence in Delhi, and gone to Kinno which is at the distance of ten days from that place. He sent his vizier, however, Kaja Jahan Ahmed ibn Ayas, a native of Rum, with a number of kings, doctors, and grandees, to receive the travellers, and Emir is with them termed king. The vizier then so arranged the procession that each one had a place according to his rank. We then proceeded on from Masud Abad till we came to Delhi the capital of the empire. It is a most magnificent city, combining at once both beauty and strength. Its walls are such as to have no equal in the whole world. This is the greatest city of Hindustan, and indeed of all Islamism in the East. It now consists of four cities, which becoming continuous have formed one. This city was conquered in the year of the Hejira, 584 A.D., 1188. The thickness of its walls is eleven cubits. They keep grain in this city for a very long time without its undergoing any change whatever. I myself saw rice brought out of the treasury, which was quite black, but nevertheless had lost none of the goodness of its taste. The same was the case with the Kadru, which had been in the treasury for ninety years. Flowers, too, are in continual blossom in this place. Its mosque is very large, and, in the beauty and extent of its building, it has no equal. Before the taking of Delhi, it had been a Hindu temple, which the Hindus called el bur Kana, but Kana. But after that event, it was used as a mosque. In its courtyard is a cell, to which there is no equal in the cities of the Mohammedans. Its height is such that men appear from the top of it like little children. In its court, too, there is an immense pillar, which they say is composed of stones from seven different quarries. Its length is thirty cubits, its circumference eight, which is truly miraculous. Without, the city is a reservoir for the rainwater, and out of this the inhabitants have their water for drinking. It is two miles in length and one in width. About it are pleasure gardens to which the people resort, the nobles of the city. Chapter 15 Conquest of Delhi, Abstract of the History of Hindustan, From This Time to That, in which Ibn Battuta visited this place. The city of Delhi was conquered by the emir Khatbi Odan Abak, one of the Mamluks of the Sultan. Shahab Odin Muhammad ibn Sam al Ghori, king of Gizna and Khorasan, who had overcome Ibrahim ibn Mahmud ibn Subuktajin, the beginner of the conquest of India. 
this emir kotab odin resided here as governor on the part of shabab odin but when kotbi odin died his son shams odin lahmish became governor after this shams odin became possessed of the kingdom here having been appointed thereto by the general consent of the people and he governed india for twenty years he was a just learned and religious prince after his death his son rokin odin took possession of the throne but polluted his reign by killing his brothers and was therefore killed himself upon this the army agreed to place his sister el malika razia upon the throne who reigned four years this woman usually rode about among the army just as men do she however gave up the government on account of some circumstances that presented themselves after this her younger brother nasir odin became possessed of the government which he held for twenty years this was a very religious prince and so much so that he lived entirely on what he got by writing out and selling copies of the koran he was succeeded by his nawab giath odin ahmed one of his father's mamluks who murdered him this man's name was originally balaban his character had been just discriminating and mild he filled the office of nawab of india under nasir odin for twenty years he also reigned twenty years one of his pious acts was his building a house which was called the house of safety for whenever any debtor entered this his debt was adjudged and in like manner every oppressed person found justice every manslayer deliverance from his adversary and every person in fear protection when he died he was buried in this house and there i myself visited his grave the history of his beginnings is surprising which is this when a child he lived in bokhara in the possession of one of the inhabitants and was a little despicable ill-looking wretch upon a time a certain fakir saw him there and said you little turk which is considered by them as a very reproachful term the reply was i am here good sir this surprised the fakir who said to him go and bring me one of those pomegranates pointing to some which had been exposed for sale in the street the urchin replied yes sir and immediately taking out all the money he had went and bought the pomegranate when the fakir received it he said to balaban we give you the kingdom of india upon which the boy kissed his own hand and said i have accepted of it and am quite satisfied it happened about this time that the sultan shams odin sent a merchant to purchase slaves from bokhara and samarkand he accordingly bought a hundred and balaban was among them when these mamluks were brought before the sultan they all pleased him except balaban and him he rejected on account of his despicable appearance upon this balaban said to the emperor lord of the world why have you bought all these slaves the emperor smiled and said for my own sake no doubt the slave replied by me then for god's sake i will said he he then accepted of him and placed him among the rest but on account of the badness of his appearance gave him a situation among the cup-bearers some of the astrologers who were about the king were daily in the habit of saying to him one of the mamluks will one day overcome thy son and take the kingdom from him to this the emperor on account of the justice and excellency of his own character paid no regard till they also told it to the queen mother who soon made an impression on his mind respecting it he accordingly summoned the astrologers before him and said pray can you tell which of the mamluks it is who is to take the kingdom from my son if you see him they said we have a mark whereby we can distinguish him the emperor then ordered all the mamluks to be present who came accordingly station after station as commanded upon these the astrologers fixed their eyes but did not discover the person looked for until the day began to draw towards the close at this time the cup-bearers said one to another we are getting rather hungry let us join and send someone into the street to buy us something to eat they did so and balaban as the most despicable was sent to make the purchase 
Balaban accordingly sallied forth, but could find nothing in that street which would suit him. He then went on into another, during which time the turn of the cup-bearers came on to be presented. But, as Balaban was not forthcoming, they took a little pitch and whatever else was necessary for their purpose, and daubing it over a child, took him with them in the place of Balaban, and when his name was called over, this child was presented, and the business of the day was closed, without the astrologers finding their mark upon any one, which was a providential circumstance for Balaban. At last Balaban made his appearance, but not till the business of the day was over. The cleverness of Balaban was afterwards noticed, and he was made head of the cup-bearers. After this he was placed in the army, and soon became a general officer. After this the Sultan Jalal Odin married his daughter, which was before he had been made king. But when he was, he appointed Balaban to the office of Nawab or Viceroy, which he filled for twenty years. He then killed his master and seized the empire. This Balaban had two sons, one of these, namely, El Khan El Shahid. He appointed as his own successor and governor on his part in the provinces of Sindia. He resided at Multan. He was killed, however, in an affair with the Tartars, leaving two sons, Kegobad and Kekosru. Balaban's second son, named Nasir Oden, was appointed to govern the districts of Laknuti and Bengal. When, however, the heir apparent El Khan El Shahid had been killed, Balaban appointed El Khan El Shahid's son Kekosru his successor, passing over his own son Nasir Oden. Nasir Oden, however, had a son named Moise Oden, residing at the court of his grandfather at Delhi, the person who eventually became successor to Balaban. This at length came to pass on account of Giath Oden Balaban's dying in the night, when his own son Nasir Oden was out of the way in the district of Laknuti. On this occasion he appointed Kakhosru his grandson, the son of El Khan El Shahid, as already mentioned. The king, however, or chief of the emirs and Nawab to the Sultan Balaban, happened to have conceived a strong enmity against Kakhosru. On this account he had recourse to a stratagem, which gained him his end. It was this. He forged a letter in the name of the emirs, stating that they had declared Moise Odan, son of Nasir Odan, king. With this he goes to Kakasuru by night, as if wishing to advise with him, and says, The emirs have proclaimed thy uncle's son, and I very much fear for thy safety. The reply was, What am I to do? He said, Save thyself by escaping to the districts of Sindia. But, replied he, how am I to get through the gates of the city which are already barred? The keys, answered the emir, are here in my possession. I will open the gates for you. The young man thanked him for this and then kissed his hand. The emir said, Mount immediately. He accordingly did, with his nobles and slaves, and the emir opened the gates, let them out, and immediately closed them again. He next went to Moise Oden, son of Nasir Oden, and asked permission to enter, which, being granted, he proclaimed him emperor. But how is this, replied Moise Oden, since Kakhosru, my uncle's son, was appointed successor? The emir told him of his stratagem and how he had got rid of Kakhosru. Moise Oden thanked him for this, and then took him to the palace, where, sending for the rest of the emirs and nobles, they invested him with the supreme authority during the night. In the morning this was confirmed by the people generally, and Moise Oden took possession of the throne. His father, however, was living at this time in the provinces of Benga and Laknuti, and when the news of his son's being made emperor reached him, he said, I am heir to the crown. How, then, can my son exercise this authority during my lifetime? He accordingly set out with his army for Delhi in order to make war upon his son Moise Oden. Moise Oden, too, marched out with his troops to give battle to his father. They both arrived at the same time at the city of Kara, which is situated on the banks of the Ganges. 
took their stations on opposite sides of the river and prepared for the onset it was the will of divine providence however to spare the blood of the faithful and hence the heart of the father nasir odan began to relent towards his son for he said to himself surely as long as my son is king i shall partake of his glory moiz odan too felt in his mind that something of submission was due to his father each of them therefore as if by instinct left his army and rode directly into the middle of the river and met there here the emperor kissed the feet of his father and asked his forgiveness his father replied i give you my kingdom and so invested him with the authority of emperor he then wished to retire to his districts but his son said nay you must come with me to mine he accordingly accompanied him to delhi and entering the palace seated his son upon the throne and took his own station before him this day is therefore called the day of meeting because they had this happy rencontre in the middle of the river no blood being shed and the kingdom mutually given and accepted after this nasir odan returned to his districts where after two years he died leaving a family behind him the kingdom was thus confirmed to moiz odan which continued for four years during which the inhabitants may be said to have enjoyed a continual holiday after this he was affected by a complaint by which one of his sides became quite withered and for which the physicians could find no remedy at this time his nawab jalal odin feroz shah el khilaji revolted taking his station upon a high mount without the city moiz odin sent his emirs for the purpose of giving him battle but they all one after another joined him and proclaimed him emperor jalal odin then entered the city and enclosing moiz odin within his palace for three days overcame him put him to death and took possession of his kingdom this jalal odin was a mild and well-informed prince he governed india for two years he had a son and a daughter the daughter he married to his brother's son allah odin a daring bold and powerful man his wife however so much harassed him that he was obliged to complain to her father in order to have an end put to their disputes the uncle had given him the government of Kara and Manikbur, containing two of the most populous districts in India. Allah Odan, however, had an eye to the kingdom. The only difficulty he had to contend with was his want of money, for he had none, except what he got by his sword in making new conquests. Upon one of these expeditions his horse happened to stumble against a stone as he went along, and from this a kind of ringing noise proceeded. He immediately ordered his men to dig, and here they found an immense quantity of wealth. This he divided among his followers, and hence acquired considerable power. It happened that his uncle undertook an expedition against him, and summoned him before him, but he refused to appear the uncle then prepared to go to him for he said this young man is as my son i will therefore go to him the nephew accordingly met him which happened upon the banks of the ganges in the very place where moiz odin and nasir odin had formerly met and like them each rode into the middle of the river Allah Odin, however, had commanded his followers that at the time he should embrace his uncle Jalal Odin, they were to kill him. When therefore the parties met, and the nephew was in the act of embracing the uncle, the followers of the nephew killed him, which put Allah Odin in possession of his uncle's army, and all proclaimed him emperor. After this he governed Hindustan for twenty years. He was just, and looked to the affairs of his subjects in person. Now he also had a nephew named Soliman Shah, and as he was one day engaged in the chase, this nephew conceived the intention of destroying him, just as he had of destroying his own uncle. He shot him accordingly with an arrow in an unguarded moment, and the uncle fell from his horse the nephew was about to make up to him when he was told by his slave that he need not do so as he was quite dead he left him therefore and returned to the palace and took possession of the government 
a little while after allah odin recovering from his stupor got up and mounted a horse which the army perceiving joined him he then entered the city and besieged his nephew soliman shah in the palace who feeling his weakness betook himself to flight but was taken and put to death by his uncle allah odin after this he never rode a hunting to divine service or to the celebration of any public holiday he had five sons the younger of whom were shahab odan and kotbi odan the eldest he had during his lifetime ordered to be kept in prison when taken with his last sickness the anger of the young man on account of his imprisonment not having abated and when the disease was making rapid advances he sent for this son in order to name him as his successor but he delaying to come in consequence of this irritation the mamluks the head of whom hated this son together with the principal nuab placed the younger son shahab odan upon the throne as soon as the emperor was dead and the appointment was confirmed by the people the three elder children however were ordered to be imprisoned and their eyes to be put out and thus was the government established upon this the queen sent for two of the most powerful of her husband's mamluks the name of one of whom was bashir that of the other mubashir and with tears complained of the conduct of the principal nuab towards her children soliciting their assistance and stimulating them to put the chief nuab to death and affirming that it was his intention to murder her younger son kotbi odan they accordingly agreed to kill him which they did by stratagem while he was in his house they then brought forth kotbi odan to his brother shahab odan who held the reins of government kotbi odan remained for some time in the situation of his nuab but at length deposed his brother and took possession of the kingdom which he held for some time after this he took a journey to daulat abad between which and delhi is a distance of forty days the road is from first to last enclosed with willow and other trees so that a traveller seems to be in a garden throughout all this distance besides there are at the distance of every three miles the stations of the foot couriers at which there are also inhabitants as already mentioned from this place to el telingana and el mabar is a distance of six months in all these stations there is a lodging for the emperor with cells for his suite and for travellers generally there is no necessity therefore for a poor man's carrying any provisions with him on this road when therefore the sultan kotbi odan was on this journey and had with him kazir khan the son of his elder brother who was in prison some of the emirs formed a conspiracy by which it was their intention to depose the emperor and to proclaim this son of his elder brother but the emperor discovering this instantly put his nephew and his nephew's father to death as well as his other brothers who were then confined in the fortress of caliur this fortress is situated on the top of a high hill and seems as if it had been cut out of the rock opposite to it is no other mount within it are reservoirs filled with rain-water and about it are numerous walls upon which warlike engines are planted this is their strongest fortress beneath it is a small town when however kotbi odin had killed his brothers and so purified his kingdom that no one seemed left to contend with him divine providence gave the supreme power to one of his most powerful and choice friends namely nasir odin khosru khan who killed him and took possession of the empire but this he held only for a short time the reason was that when he had taken possession of the throne he sent dresses of honour to the governors of the several provinces which they all put on as a mark of obedience if we except toglik shah father of the present emperor of hindustan mohammed shah this person was then governor of dibalbur and would neither put on the dress nor tender his obedience the consequence was an army was sent against him which he put to flight the emperor then sent his brother against him 
him also he routed and put to death and so far did matters proceed that togluk also slew nasir odin khosru khan and seized his empire this nasir odin had originated some great abominations during his reign of which the forbidding oxen to be slaughtered is one and which is one of the regulations of the infidel hindus for among them no one is allowed to slaughter an ox and in case he should do so he is ordered to be stitched up in its skin and be burnt the reason is they so much esteem the ox that they drink its urine both to promote prosperity and to recover health they also daub their walls with the dung of these animals. Hence it was that Nasir Odan became so hateful to the Mohammedans that they stimulated Toglik Giath Odan to put him to death and to take possession of the kingdom. This Toglik was originally descended from the Turks who inhabit the mountains in the district of Sindia. He was very poor, but betaking himself to the cities of these parts, he got employment in feeding cattle after this he became a foot soldier and then a horse soldier in the next place as his abilities appeared he was made a commanding officer after this the emperor kotbi odan appointed him governor of de balber and his son who is now emperor keeper of the horse toglik was brave warlike honorable and just and as his son was stationed at delhi as keeper of the horse when the father had determined to rebel he corresponded with this son who cajoled the emperor khosru khan sometimes for example appearing at his post without the city and then returning to his father after some days however he was missing till after sunset which giving some suspicion to nasir odan he sent for him but could not find him on this occasion he had escaped and taken all the best of the emperor's horses to his father chapter fifteen the emir of multan kashlu khan joined togluk in his rebellion in order to avenge kotbi odan son of nasir odan their common master when, however, the two conspirators entered Delhi, and Nasir Odan had betaken himself to flight with only a few Hindu fakirs, Togluk said to Kashlukan, You shall be emperor. But he refused, and Togluk took possession of the government. After this, Nasir Odan was taken and put to death, and the kingdom was purged and remained so for four years. After this, the emperor sent his son, who is now emperor, to reduce the provinces of Telinga, which are at the distance of three months from Delhi. But when he had arrived at a certain part of the way, one of the courtiers thought proper to rebel, and to possess himself, if possible, of the kingdom. For this purpose he circulated a report that the emperor was dead, supposing that the emirs would now immediately proclaim him king. When they heard this, however, every one of them struck his drum and betook himself to his own part, i.e. to rebellion, so that the prince was left with his particular friends alone. The emirs, moreover, intended to kill him, but from this they were diverted by one of the great men of their body, whose name was Timur. The prince then fled to his father with ten of his friends, whom he styled Yeran, i.e. friends in the Persic. But when he came to him, was immediately sent back on his journey with a large army. Upon this the emirs, who had intended to put him to death, fled, but some of them were taken and put to death. Thus the matter terminated, and he returned to his father. The father himself then undertook an expedition against the province of Laknuti, in which resided at that time the Sultan Shams Oden, son of Giath Oden Balaban, to whom had fled the emirs of Toglik, as just mentioned. About this time, however, Shams Oden died, having first bound his son Shahab Oden by contract, who accordingly took possession of the throne. His younger brother, however, Gath Oden Bahadur Bura, overcame him and seized upon the kingdom. He then killed all the rest of his brothers except Shahab Oden, who had been bound to mount the throne, and Nasir Oden, for they fled to Toglik, imploring assistance. He allowed them, therefore, to march with his army in order to give battle to Giath Oden. 
Tagluk had also appointed his son Mohammed to the office of Nuab in Delhi during his own absence on this expedition. He proceeded, therefore, and gained possession of the province of Laknuti, having put Gath Odan to the rout, after which, however, he took him prisoner and carried him to Delhi. When he had got near to Delhi, he sent to his son Mohammed, requesting him to build him a kushka, that is, a palace, which he did, and constructed one well made of wood in the space of three days. But Mohammed the son made an agreement with the geometrician who planned it, that the steps leading to it should be made sufficiently broad to allow the elephants to ascend them, in order to their being presented to the emperor Togluk. A place also was so constructed that when the foot of the elephant should come in contact with it, the whole palace should fall down upon all who may happen to be in it. When, therefore, the emperor arrived at his palace, he had it carpeted and furnished, and took up his residence within it. Now the emperor had a second son, who was a great favorite with him. In consequence of this, the elder brother Mohammed very much feared lest he should be appointed successor to the throne. When, therefore, the different orders, as well as those who had come to welcome the sultan, had concluded the banquet, the elephants were presented before him. But when the elephant's foot came in contact with the place appointed, down came the palace upon the head of the sultan Togluk, his favorite son, and the courtiers who were assembled before him, and all perished. Muhammad, the present emperor, accordingly took possession of the throne, having been proclaimed by the emirs and people, and thus was the kingdom purged of his enemies. Appendix An abstract of the history of the fortress of Gwalior, from the Gwalior Nama of Heraman ibn Kardar das de Munchi. As this fortress is one of the greatest curiosities in Hindustan, I may perhaps be excused in giving some extracts from a book entitled The Gwalior Nama, respecting its history and governors, the hill, it is said, was originally called Kumatat, and that its neighborhood abounded in wild beasts. Upon the hill a devotee named Gawalipa made his residence just thirty-two years before the reign of Bikramajit. Some time after this a zamindar named Suraj Sin, happening to come to this place while engaged in the chase, applied to the devotee for water to drink, which was granted. Upon this and some other occasions the powers of these waters turned out to be so wonderfully beneficial that the zemindar requested to be permitted to enlarge the well, and to build a fortress on the hill, which was also granted. The darvesh, after blessing the zemindar, and giving him a casket, which had the supernatural property of supplying him with gold, gave him the name of Suraj Pal, adding that as long as his descendants retained the name of Pal, so long would they hold this fortress, and succeed in reducing their neighbors to their obedience. The consequence of which was, this zemindar and his posterity became the proprietors of all the neighboring country, and after him the well Suraj Kund received its name. After this king, eighty-four of his posterity reigned in the fortress of Gwalior, the fourth of whom, Bim Pal, built the pagoda called Bim Absar. The seventh Bush Pal built the pagoda called Chatar Bush Ray at the top of the fortress. The eighth Padampal built the pagoda of Lakshmi Narayan. The ninth Anang Pal, skilled as it should seem in the chemical art, struck golden ashrafs of five tola in weight. Nothing remarkable is recorded of the rest until we come to the last, who received the name of Yataj Karan, and who, conformable with the prophecy of the Hindu sage, lost the government of the fort, together with that of the adjacent countries. The account of this event is shortly this. A neighboring Raja named Ran Mal had no son and only one daughter. This prince, therefore, of the Pal family offered himself as her suitor and was accepted. Before he could return to Gwalior, he was adopted son and successor to the Raja Ran Mal, and as this Raja's dominions were greater than his own, he was easily persuaded by his viceroy Ram Deo, whom he had left at Gwalior, to make over the government of the country and fortress to him. 
Seven of Ram Deo's successors held the fortress accordingly, until the time of the Sultan Shams Odan, who was originally a slave of Turkish extraction, belonging to the Sultan Kotbi Odan Epak. This king, when returning from an expedition to the Deccan, saw for the first time this singularly strong fortress, and upon finding that none of its governors had paid tribute to the emperors of Delhi, swore upon the Koran that he would subdue it, which he soon after accomplished. Upon this occasion, which happened A.H. 630, A.D. 1232, a mosque was erected in the fort, and prayers offered up in the name of the sultan. Some time after, the sultan surveying the place found that it contained only two wells of water, and that the part at which he had entered was rather weak. He ordered a wall, therefore, to be built, joining it to the hill, and in the area he made eight wells and nine badries, all of which are still in being. One of these wells is very famous for its waters, which are carried to a great distance and are found very useful to invalids. After the sultan had made all his arrangements, he returned to Delhi, leaving the fortress in the hands of one Bahadur Khan. From this time to that of the sultan Allah Odan, no officer had been sent from Delhi to Gwalior. Some time after his accession, however, it was given to two Rajputs of the Purgana of Dandaruli as a reward for faithful service. These men, however, being much envied by their neighbors, the Rajputs of Tunur were at length invited to a feast at a little distance from the fortress and killed by treachery. The fortress then fell into their hands, and eight persons of that tribe held it in succession. Several wells, pagodas, and bowers were made by this race, the last of whom was Bikramajit. The fortress then reverted to the Muslims. From this time to the reign of Ibrahim, grandson of the Sultan Balul Ludi, the fortress was held by Bikramajit upon paying tribute to the kings of Delhi. Ibrahim, however, forced the power, not without considerable loss, out of the hands of Bikramajit, who, being sent to the presence a prisoner, received the Jagir of Shams Abad. The government of the fortress then fell into the hands of Azam Humayun, Ibrahim's general. Some time after this, Ibrahim, suspecting the fidelity of his nobles, and thinking it particularly dangerous to retain Azam Humayun, who had a large and powerful circle of friends, had him suddenly put to death, upon which Salim Khan, son of the murdered general, rebelled, and betook himself to the east of Hindustan, but was taken and put to death by Darya Khan, who had been appointed governor of the province of Bihar. Soon after, the Ludi family fled to the Punjab and presented themselves and their services to Zahir Odan Mohammed Baber in Kabul. Here they represented the perturbed state of Hindustan and formed a treaty with him, which ended in its final subjugation, for soon after a battle took place in which Ibrahim was slain, with Bikramajit fighting at his side. Kajarahim Dad, one of Baber's servants, was now appointed to the government of Gwalior, but in a little time got out of favor, when a Rajput named Dahar Mankad, a zamindar of that quarter, became governor of the fortress. Upon this occasion, Sheikh Mohammed Goth, a man of considerable influence, represented to the king the great impropriety of an infidel's holding this fortress, under a sovereign who professed the true faith, and Kaja Rahim Dad was restored to the government, which he held but a short time, and was succeeded by Abul Fath, who held it till the death of Baber. When Mohammed Humayun succeeded to the throne, he took up his residence for some time in the fortress of Gwalior, and at that time built the Humayun Temple, a place commanding an extensive prospect and enjoying the most wholesome air. He then returned to his capital. When Shir Shah came to the throne, he took up his residence for some time at Gwalior, and then built the Sher Temple, and also constructed a large tank in its area. 
After the death of Shir Shah, which happened at this place, his son Jalal Khan succeeded to the throne and took the name of Islam Shah. He also took up his residence in this fortress, and in it he died. During the next reign, which was short and troublous, the possession of the fort of Gwalior remained in the hands of Barbal, a slave of Shir Shah, who held it until Akbar came to the throne. The Rajputs, however, desirous of regaining their ancient ascendancy in these parts, with Ramsa, a son of Bikramajit, assembled a large force and attacked the fortress. Upon this occasion, Kaya Khan, one of Akbar's generals, was dispatched to relieve and take possession of it. When Kaya arrived at Gwalior, he was met by the forces of Ramsa, and an obstinate battle of three days' continuance ensued but which ended in favor of Akbar's troops. After this, Bahbal remained to be subdued, and the fort to be taken, which, after a short siege, was completed. The servants of Akbar held the fortress after this for fifty years. When Jahangir came to the throne, the government of Gwalior was put into the hands of his servants, who seem to have advised him to destroy the building termed the Shir Mandar, to erect another in its place, and to name it the Jahangir Mandar, which is said to be very beautiful. When Shah Jahan succeeded to the empire, the government of Gwalior fell to the lot of one of his greatest favorites and bravest generals, Muzaffir Khan who on this occasion received the title of Walakani Jahan, and in his hands it remained during a space of nineteen years. This governor was a great encourager of good and learned men, and very remarkable for his justice and liberality to all. He is said to have had an elephant so powerful and courageous that he would destroy whole ranks of the enemy at once, which he did so effectually upon a battle happening with the house of Ludi, that he was the principal cause of the victory, and for which the governor obtained the title of Kani Jahan. On this and other accounts, he had a statue of this elephant carved in stone and set up at the north gate of the fort. Near the same spot, he erected and peopled a village, and this he called, after his former name, Muzaffir Pur. In the vicinity of this, he planted a garden, and here he made two wells and erected some seats for the accommodation of the inhabitants. A few trees of this garden still remain. Besides this, he built a lofty mansion for himself, containing some large rooms of state, with other apartments, in the court of which he made a deep tank, and in the front of this court four gardens. In this mansion the governors of the fort still reside. It is also said that during this man's government his son Mansur planted a garden on the banks of the river Sunrig which he called after his own name, and which still is used as a promenade for the town. He built, too, four walls of stone, in the middle of which seats were constructed. He also built and peopled the village Mansurpur, which he called after his own name, and this still remains. After the expiration of nineteen years, Kani Jahan took a journey to Lahore, and there died. Upon this occasion, Sayyad Salar Khan, who had been his confidential servant, asked for and obtained the government of the fort of Gwalior. He then resided in it for two years. After this, his brother governed the fort, and he himself was appointed to the government of the provinces. This brother, named Sayyad Alam, held the fort for five years, during which time he made and beautified a garden near the Sarai of Meher Ali, and in the ground known by the name of Kisurpur. He built and peopled the village Shah Kunj. It is said that at that time the foundations of the gates of the fort called Badal Kada and Hiata Pul had become much decayed, and that he repaired them, covering the gates with iron and so firmly nailing them, that the rush of an elephant would not make the least impression on them. Soon after this he was put out of office for some crime which had better not be mentioned, as our author tells us, and was succeeded by Loharhasp Khan, son of Muhabat Khan, who appointed Karhasp Khan his lieutenant. 
but after two years took up his residence himself in the fortress. He is said to have been a brave and liberal man, charitable to the poor, and most anxious for information, both from travellers and others. He erected a court of justice without the gate, called Badal Kada, and close to the northern wall of the fort, in which on certain days he administered justice to the people. The kettle drum of royalty, which formerly was placed at the gate, termed Hayatapul, he removed to the east of the fort, and nearer to the city, where it still remains. He commenced the removal of the Shakunj to the east of the fort, but left the work unfinished. He also erected a lofty state-room in the Arwahi, and made two wells of exceeding good water in its courtyard after the space of six years however he was sent on an expedition into the deccan from which he returned with success he then presented himself before the emperor in delhi who appointed him to the government of the suba of kabul upon this occasion his governor at gwalior was a person named akharaj an officer in whom he placed great confidence this happened in a h ten sixty seven a d sixteen fifty six during the sickness of the reigning king, which happened at this time, and the troubles which arose on account of the rebellion of Darashiko and his brothers, we hear scarcely anything of the fortress of Gwalior, because perhaps it happened to lie almost entirely out of the scene of action. It remained, however, for some time in the hands of Akharaj, but as he had the imprudence to close it on one occasion against the royal standard, it was at length given to obeyed Allah khan and soon after this several of the rebels falling into the king's power were put into confinement in the fortress and there kept in the next year i e a h ten sixty eight a d sixteen fifty seven dara shiko was carried prisoner to delhi and there lost his life and upon this his son sipahar shiko with several of his friends were all placed in the fortress of gwalior in the custody of obeyed Allah khan the fort was now closely guarded and no stranger permitted to enter it about this time a great scarcity took place probably in consequence of the preceding wars when obeyed Allah khan made a provision for the first time for the pious for travellers and the poor this was given in the courthouse built by the former governor where mohammed a sharif and mansabdar presided soon after several other of the rebels namely mohammed sultan soliman shiko and several nobles their friends fell into the hands of the emperor and were consigned to the governor of gwalior who now was mutamid khan obeyed allah having been commanded to give up the fortress to him Solomon Shiko, however, soon after died, and Morad Baksh, one of the nobles, was put to death by the law of retaliation. The graves of both are on the top of the fort. The first two years of the government of Muatadid Khan in the fortress of Gwalior were marked with the utmost liberality and regard to public good, particularly so as a great scarcity prevailed during this time. He also erected a lofty hall for the transaction of public business, adjoining the Shah Jahan Mandar, as also a bath which was a great public convenience a wall too which had long been commenced stretching out before the gate termed badal kada and which had been intended to obstruct a ready egress from the fort was completed by him to which he added another somewhat higher than the gateway and joining the walls of the castle a sixth gateway leading from the fort to the plain was also constructed by him and this received the name alamgir Upon both angles of the wall he likewise erected a lofty tower, and over the gates of each of those a chateri. On the left side of the gate, Badal Kada, a large hall of justice was also built, in which the business of state was ever after to be transacted, from all of which the appearance and strength of the fort were greatly augmented. The inscription then written on the Alam Giri gate was this. In the happy times of Alamgir, from whose bounty time was blessed, Muatamid Khan, from his lofty mind, opened a door of prosperity upon the face of the fortress. Hatif said, on the year of its date, Let the place long remain the residence of plenty. 
the sum of the letters according to the abjad found in the last line of these verses will give the date of the hegira in which this event took place which is a h ten seventy one a d sixteen sixty the mandui looking towards the city eastward and commenced by muhabat khan was completed by this governor and called arang kunjabad he also constructed the shops which run in both directions and in which the business of the city and markets is carried on over this place he constructed a high wall which joins the fort and which received the name of the fort the asylum of the city encompassing this is the norikunj abad also erected by him for the reception and support of the pious he also repaired and very much strengthened the court of the kachari and as the inhabitants of this part were very much in want of water he obtained leave from the court to construct three stone cisterns with seats gates and whatever else was necessary to promote the convenience and pleasure of the people all of which he completed and the following is the inscription which was placed over one of the gates at this time during the reign of the great prince al magir from whose justice the world is peopled mustamid khan erected a strong building from the water of which the sick are healed by wisdom says hatif i sought the year of its erection it is a fountain of light i e the sum of the letters in the last four words which is a h ten seventy three a d sixteen sixty two the tank which stood in the way to the fort and was situated near the bahrum pool growing old was by the heavy rains which fell about this time utterly destroyed and the stones of which it had been built were carried to some distance this governor thoroughly repaired it and the idol temple standing near it which had originally belonged to gawali pa and was now much frequented by the hindus he converted into a mosque for the use of strangers and travellers the following is the inscription which was then fixed upon it in the reign of the great prince al magir like the full shining moon the enlightener of the world praise to god that this happy place was by muatamid khan completed as an alms it was the idol temple of the vile gawali he made it a mosque like a mansion of paradise the khan of enlightened heart nay light itself from head to foot displayed the divine light like that of midday he closed the idol temple exclamations of surprise rose from earth to heaven when the light put far away the abode of darkness darkness hatif said let the light be a blessing nota bene the sum of the letters composing the last three words counted according to the abjad see sir william jones's persian grammar page fourteen edit nine amounts to ten seventy five and this gives the year of the hegira in which this took place a d sixteen sixty four he also repaired and deepened a tank in the grounds called the kabutar khana or pigeon house and to this he gave the name of nuri sakir another tank too situated on the top of the fort and near the shah jahan mandar which had grown so much out of repair as to lose its water notwithstanding its having been cut out of the solid rock he thoroughly repaired and enclosed with a wall firmly built with brick and mortar so that not a drop of its water was lost to each of these last a copy of verses was attached giving the date of the repairs and the name of the khan which i do not think it worth while to copy out and translate the same governor it is said so adorned and planted the arwahi which appeared like a girdle about the mount that it presented fountains tanks a chabutera grapes melons and other fruits such that many of the fruits were on account of their superlative excellence frequently sent to the presence at delhi the melons were occasionally so large that some of them exceeded fourteen of the ser of shah jahan abad in weight besides this a mosque was erected in the chok bazaar with three immensely high towers and some minarets having also a tank of water with other fountains always filled with water and surrounded with seats for the convenience of ablution before this is an area with a very high gate on the top of which is a bankla and on both sides two beautifully constructed halls 
another tank was also made and named after his son jamali sarur which was surrounded by stone walls and provided with seats in the year 1078 of the Hegira, A.D. 1667, an order came from the court commanding Mortimid Khan to give up the fort, together with the prisoners it contained, which were then three, to Kidmatgar Khan and to proceed to the presence in order to receive the government of Akberabad. With this, the Khan complied and proceeded to Shah Jahanabad, where he was loaded with favors and dismissed to his station. And as the writer of this history, Heraman ibn Qadar Das the Munchi, was a servant of Motimid Khan, his account of Gwalior closes with the removal of his master from that place. End of section six. Section 7 of The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translation by Samuel Lee. Chapter 16. Ibn Battuta arrives at the Queen Mother's palace, his daughter's death and funeral, the emperor's return to Delhi, appoints Ibn Battuta judge of Delhi, character of the emperor, quarrels with the inhabitants of Delhi, and commands them to quit the city for Dalatabad, Emir of Fargana put to death, the Kazai Jalal Odan and others put to death. Cruelties of the Emperor, Arabic panegyric composed by our traveller for him, in danger of losing his life, gives up his office, and joins the religious. Let us now return to the description of our arrival in Delhi. When we arrived at this place, the vizier having previously met us, we came to the door of the Sultan's harem to the place in which his mother, el Makduma Jahan, resides, the vizier, as also the Kezai of the place, being still with us. These paid their respects at the entrance, and we all followed their example. We also, each of us, sent his present to her, which was proportionate to his circumstances. The queen's secretaries then registered these presents, and informed her of them. The presents were accepted, and we were ordered to be seated. Her viands were then brought in. We received the greatest respect and attention in their odd way. After this, dresses of honor were put upon us, and we were ordered to withdraw to such places as had been prepared for each of us. We made our obeisance and retired accordingly. This service is presented by one's bowing the head, placing one of the hands on the earth, and then retiring. When I had got to the house prepared for me, I found it furnished with every carpet, vessel, couch, and fuel one could desire. The victuals which they brought us consisted of flour, rice, and flesh, all of which were brought from the mother of the emperor. Every morning we paid our respects to the vizier, who on one occasion gave me two thousand dinars, and said, This is to enable you to get your clothes washed. He also gave me a large robe of honor, and to my attendants, who amounted to about forty, he gave two thousand dinars. After this, the emperor's allowance was brought to us, which amounted to the weight of one thousand deli rittles of flour, where every rittle is equal to five and twenty rittles of Egypt. We also had one thousand rittles of flesh, and of fermented liquors, oil, oil olive, and the betel nut, many riddles, and also many of the betel leaf. During this time, and in the absence of the emperor, a daughter of mine happened to die, which the vizier communicated to him. The emperor's distance from Delhi was that of ten stages. Nevertheless, the vizier had an answer from him on the morning of the day on which the funeral was to take place. His orders were that what was usually done on the death of any of the children of the nobility should be done now. On the third day, therefore, 
the vizier came with the judges and nobles who spread a carpet and made the necessary preparations consisting of incense rose water readers of the koran and panegyris when i proceeded with the funeral i expected none of this but upon seeing their company i was much gratified the vizier on this occasion occupied the station of the emperor defraying every expense and distributing victuals to the poor and others and giving money to the readers according to the order which he had received from the emperor after this the emperor's mother sent for the mother of the child and gave her dresses and ornaments exceeding one thousand dinars in value she also gave her a thousand dinars in money and dismissed her on the second day during the absence of the emperor the vizier showed me the greatest kindness on the part of himself as well as on that of his master soon after the news of the emperor's approach was received stating that he was within seven miles of delhi and ordering the vizier to come and meet him he went out accordingly accompanied by those who had arrived for the purpose of being presented each taking his present with him in this manner we proceeded till we arrived at the gate of the palace in which he then was at this place the secretaries took account of the several presents and also brought them before the emperor the presents were then taken away and the travellers were presented each according to the order in which he had been arranged when my turn came i went in and presented my service in the usual manner and was very graciously received the emperor taking my hand and promising me every kindness to each of the travellers he gave a dress of honour embroidered with gold which had been worn by himself and one of these he also gave to me after this we met without the palace and viands were handed about for some time on this occasion the travellers ate the vizier with the great emirs standing over them as servants we then retired after this the emperor sent to each of us one of the horses of his own stud adorned and comparisoned with a saddle of silver he then placed us in his front with the vizier and rode on till he arrived at his palace in delhi on the third day after our arrival each of the travellers presented himself at the gate of the palace when the emperor sent to inquire whether there were any among us who wished to take office either as a writer a judge or a magistrate saying that he would give such appointments each of us of course gave an answer suitable to his wishes for my own part i answered i have no desire either for rule or writership but the office both of judge and of magistrate myself and my fathers have filled these replies were carried to the emperor who commanded each person to be brought before him and he then gave him such appointment as would suit him bestowing on him at the same time a dress of honour and a horse furnished with an ornamented saddle he also gave him money appointing likewise the amount of his salary which was to be drawn from the treasury he also appointed a portion of the produce of the villages which each was to receive annually according to his rank when i was called i went in and did homage the vizier said the lord of the world appoints you to the office of judge in delhi he also gives you a dress of honour with a saddled horse as also twelve thousand dinars for your present support he has moreover appointed you a yearly salary of twelve thousand dinars and a portion of lands in the villages which will produce annually an equal sum i then did homage according to their custom and withdrew we shall now proceed to give some account of the emperor mohammed son of giath odan toglik then of our entering and leaving hindustan this emperor was one of the most bountiful and splendidly munificent men where he took but in other cases one of the most impetuous and inexorable and very seldom indeed did it happen that pardon followed his anger on one occasion he took offence at the inhabitants of delhi on account of the numbers of its inhabitants who had revolted and the liberal support which these had received from the rest and to such a pitch did the quarrel rise that the inhabitants wrote a letter consisting of several pages in which they very much abused him 
they then sealed it up and directed it to the real head and lord of the world adding let no other person read it they then threw it over the gate of the palace those who saw it could do no other than send it to him and he read it accordingly the consequence was he ordered all the inhabitants to quit the place and upon some delay being evinced he made a proclamation stating that what person soever being an inhabitant of that city should be found in any of its houses or streets should receive condign punishment upon this they all went out but his servants finding a blind man in one of the houses and a bedridden one in another the emperor commanded the bedridden man to be projected from a ballista and the blind one to be dragged by his feet to delotabad which is at the distance of ten days and he was so dragged but his limbs dropping off by the way only one of his legs was brought to the place intended and was then thrown into it for the order had been that they should go to this place when i entered delhi it was almost a desert its buildings were very few in other respects it was quite empty its houses having been forsaken by its inhabitants the king however had given orders that any one who wished to leave his own city may come and reside there the consequence was the greatest city in the world had the fewest inhabitants upon a certain occasion too the principal of the preachers who was then keeper of the jewellery happened to be outwitted by some of the infidel hindus who came by night and stole some jewels for this he beat the man to death with his own hand upon another occasion one of the emirs of fargana came to pay him a temporary visit the emperor received him very kindly and bestowed on him some rich presents after this the emir had a wish to return but was afraid the emperor would not allow him to do so he began therefore to think of flight upon this a whisperer gave intimation of his design and the emir was put to death the whole of his wealth was then given to the informers for this is their custom that when any one gives private intimation of the designs of another and his information turns out to be true the person so informed of is put to death and his property is given to the informer there was at that time in the city of kambaya on the shores of india a sheikh of considerable power and note named the sheikh ali hadari to whom the merchants and seafaring men made many votive offerings this sheikh was in the habit of making many predictions for them but when the kezai jalal odan afghani rebelled against the emperor it was told him that the sheikh hadari had sent for this kezai jalal odan and given him the cap off his own head upon this the emperor set out for the purpose of making war upon the kezai jalal odan whom he put to flight he then returned to his palace leaving behind him and emir who should make inquiry respecting others who had joined the kezai the inquiry accordingly went on and those who had done so were put to death the sheikh was then brought forward and when it was proved that he had given his cap to the kezai he was also slain the sheikh had son of the sheikh baha odan zachariah was also put to death on account of some spite which he would rake upon him this was one of the greatest sheikhs his crime was that his uncle's son had rebelled against the emperor when he was acting as governor in one of the provinces of india so war was made upon him and being overcome his flesh was roasted with some rice and thrown to the elephants to be devoured but they refused to touch it upon a certain day when i myself was present some men were brought out who had been accused of having attempted the life of the vizier they were ordered accordingly to be thrown to the elephants which had been taught to cut their victims to pieces their hooves were cased with sharp iron instruments and the extremities of these were like knives on such occasions the elephant driver rode upon them and when a man was thrown to them they would wrap the trunk about him and toss him up then take him with the teeth and throw him between their forefeet upon the breast and do just as the driver should bid them and according to the orders of the emperor 
if the order was to cut him to pieces the elephant would do so with his irons and then throw the pieces among the assembled multitude but if the order was to leave him he would be left lying before the emperor until the skin should be taken off and stuffed with hay and the flesh given to the dogs on one occasion one of the emirs viz the ain el mulk who had the charge of the elephants and beasts of burden revolted and took away the greater part of these beasts and went over the ganges at the time the emperor was on his march towards the mabar districts against the emir jalal odan upon this occasion the people of the country proclaimed the runaway emperor but an insurrection arising the matter soon came to an end another of his emirs namely halajun also revolted and sallied out of delhi with a large army the viceroy in the district of telangana also rebelled and made an effort to obtain the kingdom and very nearly succeeded on account of the great number who were then in rebellion and the weakness of the army of the emperor for a pestilence had carried off the greater part from his extreme good fortune however he got the victory collected his scattered troops and subdued the rebellious emirs killing some torturing others and pardoning the rest he then returned to his residence repaired his affairs strengthened his empire and took vengeance on his enemies but let me now return to the account of my own affairs with him when he had appointed me to the office of judge of delhi had made the necessary arrangements and given me the presents already mentioned the horses prepared for me and for the other emirs who were about his person were sent to each of us who severally kissed the hoof of the horse of him who brought them and then led our own to the gate of the palace we then entered and each put on a dress of honour after which we came out mounted and returned to our houses the emperor said to me on this occasion do not suppose that our office of judge of delhi will cost you little trouble on the contrary it will require the greatest attention i understood what he said but did not return him a good answer he understood the arabic and was not pleased with my reply i am said i of the sect of ibn malik but the people of delhi follow hanafi besides i am ignorant of their language he replied i have appointed two learned men your deputies who will advise with you it will be your business to sign the legal instruments he then added if what i have appointed prove not an income sufficient to meet your numerous expenses i have likewise given you a cell the bequests appropriated to which you may expend taking this in addition to what is already appointed i thanked him for this and returned to my house a few days after this he made me a present of twelve thousand dinars in a short time however i found myself involved in great debts amounting to about fifty five thousand dinars according to the computation of india which with them amounts to five thousand five hundred tankas but which according to the computation of the west will amount to thirteen thousand dinars the reason of this debt was the great expenses incurred in waiting on the emperor during his journeys to repress the revolt of the ain el mulk about this time i composed a panegyric in praise of the emperor which i wrote in arabic and read to him he translated it for himself and was wonderfully pleased with it for the indians are fond of arabic poetry and are very desirous of it being memorialized in it i then informed him of the debt i had incurred which he ordered to be discharged from his own treasury and said take care in future not to exceed the extent of your income may god reward him some time after the emperor's return from the mebar districts and his ordering my residence in delhi his mind happened to change respecting a sheikh in whom he had placed great confidence and even visited and who then resided in a cave without the city he took him accordingly and imprisoned him and then interrogated his children as to who had resorted to him they named the persons who had done so and myself among the rest for it happened that i had visited him in the cave 
i was consequently ordered to attend at the gate of the palace and a council to sit within i attended in this way for four days and few were those who did so who escaped death i betook myself however to continued fasting and tasted nothing but water on the first day i repeated the sentence god is our support and the most excellent patron three and thirty thousand times and after the fourth day by god's goodness was i delivered but the sheikh and all those who had visited him except myself were put to death upon this i gave up the office of judge and bidding farewell to the world attached myself to the holy and pious sheikh the saint and phoenix of his age kamal odan abdul ula el gezai who had wrought many open miracles all i had i gave to the fakirs and putting on the tunic of one of them i attached myself to this sheikh for five months until i had kept a fast of five continued days i then breakfasted on a little rice chapter seventeen sent on an embassy to china embassy from china to the emperor gold mines on the mountain of Kora, sets out on the embassy arrives at biana cool war with the hindus taken prisoner brought back to delhi returns to yuhbura merwa gwalior baroon account of the jogis which burnt juggling of the jogis arrives at kajmara chanderi description of gwalior daulatabad nazarabad mahratas segar Kambaya, Goa, Beiram, Kuka, Dankul, Sindabur, Hinar, King of Hinar, not subject to the Emperor of Delhi, Malabar customs, Kings of Malabar, Law of Succession, account of the growth of pepper. After this, the Emperor sending for me, I went to him in my tunic, and he received me more graciously than ever. He said, It is my wish to send you as ambassador to the Emperor of China, for I know you love traveling in various countries. I consented, and he sent dresses of honor, horses, money, etc., with everything necessary for the journey. The Emperor of China had, at this time, sent presents to the Sultan, consisting of a hundred Mamluks, fifty slave girls, five hundred dresses of El Kamanja, five hundred mounds of musk, five dresses wrought with jewels, five quivers wrought with gold, and five swords set with jewels. His request with the emperor was that he should be permitted to rebuild an idol temple in the country about the mountain of Kora, on which infidel Hindus resided on the top of which and on the heights was a plain of three months journey and to which there was no approach here too resided many infidel hindu kings the extremities of these parts extend to the confines of tibet where the musk gazelles are found there are also mines of gold on these mountains and poisonous grass growing such that when the rains fall upon it and run in torrents to the neighboring rivers no one dares in consequence drink of the water during the time of their rising and should any one do so he dies immediately this idol temple they usually called the burkana it stood at the foot of the mountain and was destroyed by the mussulmans when they became masters of these parts nor were the inhabitants of the mountain in a condition to fight the mohammedans upon the plain but the plain was necessary to them for the purposes of agriculture they had therefore requested the emperor of china to send presents to the king of india and to ask this favor for them besides to this temple the people of china also made pilgrimages it was situated in a place called samhal the reply of the emperor was that this could not be permitted among a people who were mohammedans nor could there exist any church whatsoever in countries subject to them except only where tribute was paid but if they chose to do this their request would be complied with for the place in which this idol temple was situated had been conquered and had in consequence become a district of the mohammedans 
the emperor also sent presents much more valuable than those he had received which were these following namely one hundred horses of the best breed saddled and bridled one hundred mamluks one hundred hindu singing slave girls one hundred bairami dresses the value of each of which was a hundred dinars one hundred silken dresses five hundred saffron colored dresses one hundred pieces of the best cotton cloth one thousand dresses of the various clothing of india with numerous instruments of gold and silver swords and quivers set with jewels and ten robes of honor wrought with gold one of the sultan's own dresses with various other articles the emperor appointed the emir zahir odan el zanjani one of the ulema with el fati kafur with whom the present was entrusted to accompany me these were favorite officers with the emperor he also sent with us a thousand cavalry who were to conduct us to the place at which we were to take shipping the servants of the emperor of china who amounted to about one hundred and with whom there was a great emir also returned with us so we left the presence of the emperor on the seventeenth day of the month Sephar, in the year seven hundred and forty three a d thirteen forty two and after a few days arrived at the city of biana which is large we next arrived at Kul, which is a beautiful city, the greatest part of the trees of which are vines. When we had arrived here, we were informed that the infidel Hindus had besieged the city El Jalali, which is seven days from Kul. The intention of these infidels was to destroy the inhabitants, and this they nearly effected. We made such a vigorous attack upon them, however, that not one of them was left alive but many of our companions suffered martyrdom in the onset and among them was el fati kafur the person to whom the presents had been confided we immediately transmitted an account of this affair to the emperor and waited for his answer during this interval whenever any of the infidel hindus made an attack on the places in the neighborhood of el jalali either all or a part of us gave assistance to the moslems upon a certain day however i turned into a garden just without the city of kul when the heat of the sun was excessive and while we were in the garden some one cried out that the hindus were making an attack upon one of the villages i accordingly rode off with some of my companions to their assistance when the infidels saw this they fled but the moslems were so scattered in pursuing them that myself and only five others were left some of their people saw this and the consequence was a considerable number of cavalry made an attack upon us when we perceived their strength we retreated while they pursued us and in this we persevered i observed three of them coming after me when i was left quite alone it happened at the same time that the forefeet of my horse had stuck fast between two stones so that i was obliged to dismount and set him at liberty i was now in a way that led into a valley between two hills and here i lost sight of the infidels i was so circumstanced however that i knew neither the country nor the roads i then set my horse at liberty to go where he would while i was in a valley closely interwoven with trees behold a party of cavalry about forty in number rushed upon me and took me prisoner before i was well aware of their being there I was much afraid they would shoot me with their arrows. I alighted from my horse, therefore, and gave myself up as their prisoner. They then stripped me of all I had, bound me, and took me with them for two days, intending to kill me. Of their language I was quite ignorant, but God delivered me from them, for they left me, and I took my course I knew not whither. I was much afraid they would take it into their heads to kill me. I therefore hid myself in a forest, thickly interwoven with trees and thorns, so much so that a person wishing to hide himself could not be discovered. Whenever I ventured upon the roads I found they always led, either to one of the villages of the infidels, or to some ruined village. I was always, therefore, under the necessity of returning, and thus I passed seven whole days, during which I experienced the greatest horrors. My food was the fruit and leaves of the mountain trees. 
at the end of the seventh day however i got sight of a black man who had with him a walking staff shod with iron and a small water vessel he saluted me and i returned the salute he then said what is your name i answered mohammed i then asked him his name he replied el kalb el kari i e the wounded heart he then gave me some pulse which he had with him and some water to drink he asked me whether i would accompany him i did so but i soon found myself unable to move and i sunk on the earth he then carried me on his shoulders and as he walked on with me i fell asleep i awoke however about the time of dawn and found myself at the emperor's palace gate a courier had already brought the news of what had happened and of my loss to the emperor who now asked me of all the particulars and these i told him he then gave me ten thousand dinars and furnished me for my return he also appointed one of his emirs el malik sambul to present the gift so we returned to the city of kul from this we proceeded to the city of yobura and then descended to the shores of a lake called the water of life after this we proceeded to kinoj which is but a small town here i met the aged sheikh sali of fargana he was at this time sick he told me that he was then one hundred and fifty years old i was informed that he would constantly fast and that for many successive days we next arrived at the city of merwa which is a large place inhabited for the most part by infidels who pay tribute to the emperor we next arrived at the city of kaliur which is large and which has a fortress on the top of a high mountain in this the emperor imprisons those of whom he entertains any fear we next arrived at the city of barun which is small and inhabited by moslems it is situated in the midst of the infidel districts in these parts are many wild beasts which enter the town and tear the inhabitants i was told however that such as enter the streets of the town are not wild beasts really but only some of the magicians called jogis who can assume the shape of wild beasts and appear as such to the mind these are a people who can work miracles of which one is that any one of them can keep an entire fast for several months many of them will dig houses for themselves underground over which any one may build leaving them only a place for the air to pass through in this the jogi will reside for months without eating or drinking anything i heard that one of them remained thus for a whole year i saw too in the city of janjarur one of the moslems who had been taught by them and who had set up for himself a lofty cell like an obelisk upon the top of this he stood for five and twenty days during which time he neither ate nor drank in this situation i left him nor do i know how long he continued there after i had left the place people say that they mix certain seeds one of which is destined for a certain number of days or months and that they stand in need of no other support during all this time they also foretell events the emperor of hindustan very much respects them and occasionally sits in their company some of them will eat nothing but herbs and it is clear from their circumstances that they accustom themselves to abstinence and feel no desire either for the world or its show some of them will kill a man with a look but this is most frequently done by the women the woman who can do so is termed a goftar it happened when i was judge of delhi and the emperor was upon one of his journeys that a famine took place on this occasion the emperor ordered that the poor should be divided among the nobles for support until the famine should cease my portion as affixed by the vizier amounted to five hundred these i sustained in a house which i built for the purpose on a certain day during this time a number of them came to me bringing a woman with them who as they said was a goftar and had killed a child which happened to be near her i sent her however to the vizier who ordered four large water vessels to be filled with water and tied to her she was then thrown into the great river the jumna 
She did not sink in the water, but remained unhurt, so that they knew that she was a goftar. The vizier then ordered her to be burnt, which was done, and the people distributed her ashes among themselves, believing that if any one would fumigate himself with them, he would be secure from the fascinations of a goftar for that year. But if she had sunk, they would have taken her out of the water, for then they would have known that she was not a goftar. I was once in the presence of the emperor of Hindustan, when two of these jogis, wrapped up in cloaks, with their heads covered, for they take out all their hairs, both of their heads and armpits, with powder, came in. The emperor caressed them, and said, pointing to me, This is a stranger. Show him what he has never yet seen. They said we will. One of them then assumed the form of a cube and arose from the earth, and in this cubic shape he occupied a place in the air over our heads. I was so much astonished and terrified at this that I fainted and fell to the earth. The emperor then ordered me some medicine which he had with him, and upon taking this I recovered and sat up, this cubic figure still remaining in the air just as it had been. His companion then took a sandal belonging to one of those who had come out with him, and struck it upon the ground as if he had been angry. The sandal then ascended until it became opposite in situation with the cube. It then, it then struck it upon the neck, and the cube descended gradually to the earth, and at last rested in the place which it had left. The emperor then told me that the man who took the form of a cube was a disciple to the owner of the sandal, and, continued he, had I not entertained fears for the safety of thy intellect, I should have ordered them to show thee greater things than these. From this, however, I took a palpitation at the heart, until the emperor ordered me a medicine which restored me. We then proceeded from the city of Barun to the stage of Kajwara, at which there is a lake about a mile in length, and round this are temples in which there are idols. At this place resides a tribe of jogis, with long and clotted hair. Their color inclines to yellow, which arises from their fasting. Many of the Muslims of these parts attend on them, and learn magic from them. We next came to the city of Jenderi, which is large after this to that of tahar between which and delhi is a distance of twenty-four days and from which leaves of the betel nut are carried to delhi from this place we went to the city of ajbal then to dolatabad which is a place of great splendor and not inferior to delhi the lieutenancy of dolatabad extends through a distance of three months its citadel is called el dawagir it is one of the greatest and strongest forts in India. It is situated on the top of a rock which stands in the plain. The extremities are depressed so that a rock appears elevated like a milestone, and upon this the fort is built. In it is a ladder made of hides, and this is taken up by night and let down by day. In this fortress the emperor imprisons such persons as have been guilty of serious crimes. The emir of Daulatabad had been tutor to the emperor. He is the great emir Katlukan. In this city are vines and pomegranates which bear fruit twice in the year. It is, moreover, one of the greatest districts as to revenue. Its yearly taxes and fines amount to seventeen karors. A karor is one hundred lakh, and a lakh one hundred thousand Indian dinars. This was collected by a man appointed to do so before the government of Katlukan, but as he had been killed on account of the treasure which was with him, and this taken out of his effects after his death, the government fell to Katlukan. The most beautiful marketplace here is called the Tarab Abad, in the shops of which sit the singing women ready dressed out, with their slave girls in attendance. Over these is an emir, whose particular business it is to regulate their income. We next came to the city of Nazar Abad. It is small and inhabited by the Mahratas, a people well skilled in the arts, medicine, and astrology. Their nobles are Brahmins. The food of the Mahratas consists of rice, green vegetables, and oil of sesame. 
They do not allow either the punishing or sacrificing of animals. They carefully wash all their food, just as one washes after other impurities, and never intermarry with their relations, unless separated by the intervals of seven generations at least. They also abstain from the use of urine. Our next place of arrival was the city of Sagar, which is large, and is situated on a river of the same name. Near it are mills which are worked for their orchards, i.e. to supply water. The inhabitants of this place are religious and peaceable. We next arrived at the city of Cambea, which is situated at a mouth of the sea which resembles a valley, and into which the ships ride. Here also the flux and reflux of the tide is felt. The greatest part of its inhabitants are foreign merchants. We next came to Goa, which is subject to the infidel king Jalansi, king of Kandahar, who is also subject to the emperor of Hindustan, and to whom he sends an annual present. We next came to a large city situated at a mouth of the sea, and from this we took shipping and came to the island of Bayram, which is without inhabitants. We next arrived at the city of Kuka, the king of which is an infidel named Dankul, and subject to the emperor of Hindustan. After some days we came to the island of Sindabur, in the interior of which are six and thirty villages. By this we passed, however, and dropped anchor at a small island near it, in which is a temple and a tank of water. On this island we landed, and here I saw a jogi leaning against the wall of the temple, and placed between two idols. He had some marks about him of a religious warfare. I addressed him, but he gave me no answer. We looked to, but could see no food near him. When we looked at him, he gave a loud shout, and a coconut fell upon him from a tree that was there. This nut he threw to us. To me he threw ten dinars, after I had offered him a few, of which he would not accept. I supposed him to be a Muslim, for when I addressed him he looked towards heaven, and then towards the temple at Mecca, intimating that he acknowledged God, and believed in Mohammed as his prophet. We next came to the city of Hinar, which is situated at an estuary of the sea, and which receives large vessels. The inhabitants of this place are Muslims of the sect of Shafia, a peaceable and religious people. They carry on, however, a warfare for the faith by sea, and for this they are noted. The women of this city, and indeed of all the Indian districts situated on the seashores, never dress in clothes that have been stitched, but the contrary. One of them, for example, will tie one part of a piece of cloth round her waist, while the remaining part will be placed upon her head and breast. They are chaste and handsome. The greater part of the inhabitants, both male and females, have committed the Koran to memory. The inhabitants of Malabar generally pay tribute to the king of Hinaur, fearing as they do his bravery by sea. His army, too, consists of about six thousand men. They are nevertheless a brave and warlike race. The present king is Jamal Odan Muhammad ibn Hassan. He is one of the best of princes, but is himself subject to an infidel king whose name is Horeb. We next came into the country of Malabar, which is the country of black pepper. Its length is a journey of two months along the shore from Sindabur to Kaulam. The whole of the way by land lies under the shade of trees, and at the distance of every half mile there is a house made of wood in which there are chambers fitted up for the reception of comers and goers, whether they be Muslims or infidels. To each of these there is a well, out of which they drink, and over each is an infidel appointed to give drink. To the infidels he supplies this in vessels, to the Muslims he pours it in their hands. They do not allow the Muslims to touch their vessels or to enter into their apartments, but if any one should happen to eat out of one of their vessels they break it to pieces. But in most of their districts the Muslim merchants have houses and are greatly respected, so that Muslims who are strangers, whether they are merchants or poor, may lodge among them. 
but at any town in which no muslim resides upon any one's arriving they cook and pour out drink for him upon the leaf of the banana and whatever he happens to give is given to the dogs and in all this space of two months journey there is not a span free from cultivation for everybody has here a garden and his house is placed in the middle of it and round the whole of this there is a fence of wood up to which the ground of each inhabitant comes no one travels in these parts upon beasts of burden nor is there any horse found except with the king who is therefore the only person who rides when, however, any merchant has to sell or buy goods, they are carried upon the backs of men, who are always ready to do so for hire. Every one of these men has a long staff, which is shod with iron at its extremity, and at the top has a hook. When, therefore, he is tired with his burden, he sets up his staff in the earth like a pillar, and places the burden upon it and when he has rested he again takes up his burden without the assistance of another with one merchant you will see one or two hundred of these carriers the merchant himself walking but when the nobles pass from place to place they ride in a dula made of wood something like a box and which is carried upon the shoulders of slaves and hirelings they put a thief to death for stealing a single nut or even a grain of seed of any fruit hence thieves are unknown among them and should anything fall from a tree none except its proper owner would attempt to touch it in the country of malabar are twelve kings the greatest of whom has fifty thousand troops at his command the least five thousand or thereabouts that which separates the district of one king from that of another is a wooden gate upon which is written the gate of safety of such an one for when any criminal escapes from the district of one king and gets safely into that of another he is quite safe so that no one has the least desire to take him so long as he remains there each of their kings succeeds to rule as being sister's son not the son to the last their country is that from which black pepper is brought and this is the far greater of their produce and culture the pepper tree resembles that of the dark grape they plant it near that of the coconut and make framework for it just as they do for the grape tree it has however no tendrils and the tree itself resembles a bunch of grapes the leaves are like the ears of a horse but some of them resemble the leaves of a bramble when the autumn arrives it is ripe they then cut it and spread it just as they do grapes and thus it is dried by the sun as to what some have said that they boil it in order to dry it it is without foundation i also saw in their country and on the seashores aloes like the seed aloe sold by measure just as meal and millet is chapter eighteen arrival at abisardar kakanwar manjarun mohammedan merchants here hili Jerkanan, Dadkanan, Miraculous Tree, Fatan, Fandarena, Calicut, Chinese Junks, Embassy goes on board and is wrecked, proceeds to Kaulam after his property, arrives at Kanjarkara, returns to Calicut, joins an expedition against Sindabur, the place carried by assault, arrives at Hinaur, Fakanaur, Manjarur, Hili, Jarafatan, Badafatan, Fandarena, Shaliat, returns to Sindabur, and sets out for the Maldive Islands. The first town we entered in the country of Malabar was that of Abisardar, which is small, and is situated on a large estuary of the sea. We next came to the city of Kakanwar, which is large, and also upon an estuary of the sea. It abounds in the sugar cane. The sultan is an infidel. He sent his son as a pledge to our vessel, and we landed accordingly and were honorably received. He also sent presents to the ship as marks of respect to the emperor of India. 
It is a custom with them that every vessel which passes by one of their ports shall enter it, and give a present to its sultan. In this case they let it pass, but otherwise they make war upon it with their vessels. They then board it out of contempt, and impose a double fine upon the cargo, just in proportion to the advantage they usually gain from merchants entering their country. We next arrived at the city of Majaroon, which is situated upon a large estuary of the sea called the Estuary of the Wolf, and which is the greatest estuary in the country of Malabar. In this place are some of the greatest merchants of Persia and Yemen. Ginger and black pepper are here in great abundance. The king of this place is the greatest of the kings of Malabar, and in it are about four thousand Mohammedan merchants. The king made us land and sent us a present. We next came to the town of Hili, which is large and situated upon an estuary of the sea. As far as this place come the ships of China, but they do not go beyond it, nor do they enter any harbor except that of this place, of Calicut and of Kaolam. The city of Hili is much revered both by the Mohammedans and infidels, on account of a mosque, the source of light and of blessings which is found in it. To this seafaring persons make and pray their vows, whence its treasury is derived, which is placed under the control of the principal Moslem. The mosque maintains a preacher, and has within it several students, as well as readers of the Koran and persons who teach writing. We next arrived at the city of Jerkanan, the king of which is one of the greatest on these coasts. We next came to Dadkanan, which is a large city abounding with gardens and situated upon a mouth of the sea. In this are found the betel leaf and nut, the coconut and colocasia. Without the city is a large pond for retaining water, about which are gardens. The king is an infidel. His grandfather, who had become Mohammedan, built its mosque and made the pond. The cause of the grandfather's receiving Islamism was a tree, over which he had built the mosque. This tree is a very great wonder. Its leaves are green and like those of the fig, except only that they are soft. The tree is called Darakt Shahadet, the tree of testimony, Darakt meaning tree. I was told in these parts that this tree does not generally drop its leaves, but at the season of autumn in every year, one of them changes its color, first to yellow, then to red, and that upon this is written with the pen of power, There is no God but God, Mohammed is the prophet of God, and that this leaf alone falls. Very many Mohammedans who were worthy of belief told me this, and said that they had witnessed its fall, and had read the writing, and further that every year at the time of the fall credible persons among the Mohammedans, as well as others of the infidels, sat beneath the tree waiting for the fall of the leaf, and when this took place, that the one half was taken by the Mohammedans as a blessing, and for the purpose of curing their diseases, and the other by the king of the infidel city, and laid up in his treasury as a blessing, and that this is constantly received among them. Now the grandfather of the present king could read the Arabic. He witnessed, therefore, the fall of the leaf, read the inscription, and, understanding its import, became a Mohammedan accordingly. At the time of his death he appointed his son, who was a violent infidel, to succeed him. This man adhered to his own religion, cut down the tree, tore up its roots, and effaced every vestige of it. After two years the tree grew, and regained its original state, and in this it now is. This king died suddenly, and none of his infidel descendants since his time has done anything to the tree. We next came to the city of Fatan, Patan, the greater part of the inhabitants of which are Brahmins, who are held in great estimation among the Hindus. In this place there was not one Mohammedan, Without it was a mosque to which the Mohammedan strangers resort. It is said to have been built by certain merchants, and afterwards to have been destroyed by one of the Brahmins, who had removed the roof of it to his own house. 
On the following night, however, this house was entirely burnt, and in it the Brahmin, his followers, and all his children. They then restored the mosque, and in future abstained from injuring it, whence it became the resort of the Mohammedan strangers. After this we came to the city of Fandarena, a beautiful and large place, abounding with gardens and markets, in this the Mohammedans have three districts, each of which is a mosque, with a judge and preacher. We next came to Calicut, one of the great ports of the district of Malabar, and in which merchants from all parts are found. The king of this place is an infidel, who shaves his chin just as the Hedari Fakirs of Rum do. When we approached this place, the people came out to meet us, and with a large concourse brought us into the port. The greatest part of the Mohammedan merchants of this place are so wealthy that one of them can purchase the whole freightage of such vessels as put in here, and fit out others like them. Here we waited three months for the season to set sail for China, for there is only one season in the year in which the Sea of China is navigable nor then is the voyage undertaken except in vessels of the three descriptions following the greatest is called a junk the middling sized a zaw the least a kakam the sails of these vessels are made of cane reeds woven together like a mat which when they put into port they leave standing in the wind in some of these vessels there will be employed a thousand men, six hundred of these sailors, and four hundred soldiers. Each of the larger ships is followed by three others, a middle-sized, a third, and a fourth-sized. These vessels are nowhere made except in the city of El Zaitun in China, or in Sain Kailan, which is Sain El Sain. They row in these ships with large oars, which may be compared to great masts, over some of which five and twenty men will be stationed, who work standing. The commander of each vessel is a great emir. In the large ships, too, they sow garden herbs and ginger, which they cultivate in cisterns made for that purpose, and placed on the sides of them. In these also are houses constructed of wood, in which the higher officers reside with their wives, but these they do not hire out to the merchants. Every vessel, therefore, is like an independent city. Of such ships as these, Chinese individuals will sometimes have large numbers, and generally the Chinese are the richest people in the world. Now, when the season for setting out had arrived, the emperor of Hindustan appointed one of the junks, of the thirteen that were in the port for our voyage. El Malik Sambul, therefore, who had been commissioned to present the gift, and Zahir Odan went on board, and to the former was the present carried. I also sent my baggage, servants, and slave girls on board, but was told by one of them before I could leave the shore that the cabin which had been assigned to me was so small that it would not take the baggage and slave girls. I went therefore to the commander who said, There is no remedy for this. If you wish to have a larger, you had better get into one of the kekams, third-sized vessels. There you will find larger cabins and such as you want. I accordingly ordered my property to be put into the kekam. This was in the afternoon of Thursday, and I myself remained on shore for the purpose of attending divine service on the Friday. During the night, however, the sea arose, when some of the junks struck upon the shore, and the greatest part of those on board were drowned, and the rest were saved by swimming. Some of the junks, too, sailed off, and what became of them I know not. The vessel in which the present was stowed kept on the sea till morning, when it struck on the shore, and all on board perished, and the wealth was lost. I had indeed seen from the shore the emperor's servants, with El Malik Sambul and Zahir Odan, prostrating themselves almost distracted, for the terror of the sea was such as not to be got rid of. I myself had remained on shore, having with me my prostration carpet and ten dinars, which had been given me by some holy men. These I kept as a blessing, for the kakam had sailed off with my property and followers. 
the missionaries of the king of china were on board another junk which struck upon the shore also some of them were saved and brought to land and afterwards clothed by the chinese merchants i was told that the kakam in which my property was must have put into kaulam i proceeded therefore to that place by the river it is situated at the distance of ten days from calicut about five days i came to kanjakara which stands on the top of a hill is inhabited by jews and governed by an emir who pays tribute to the king of kaulam all the trees we saw upon the banks of this river as well as upon the seashores were those of the cinnamon and bakam which constitute the fuel of the inhabitants and with this we cooked our food upon the tenth day we arrived at kaulam which is the last city on the malabar coast in this place is a large number of mohammedan merchants but the king is an infidel in this place i remained a considerable time but heard nothing of the kakam and my property i was afraid to return to the emperor who would have said how came you to leave the present and stay upon the shore for i knew what sort of a man he was in cases of this kind i also advised with some of the mohammedans who dissuaded me from returning and said he will condemn you because you left the present you had better therefore return by the river to calicut i then betook myself to jamal odan king of hinaur by sea who when i came near met me and received me honourably and then appointed me a house with a suitable maintenance he was about to attend on divine service in the mosque and commanded me to accompany him i then became attached to the mosque and read daily a katma or two at this time the king was preparing an expedition against the island of sindabur for this purpose he had prepared two and fifty vessels which when ready he ordered me to attend with him for the expedition upon this occasion i opened the koran in search of an omen and in the first words of the first leaf which i laid my hand upon was frequent mention of the name of god and the promise that he would certainly assist those who assisted him i was greatly delighted with this and when the king came to the evening prayer i told him of it and requested to be allowed to accompany him he was much surprised at the omen and prepared to set out in person after this he went on board one of the vessels taking me with him and then we sailed when we got to the island of sindabur we found the people prepared to resist us and a hard battle was accordingly fought we carried the place however by divine permission by assault after this the king gave me a slave girl with clothing and other necessaries and i resided with him some months i then requested permission to make a journey to kaulam to inquire after the kakam with my goods he gave me permission after obtaining a promise that i would return to him i then left him for hinpar and then proceeded to fakanor and thence to manjarur thence to hili Jarafatan, Badafatan, Fandarena, and Calicut, mention of which has already been made. I next came to the city of Shaliat, where the Shaliats are made, and hence they derive their name. This is a fine city. I remained at it some time, and there heard that the Kekam had returned to China, and that my slave girl had died in it, and I was very much distressed on her account. The infidels, too, had seized upon my property, and my followers had been dispersed among the Chinese and others. I then returned to Sindabur to the king Jamal Odan, at the time when an infidel king was besieging the town with his troops. I left the place, therefore, and made for the Baldive Islands, at which, after ten days, I arrived. End of section 7《ビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャルビブリオフィシャル
Description of the Maldive Islands Natural Productions People Customs Trade Currency Origin of Mohammedanism here A queen governing the principal island They write generally on palm leaves with an iron style Power of the Judge, his revenue Isle of Kalnus Voyage to the principal isle Introduced to the husband and vizier of the queen Food of the islanders Takes the office of judge Marries three wives Suspected by the vizier Divorces his wives and visits the other islands Muluk Island Its fertility Distance from the coast of Coromandel These islands constitute one of the wonders of the world for their number is about 2,000, nearly a hundred of which are so close to each other as to form a sort of ring, each of which, nevertheless, is surrounded by the sea. When vessels approach any one of them, they are obliged to show who they have on board. If not, a passage is not permitted between them, for such is their proximity to each other, that the people of one are recognised by those of another. The greatest trees on the island are those of the coconut, the fruit of which they eat with fish. Of this sort of trees, the palm will produce fruit twelve times in the year, each month supplying a fresh crop, so that you will see upon the trees the fruit of some large, of others small, of others dry, and of others green. And this is the case always. From these they make palm wine and oil olive, and from their honey, sweetmeats, which they eat with the dried fruits. This is a strong incentive to venery. I had some slave girls and four wives during my residence here, the people are religious, chaste, and peaceable. They eat what is lawful, and their prayers are answered. Their bodies are weak. They make no war, and their weapons are prayers. They are by no means terrified at the robbers and thieves of India, nor do they punish them, from the experience that everyone who steals will be exposed to some sudden and grievous calamity. When any of the war vessels of the infidel Hindus pass by these islands, they take whatsoever they find without being resisted by anyone. But if one of these infidels should take for himself, surreptitiously, but a single lemon, his chief will not only severely punish him, but will impress most seriously upon his mind the fear of some horrible consequence to follow. Excepting this one case only, they are the most gentle people possible towards those who visit them. The reason probably is, the delicacy of their persons, and their ignorance of the art of war. In each of these islands are several mosques, which, with the rest of their buildings, are constructed of wood. They are a cleanly people, each individual washing himself twice daily, on account of the great heat of the sun. They very much use perfumes, such as the galia and scented oils. Every woman must, as soon as her husband has arisen and said his prayers, bring him the box of collyrium for his eyes, with the perfumes, and with these he anoints and perfumes himself. Both the rich and poor walk barefoot. The whole country is shaded with trees, so that a person walking along is just as if he were walking in a garden. The water of their wells is not more than two cubits from the surface of the earth. Whenever a traveller enters these islands, he may marry for a very small dowry one of the handsomest women for any specific period, upon this condition that he shall divorce her when he leaves the place, because the women never leave their respective districts. But if he does not wish to marry, the woman in whose house he lodges will cook for him, and otherwise attend on him, for a very small consideration. The greatest part of their trade consists in a sort of hemp, that is, thread made of the fibres of the coconut. It is made by macerating the nut in water, then by beating it with large mallets till it is quite soft. They then spin it out, and afterwards twist it into ropes. With this thread the ships of India and Yemen are sewn together, of which, when they happen to strike against a rock, the thread will yield a little, but will not soon break, contrary to what happens when put together with iron nails. This is the best sort of hemp. Each population catches the fish of its own island only, which they salt and send to India and China. The currency used instead of coin is the wada. This is sea shellfish, which they take upon the shore and then bury in the earth till the flesh is entirely wasted away, the hard part still remaining. This is the wada, which is so abundant in India. It is carried from these islands to the province of Bengal, and there also passes instead of coin. The women of the islands of India cover their faces, and also their bodies, from the navel downwards. 
This they all do, even to the wives of their kings. When I held the office of judge among them, I was quite unable to get them covered entirely. In these islands, the women never eat with the men, but in their own society only. I endeavoured, while I was judge, to get my wives to eat with me, but I could never prevail. Their conversation is very pleasing, and they themselves are exceedingly beautiful. The cause of these islands becoming Mohammedan was, as it is generally received among them, and as some learned and respectable persons among them informed me, as follows. When they were in a state of infidelity, there appeared to them every month a spectre from among the genie. This came from the sea. Its appearance was that of a ship filled with candles. When they saw him, it was their custom to take and dress up a young woman who was a virgin, and place her in the idol temple which stood on the seashore, and had windows looking towards him. Here they left her for the night. When they came in the morning, they found her vitiated and dead. This they continued doing month after month, casting lots among themselves, and each to whom the lot fell, giving up and dressing out his daughter for the spectre. After this, there came to them a western Arab named Abul Barakat the Berber. This was a holy man, and one who had committed the Quran to memory. He happened to lodge in the house of an old woman in the island of Maul. One day, when he entered the house, he saw her with a company of her female inmates weeping and lamenting, and asked them what was the matter. A person who acted as an interpreter between him and them said that the lot had fallen on this old woman, who was now adorning her daughter for the spectre. For this it was that she was crying, this too was her only child. The Mograbine, who was a beardless man, said to her, I will go to the spectre tonight instead of thy daughter. If he takes me, then I shall redeem her, but if I come off safe, then that will be to the praise of God. They carried him accordingly to the idol house that night, as if he had been the daughter of the old woman, the magistrate knowing nothing whatever of the matter. The Mograbin entered, and sitting down in the window, began to read the Quran. By and by the spectre came, with eyes flaming like fire, but when he got near enough to hear the Quran, he plunged into the sea. In this manner the Mograbin remained until morning, reading the Quran, when the old woman came with her household and the great personages of the district, in order to fetch out the young woman and burn her, as it was their custom. But when they saw the old man reading the Quran just as they had left him, they were greatly astonished. The old woman then told them what she had done, and why she had desired him to do this. They then carried the Mograbin to their king, whose name was Shan Wan, and told him the whole of the affair, and he was much astonished at the Arab. Upon this, the Mograbin presented the doctrine of Islamism to the king, and pressed him to receive it, who replied, Stay with us in another month, and then, if you will do as you now have done and escape from the spectre with safety, I will become a Mohammedan. So God opened the heart of the king for the reception of Islamism before the completion of the month, of himself, of his household, his children, and his nobles. When, however, the second month came, they went with the Mograbin to the idol house, according to the former custom, the king himself also being present. And when the following morning had arrived, they found the Mograbin sitting and reading his Quran, having had the same rincontre with the spectre that he had on the former occasion. They then broke the images, raised the idol house to the ground, and all became Mohammedans. The sect into which they entered was that of the Mograbin, namely that of Ibn Malik. Till this very day they make much of the Mograbins on account of this man. I was residing for some time in these islands without having any knowledge of this circumstance. Upon a certain night, however, when I saw them exulting and praising God as they were proceeding towards the sea, with Qurans on their heads, I asked them what they were about, when they told me of the spectre. They then said, Look towards the sea, and you will see him. I looked, and behold, he resembled a ship filled with candles and torches. This, said they, is the spectre, which, when we do as you have seen us doing, goes away and does us no injury. When I first came to the island of Mole, a woman was sovereign, because the king mentioned above had left no male issue. The inhabitants, therefore, gave to his eldest daughter, Khadijah, the supreme rule. Her husband, Jamal Odin, the preacher, then became her prime minister. It is a custom with them to write out copies of the Quran and other books on paper only. Letters, orders, and legal decisions they inscribe on palm leaves of the coconut tree, with a crooked, sharp-pointed instrument somewhat like a knife. 
The army of this princess consists of foreigners to the number of about 1,000 men. Their laws mostly originate with the judge, who, for the authority with which his orders are obeyed, is more like a king. He enjoys, by right of his office, the revenue of three islands, a custom which originated with their king Shanwaza, whose proper name was Ahmed, and this still remains in force. When I first arrived at these islands, the ship in which I was put into port in the island Kalnus, which is a beautiful place, containing several mosques. Upon this occasion, some of the learned and pious inhabitants took me to their houses, and entertained me with great hospitality. The commander of the ship in which I had been then went with me to the island in which the queen resided, and after which the other islands of these parts are named. I sailed with him in order to see her, and after passing by many of the islands, came to it. Our practice was to sail in a large boat during the morning. About the middle of the day we said our prayers, and then dined in the boat. And thus, after ten days, we came to the island Zabia el Mol, i.e. the Maldive island. In this I landed, and a report was made to the queen's vizier, Jamal Odin, who was also her husband. Upon this he sent for me. I went to him, and was very honourably received and entertained. He also appointed a house for my residence, sent me a present of victuals, fruits, clothing, and an alms gift of the wada, or shells, which are the currency of these parts, and used instead of coin. The food of the greater part of the inhabitants of these parts is rice, which they cook and lay up in saucers and small potted plates, with spiced flesh, fowl, and fish. Upon this, in order to assist digestion, they drink el kerbani, that is, the honey of the coconut made into spiced wine. This easily digests, excites the appetite, and communicates strength to the frame. After this, the vizier desired me to take the office of judge and to remain among them. He gave me a house and a large garden, in which were built many other houses. He also sent me a carpet, vessels, a dress of honour, and made me ride upon a horse, although it is custom with them that none except the vizier should thus ride. The rest of the nobles and others either ride in a palanquin, a machine formerly described, or walk on foot. He also sent female slaves for my service, and I married three wives. The vizier also frequently came himself and conferred his favours upon me, for which may God reward him. When, however, I had married my wives and my relations became, through them, numerous and powerful in the island, the vizier began to be afraid of me, lest I should get the upper hand of him, when no such thought had entered my mind. This resulted purely from their weakness, the fewness of their troops, and their inexperience in the art of war, as already noticed. He hated me mortally in his own mind, began to inquire into my affairs and to watch my proceedings. This was all known to me, and it became my intention to leave the place, but this was also a matter of dread with him, because I might then possibly bring an army upon him from the Maba districts of Hindustan. The king of those parts, Giath Odin, having married a sister to one of my wives when I resided in Delhi, and with whom I was on terms of friendship. I then divorced all my wives except one who had a young child, and I left that island for those which stretch out before it. These form numerous groups, each group containing many islands. In some of these I saw women who had only one breast, which much astonished me. Of these islands, one is named Muluk. In this, large ships destined for the districts of Maba are put into harbour. It is an island exceedingly rich in vegetation and soil, so that when you cut a branch from any of its trees and plant it either on the road or on a wall, it will grow, throw out leaves, and become a tree. In this island I saw a pomegranate tree, the fruit of which ceased not to shoot during the whole year. Between the Maldive Islands and the Maba districts there is a distance of three days with a moderate wind. End of section 8. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Section 9 of The Travels of Ibn Battuta, translated by Samuel Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 20 Arrival in Ceylon Visits the King at Batala Natural Productions Pearls Obtains permission to visit Adam's Peak Arrives at Manar Mandali Port of Salawat 
Kanha, the capital of Ceylon, described. Mosque of the Sheikh Othman. The Emperor Kinur, his white elephant. Large rubies found all over Ceylon. Description of the cave Easter Mahmud. Buzuta, monkeys. Estuary of reeds. Old woman's house. Cave of Baba Tahir. Of Sibak, the fierce leech. The seven caves. Ridge of Alexander. Description of Adam's Peak. Customs of pilgrims. Fish port. Village of Karkun. Of Dildinu. Of at Kalanja. City of Dino. Great idol temple with Brahmins, yogis, and daughters of the nobility. Kali. Kalumbu. Batala. When we sailed, however, the wind changed upon us, and we were near being lost, but arrived at last at the island of Ceylon, a place well known, and in which is situated the mountain of Serendib. This appeared to us like a pillar of smoke when we were at a distance of nine days from it. When we got near the land, we saw a harbour, into which we endeavoured to put, but were threatened by the Reyes, who was in a ship. The reason of this was, the harbour was in a district belonging to an infidel prince, who had no intercourse with the captains of Mohammedan vessels, as other infidel princes had. He was likewise a very stupid being. He had also ships with which he occasionally transported his troops against the Mohammedans. Beside all this, we were in danger of drowning, unless we could enter the port. I said to the Reyes, therefore, Allow me to come on shore, and I will ensure thy safety and that of those about thee with the king. To this he consented, and myself, with some of my followers only, were brought on shore. The infidels then came about us and said, What are you? I answered, I am a relation of the king of the Marbar districts, and am on a voyage to visit him. Whatever is in the ship is a present for the king of the Marbar. They then went to their king and told him this. He therefore sent for me, and I went to him. He is king of the city of Batala, which is small and surrounded by two wooden fences. The whole of its shore abounds with cinnamon wood, bakam, and the kalanji aloe, which, however, is not equal to the kamari or the kakuli in scent. The merchants of Malabar and the Marbar districts transport it without any other price than a few articles of clothing, which are given as presents to the king. This may be attributed to the circumstance that it is brought down by the mountain torrents, and left in great heaps upon the shore. Between this city and the Marbar districts there is a voyage of one day and night. The king of Ceylon, Ayari Shakarti by name, has considerable forces by sea. When I was first admitted to his presence, he rose and received me honourably, and said, You are to be my guest for three days. Security shall be forwarded to the people of the ship, because your relation, the king of the Marbar, is my friend. After thanking him, I remained with him and was treated with increasing respect. One day, when I was admitted to his presence, he had with him a great number of pearls, which had been brought from the pearl fishery, and these his companions were sorting. He asked me whether I had ever seen pearl diving in any country which I had visited. I said yes, I had, in the island of Finas. He said, do not be shy, Ask for what you wish. I answered, My only desire in coming to this island was to visit the blessed foot of our forefather Adam, whom these people call Baba, while they style Eve Mama. This, replied he, is easy enough. We will send someone with you who shall conduct you thither. The ship, said I, which brought me here, shall return to the Maba, and when I return, you shall send me there in one of your ships. He answered, It shall be so. When I told this to the commander of the ship, he refused to accede to it, and said, I will wait for you, should you be absent a whole year. This I told to the king, who said, He may stay at my charge until you return. He then gave me a palanquin, which his servants carried upon their shoulders. He also sent me four yogis, who were in the habit of visiting the footmark every year. With these went four brahmins and ten of the king's companions, with fifteen men carrying provisions. As to water, there is plenty of it to be found on the road. We then proceeded on our journey, and on the first day crossed a river in a boat made of reeds, and entered the city of Manar Mandali, 
which is handsome and situated at the extremity of the territory of the infidel king, who had entertained and sent us out. We then proceeded to the port of Salawat, which is a small town. The roads, however, over which we travelled, were rough and abounding with water. In these there were many elephants, but they never touched either pilgrims or strangers, in consequence of the blessing obtained by the sheikh Abu Abd Allah ibn Kafif, the first who opened this road of pilgrimage to the foot. The infidels would not formally allow the Mohammedans to make this pilgrimage, but injured them, nor would they either sell or give them anything to eat. But when it happened that the elephants killed all the companions of this sheikh, one of them sparing and carrying him on his back from among the mountains to an inhabited district, the infidels ever after thought highly of the Mohammedans, admitted them into their houses, and fed them. To this very day they still speak of the sheikh in the most extravagant terms of respect, and call him the greatest sheikh. After this we arrived at the city of Kankar, which is the seat of the emperor of Ceylon. It is built in a valley between two hills, upon an estuary called the Estuary of Rubies, and in which rubies are found. Without the city is the mosque of the Sheikh Othman of Shiraz, which both the emperor and the people of the city visit, and for which they have great respect. The emperor is an infidel, and is known by the name Kinar. He has a white elephant upon which he rides on feast days, having first placed on his head some very large rubies. This is the only white elephant I had ever seen. The ruby and carbuncle are found only in this country. These are not allowed to be exported on account of the great estimation in which they are held, nor are they elsewhere dug up, but the ruby is found all over Ceylon. It is considered as property and is sold by the inhabitants. When they dig for the ruby, they find a white stone abounding with fissures. Within this, the ruby is placed. They cut it out and give it to the polishers, who polish it until only the ruby is separated from the stone. Of this there is the red, the yellow, and the cerulean. They call it the manikam. It is a custom among them that every ruby amounting in value to six of the gold dinars current in those parts shall go to the emperor, who gives its value and takes it. What falls short of this goes to his attendants. All the women in the island of Ceylon have traces of coloured rubies, which they put upon their hands and legs as chains, in the place of bracelets and ankle rings. I once saw upon the head of the white elephant seven rubies, each of which was larger than a hen's egg. I also saw in the possession of the king Ayari Shakarti a saucer made of ruby as large as the palm of the hand, in which he kept oils of aloes. I was much surprised at it when the king said to me, We have them much larger than this. We then proceeded to Kankar, and came to a cave known by the name of Ista Mahmud, then to the estuary of Bazuta, which in their language signifies monkeys, animals which are in great numbers in the mountains of these parts. The monkeys are black and have long tails. The beard of the males is like that of a man. I was told by the Sheikh Othman and his son, two pious and credible persons, that the monkeys have a leader whom they follow as if he were their king. About his head is tied a turban composed of the leaves of trees, and he reclines upon a staff. At his right and left hand are four monkeys with rods in their hands, all of which stand at his head whenever the leading monkey sits. His wives and children are daily brought in on these occasions, who sit down before him. Then comes a number of monkeys which sit and form a sort of assembly about him. One of the four monkeys then addresses him, and they disperse. After this, each of them comes with a nut, a lemon, or some of the mountain fruit, which he throws down before the leader. He then eats, together with his wives, children, and the four principal monkeys. They then all disperse. One of the yogis also told me that he once saw the four monkeys standing in the presence of the leader and beating another monkey with rods. After this, they plucked off all his hair. I was also told by respectable persons that if one of these monkeys happens to attack and be too strong for a young woman, he will ravish her. We then proceeded to the estuary of reeds, where rubies are also found. The next place we arrived at is known by the House of the Old Woman, which is the farthest inhabited part of the island of Ceylon. Our next stage was the cave of Baba Tahir, who was one of the pious. The next, the cave of Sibak, an infidel king, who retired to this place for the purposes of devotion. Here we saw the fierce leech, which they call the Zalao. 
It remains in trees or in the grass near water. When anyone comes near to it, it springs upon him, and the part of the body attacked will bleed profusely. People generally provide themselves with a lemon for this occasion, which they squeeze over him, and then he drops off. The place upon which the leech has fastened they cut out with a wooden knife made for that purpose. It is told of a pilgrim who passed by this place, that a leech fastened upon him, so that the skin swelled, and as he did not squeeze the lemon on him, the blood flowed out and he died. We next came to a place called the Seven Caves, and after this to the ridge of Alexander, in which is a cave and a well of water. At this place is the entrance to the mountain. This mountain of Serendib is one of the highest in the world. We saw it from the sea at a distance of nine days. When we ascended it, we saw the clouds passing between us and its foot. On it is a great number of trees, the leaves of which never fall. There are also flowers of various colours, with the red rose about the size of the palm of the hand, upon the leaves of which they think they can read the name of God and of his prophet. There are two roads on the mountain leading to the foot of Adam. The one is known by the way of Baba, the other by the way of Mama, by which they mean Adam and Eve. The way called that of Mama is easy, to it the travellers come upon their first visiting the place. But everyone who has travelled only upon this is considered as if he had not made the pilgrimage at all. The way named Baba is rough and difficult of ascent. At the foot of the mountain where the entrance is, there is a minaret named after Alexander, and a fountain of water. The ancients have cut something like steps upon which one may ascend, and have fixed in iron pins to which chains are appended, and upon these those who ascend take hold. Of these chains there are ten in number, the last of which is termed the chain of witness, because when one has arrived at this and looks down, the frightful notion seizes him that he shall fall. After the tenth chain is the cave of Kizer, in which there is a large space, and at the entrance a well of water full of fish, which is also called after his name. Of those, however, no one takes any. Near this, and on each side of the path, is a cistern cut in the rock. In this cave of Kizer, the pilgrims leave their provisions and whatever else they have, and then ascend about two miles to the top of the mountain, to the place of Adam's foot. The holy footmark is in a stone, so that its place is depressed. The length of the impression is eleven spans. The Chinese came here at some former time, and cut out from this stone the place of the great toe, together with the stone about it, and placed it in a temple in the city of Zaitun, and pilgrimages are made to it from the most distant parts of China. In the rock, too, in which the impression of the foot is, there are nine excavations which have been cut out. Into these the infidel pilgrims put gold, rubies, and other jewels, and hence you will see the Fakirs, who have come as pilgrims to the well of Kiza, racing to get first to the excavations, in order to obtain what may be in them. We, however, found nothing but a little gold with some rubies, which we gave to our guide. It is customary for the pilgrims to remain in the cave of Kiza for three days, and during this time to visit the foot both morning and evening. This we did, and when the three days were expired, we returned by the path of Mama, and came down to the cave of Shisham, who is Sheth, the son of Adam. After this, we arrived at the fish port, and then at the village of Karkun, then at the village of Dildanu, then at the village of At Kalanja, where the tomb of Abu Abd Allah ibn Khafif is situated. All these villages and tilled lands are upon the mountain. At its foot and near the path is a cypress, which is large and never drops the leaf. But as to its leaves, there is no getting to them by any means, and these people's heads are turned with some strange and false notions respecting them. I saw a number of yogis about the tree, waiting for the falling of one, for they suppose that any person eating one of them will grow young again, however old he may be. Beneath this mountain is the great estuary at where the rubies are obtained. Its water appears wonderfully blue to the eye. From this place we proceeded, and in two days arrived at the city of Dinao, which is large and inhabited by merchants. In this is an idol, known by the same name, placed in a large temple, and in which there are about a thousand Brahmins and yogis, and five hundred young women, daughters of the nobility of India, who sing and dance all night before the image. The officers of the city revenue attend upon the image. The idol is of gold, and as large as a man. In the place of eyes it has two large rubies, 
which, as I was told, shine in the night time like two lighted candles. From this place we travelled to Kali, which is a large town, then to Kolambu, which is the finest and largest city in Serendib. After three days we arrived at the city of Batala, from which we had been sent by its king with his servants to visit Adam's foot. This we entered and were received honourably by the king, who furnished us with provisions. End of chapter 20 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Section 10 of the Travels of Ibn Battuta This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta Translated by Samuel Lee Chapter 21 Return to the Coast of Coral Mandel Arrival at the Palace of Giyath Adin Short Account of the Governors of Those Parts War with the Hindus The Hindu King Taken and Slain Fatan Different Animals Kept in the Same Cage Mata Ray Giyath Adin Dies, Succeeded by His Brother's Son, Nasir Adin Fatan Kalam Hinaur Taken Prisoner by the Hindus Calicut, Arrival at the Maldive Islands, Bengal, Sad Kewon, Mountains of Kumru, The Sheikh Tabrizi, Miracles Ascribed to Him, Jabnak, Blue River, Setkar Kewon, Baraknakur, Produce, Character of the People, Customs, after this we sailed with the vessel which had waited for us to the Ma'abur districts. But when we had made half the voyage the wind rose upon us and we were near drowning. We then cut down our mast and every moment expected death. Providence, however, was favorable to us, for there came boats from the infidel inhabitants of the Ma'abur, which brought us to land. I then told them that I was the messenger of their king, and that he was my relation upon which they landed us and treated us very honorably. They wrote to the king on this, as I also did, telling him what had happened. After three days came an emir from the sultan with a number of cavalry. For me they brought a palanquin, and ten horses to carry me. We then set out for the presence of the king, Giyath Adin el Damgani, who at this time enjoyed the supreme power in the Ma'abur districts. These parts formerly belonged to the Emperor of Hindustan, the Sultan Muhammad. They were then seized by the Sharif, Jalal Adin Hassan Shah, who held them for five years. After this he appointed Alay Adin, one of his emirs, as his successor. But he was killed in a warlike excursion by an accidental arrow. After this his brother's son, Khatbi Adin, came to the supreme rule but he was killed in consequence of his bad conduct. After this, one of the emirs of the Sharif, Jalal Adin, came into power. That is, this Giyath Adin, who married a daughter of Jalal Adin, the mother of which daughter was sister to my wife when I was judge in Delhi. When I had got near his house, he sent one of his chamberlains to meet me, and when I entered, he received me graciously and gave me a seat. He was at this time in his camp, so he erected three tents for me opposite those of his judge, Sadar al-Zaman. He also sent me a carpet, provisions, and presents. This was a very warlike prince, and as he happened to be in the neighborhood of an infidel whose army amounted to one hundred and twenty thousand men, an attempt was made to take these Ma'abur districts out of the hands of the Mohammedans. This infidel prince accordingly made an attack on the count of Kian, which belongs to the Ma'abur, and in which there were six thousand soldiers, put them to the rout and besieged it. This was reported to the Sultan, and that the town was nearly lost. He then marched out with his forces, which amounted to seven thousand, every man of whom took off his turban, and hung it upon the neck of his horse, which is in India an intimation that they are bent upon death. They then made a charge upon the infidel king while his men were taking their midday repose and besieging Kian, and put them to the rout. The greater part of them was killed. 
nor did one except the cavalry or those who concealed themselves in the woods escape. The sultan was taken prisoner, his wealth seized, himself afterwards killed, and I saw his body hanging against a wall in the town. I then left the king's station until he should return from his expedition and came to the city of Fatan, which is large and beautiful and situated upon the seashore. Its harbor is truly wonderful. In this city there are grapes and good pomegranates. I saw in this place the sheikh Sali Muhammad of Nisabur, one of the fanatical fakirs who suffer their hair to flow down loosely upon their shoulders. This man had seven foxes with him, all of which ate and sat with the fakirs. There were also with him thirty other fakirs, one of whom had a gazelle with a lion in the same place, which was unmolested by the lion. I then proceeded for the purpose of presenting myself to the sultan at the city of Mature, which is large and not unlike Delhi. In this I found a great mortality which had destroyed the greatest part of the inhabitants. The king, Giyath Adin, returned at this time to his palace sick, and soon after died. He appointed his brother's son, Nasir Adin, to be his successor. In this place, too, I caught a fever which nearly destroyed me. But as Providence restored me to health, I requested permission of the king, Nasir Adin, to proceed on my journey, which was granted. I then returned to the city of Fatan, Patan, and thence by sea to Kalam one of the cities of Malabar, where I remained three months on account of the sickness which had happened to me. From this place I set out to visit the Sultan Jamal Adin of Hinaur, who had received a promise from me to return. The infidel Hindus, however, came out against us in twelve war vessels between the last place mentioned and Fekanun, and giving us severe battle at length overcame us and took our ship. They then stripped us of all. From me they took all the jewels and rubies given me by the king of Batela, as well as the additional presence of the pious sheiks, leaving me only one pair of trousers, and thus were we landed nearly naked. I then returned to Calicut and entered one of the mosques. When some of the lawyers and merchants who had known me in Delhi heard of my situation, they clothed and received me honorably. I then thought of returning to the emperor of Hindustan, but I was afraid of his severity, and that he might ask me why I had separated from the present. I then went on board another ship, and this pleased me, and returned to the Maldive Islands on account of the little boy I had left there. When I had seen him, however, I left him in kindness to his mother. The vizier then furnished me with provisions, and I sailed for Bengal, which is an extensive and plentiful country. I never saw a country in which provisions were so cheap. I there saw one of the religious of the West, who told me that he had bought provisions for himself and his family for a whole year, with eight dirhams. The first town I entered here was Sidkewan, which is large and situated on the seashore. The king of Bengal at this time was Fakir Adin. He was an eminent man, kind to strangers and persons of the Sufi persuasion but I did not present myself to him, nor did I see him, because he was opposed to the emperor, and was then in open rebellion against him. From Sidkewan I travelled for the mountains of Kemru, which are at the distance of one month from this place. These are extensive mountains, and they join the mountains of Tibet, where there are musk gazelles. The inhabitants of these mountains are, like the Turks, famous for their attention to magic. My object in visiting these mountains was to meet one of the saints, namely the Sheikh Jalal Adin of Tabriz. This Sheikh was one of the greatest saints, and one of those singular individuals who had the power of working great and notable miracles. He had also lived to a remarkably great age. He told me that he had seen El Mosta Asim, the Caliph in Baghdad, and his companions told me afterwards that he died at the age of one hundred and fifty years that he fasted through a space of about forty years, never breaking his fast till he had fasted throughout ten successive days. He had a cow on the milk of which he usually breakfasted, and his practice was to sit up all night. It was by his means that the people of these mountains became Mohammedans, and on this account it was that he resided among them. One of his companions told me that on the day before his death he invited them all to come to him. He then said to them, Tomorrow I depart from you, Deo Valente, and my vice-regent with you is God, besides whom, there is, besides whom there is no other God. 
When the evening of the following day had arrived, and he had performed the last prostration of the evening prayer, he was taken by God. On the side of the cave in which he had resided was found a grave ready dug, and by it a winding sheet and burial spices. The people then washed and buried him in them, and said their prayers over him. When I was on my journey to see this sheik, four of his companions met me at the distance of two days, and told me that the sheik had said to the fakirs who were with them, A western religious traveller is coming to you. Go out and meet him. It was, said they, by the order of the sheik that we came to you, notwithstanding the fact that he had no knowledge whatever of my circumstances except what he had by divine revelation. I went with them accordingly to his cell without the cave, near which there was no building whatever. The people of this country are partly Mohammedans and partly infidels, both of whom visit the sheik and bring valuable presents. On these the fakirs and other persons who arrive here subsist. As for the sheik himself, he confines himself to the milk of his cow, as already mentioned. When I presented myself to him, he arose and embraced me. He then asked me of my country and travels of which I informed him. He then said to the fakirs, Treat him honorably. They accordingly carried me to the cell and kept me as their guest for three days. On the day I presented myself to the sheik, he had on a religious garment made of fine goat's hair. I was astonished at it and said to myself, I wish the sheik would give it to me. When I went in to bid him farewell, he arose and went to the side of the cave, took off the goat's hair garment as well as the fillet of his head and his sleeves, and put them on me. The fakirs then told me that it was not his practice to put on this garment, and that he had put it on only on the occasion of my coming, for he had said to them, this garment will be wished for by a Maghrabin, but an infidel king shall take it from him, and shall give it to our brother Boran Adin of Segirs, whose it is, and for whose use it has been made. When I was told this by the fakirs, I said, As I have a blessing from the sheik, and as he has clothed me with his own clothes, I will never enter with them into the presence of any king, either infidel or Moslem. After this I left the sheik. It happened, however, after a considerable time, that I entered the country of China, and went as far as the city of Kanze. Upon a certain occasion, when my companions had all left me on account of the press of the multitude, and I had this garment on, and was on the road, I met the vizier with a large body. He happened to cast his eyes upon me, and called me to him. He then took me by the hand, and asked me why I had come to this country, nor did he leave me until we came to the king's palace. I wished to go but he would not allow me to do so, but took me into the king who interrogated me about the Mohammedan sovereigns, to all which I gave answers. He then cast his eyes upon the garment and began to praise it, and said to the vizier, Take it off him. To this I could offer no resistance, so he took it, but ordered me ten dresses of honour, and a horse with its furniture, and money for my necessities. This changed my mind. I then called to mind the words of the sheik that an infidel king should take it, and my wonder was increased. After a year had elapsed, I entered the palace of the king of China at Kanbalik. My object was to visit the cell of the sheik Borhan Adin of Sagirj. I did so and found him reading, and the very goat's hair garment I have been mentioning was on him. I was surprised at this, and was turning the garment over in my hand when he said, Why do you turn the garment over? Do you know it? I said, I do. It is the garment which the king of Kanze took from me. He answered, This garment was made for me by my brother, Jalal ad for my own use, who also wrote to me to say that the garment would come to me by such a person. He then produced the letter which I read, and could not help wondering at the exactness of the sheik. I then told him of the origin of the story. He answered, My brother Jalal ad was superior to all this. He had a perfect control over human nature but now he has been taken to God's mercy. He then said, I have been told, that he performed the morning prayer every day in Mecca, that he went on the pilgrimage annually, because he was never to be seen on the two days of Arafat and the feast, no one knowing whither he had gone. When, however, I had bid farewell to the Sheikh Jalal ad I travelled to the city of Jabnak, which is very large and beautiful. It is divided by the river which descends from the mountains of Kamru, called the Blue River. By this one may travel to Bengal and the countries of Laknuti. Upon it are gardens, mills, and villages which it refreshes and gladdens like the Nile of Egypt. 
The inhabitants of these parts are infidels tributary to the Mohammedans. By this river I travelled for fifteen days, proceeding from road to road till I came to the city of Sutirkewan. Here I found a junk which was proceeding to Java, Sumatra, between which and this place there is a distance of forty days. I proceeded, therefore, and after a voyage of fifty days came to the countries of the Barak Nakar, a people who have mouths like those of dogs. This is a vile race. They have no religion, neither that of the Hindus nor any other. They live in houses made of reeds upon the seashore. Their trees are those of the banana, the falfel, and the beetle nut. Their men are of the same form with ourselves, except that their mouths are like those of dogs, but the women have mouths like other folks. The men go naked without the least covering whatever. Only one among them I saw who had put his virilia into a painted hollow reed which was hung to his belly. The women cover themselves with the leaves of trees. One who had had much intercourse with them told me that they copulate like beasts without the least concealment. The men will have thirty or more wives, but adultery is not committed. Should any one, however, be convicted of this crime, his punishment is to be hanged till he is dead, unless he brings either a friend or slave who is willing to be hanged for him. He may then go free. The sentence for the woman is that the king shall command all his servants to trample upon her one after another till she dies. She is then thrown into the sea. The women resist the men to a degree beyond their nature. But the men, from their baseness of character and fear about the women, will not allow any one of the merchants to proceed on the sea in front of their houses. They will merely consult and trade with them, carrying them fresh water on the backs of elephants. When we put into their ports, their king came to us riding upon an elephant, upon which there was something like a saddle-cloth made of skin. The king himself was dressed in goat-skin, the hairy part of which he had turned outwards. Upon his head was a turban of coloured silk, and in his hand a short silver spear. With him was a number of his relations riding upon elephants, and using a language which no one could understand, unless he had been some time among them. We sent him the usual present. For every ship putting into any port of India is expected to send a present to the magistrate of the place. Now these people buy and receive his presents, she-elephants, over which they put their saddle-cloths, but do not completely clothe them. But any ship not giving them their present, they will so work upon with their magic that the sea will rise upon it and it will perish, or they will return upon and injure it. End of section 10. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 11 of the Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta Translated by Samuel Lee Chapter 22 Arrival at Sumatra Fruits, Currency, City of Sumatra Introduction to the King Royal Bounty Religion Sufi Sect of Mohammedans Provisions for a Voyage to China Arrival at Java, Natural Productions, Camphor, Cloves, Aloes, Frankincense, Superstitious Custom for the Production of Good Camphor, Description of Nutmeg, Mace, Arrival at Kukula, Customs in Java, Voyage in the Pacific, Arrival at the Country of Tavalisi, Warlike Character of its Inhabitants and of the Women in Particular, Keluka, reigning queen, apparently of Turkish extraction, regiment of women. We then left this place, and in fifteen days arrived at the island of Java, the place from whence the incense of Java receives its name. This is a green and blooming island. The greater part of its trees are the cocoa, the falfel, and the beetle nut, cloves, the Indian aloe, the shaki, the baransaki, Barky, grapes, the sweet orange, and the camphor reed. The inhabitants traffic with pieces of tin and gold not melted, but in the ore, as coin. They have not many rich perfumes. More of these are to be found in the countries of the infidels, Hindus, perhaps. Nor are there many in the Mohammedan countries. 
when we had arrived at the shores of this place we put into the port which is a small village in which there are some houses as well as magazines for the merchants and from this the city of sumatra is at the distance of four miles at that place resides the king when we had got into port the magistrate of the place wrote to the king informing him of my arrival who sent one of his nobles and the judge who attended the presence to meet me with him was sent one of the king's own saddle horses for myself and other horses for my companions i mounted therefore and set out for sumatra the king at that time was el malik el zahir jamal adin one of the most eminent and generous of princes of the sect of shafia and a lover of the professors of mohammedan law the learned are admitted to his society and hold free converse with him while he proposes questions for their discussion he is a great hero for the faith and so humble that he walks to his prayers on the friday he is too strong for his infidel neighbors they therefore pay tribute to him the inhabitants of his districts are of the sect of shafia and they attend him willingly on his warlike expeditions when i came to his residence his viceroy met me in an obliging manner bringing with him dresses of honour which he put upon me and upon my companions they then brought us victuals with the falfel nut and beetle leaf after this i returned to the lodgings which they had prepared for me in a garden and had completely furnished with couches and every necessary utensil morning and evening they brought us the tamarisk and other fruits from the vizier on the third day which was the friday they told me that the king was coming to the mosque and that my first interview with him would be there i accordingly went thither and at last the sultan came i saluted him he then took me by the hand and asked me of the king of india and of my travels and i answered him accordingly after prayers he sat and discussed religious questions with the professors of divinity being dressed as they were until the evening this is his and their usual practice nor does he ever come to the mosque except in the garb of a professor of divinity when the evening is past he enters a vestry in the mosque and there changes his robes for those of royalty with an upper garment of richly embroidered silk he then rides to his residence i remained partaking of his hospitality for fifteen days and then requested permission to pursue my journey to china a thing which he is not always prepared to grant he gave me permission however and fitted me out with provisions fruit and money may god reward him he also put me on board a junk bound for china i then proceeded for one and twenty days through his dominions after which we arrived at the city of muljava which is the first part of the territories of the infidels the extent of these territories is that of two months journey in these is found almost every sort of perfume they produce the aloe the kakuli and the kamari kakula and kamara being situated in these countries but in the territories of el malik el zahir and java there is only the frankincense of java camphor some cloves and indian aloes but we will now say what perfumes we ourselves witnessed in the territories both of the moslems and the infidels of this is the frankincense the tree of which is small and about the height of a man its branches are like those of the artichoke the leaves are small and thin and the incense is a gum which is formed in the branches more of this however is found in the territories of the mohammedans than in those of the infidels as to the camphor its tree is a reed like the reed of our own countries except only that it is thicker and the knots are longer the camphor is formed within it and when the reed is broken both camphor and myrrh are found within the knot and of the same form with it but the camphor will not form within the reed until some animal be sacrificed at the root the best camphor is exceedingly cooling and one dram of it will kill by bringing on suffocation this is called with them the cardena it is that at the roots of which a man has been sacrificed young elephants however are sometimes sacrificed instead of a man as to the indian aloe its tree resembles that of the oak except only that its bark is thin its leaves are like those of the oak but it has no fruit nor does the tree grow large its roots are long and extended and are scented within the leaves and trunk however have no perfume within them 
Among the Moslems this tree is considered property, but among the infidels the greatest part of it is not so considered. That which is private property is found at Kakula, and is the best sort. This they sell to the inhabitants of Java for clothing. Of the Kamari species some is soft enough to receive an impression like wax. With regard to the Atas, when one cuts off any of its roots and buries it in the earth for some months, none of its strength will be lost. This is the most wonderful property of it. As to the clove, it is a thick and high tree. It is found in greater numbers in the countries of the infidels than of the Moslems. It is not claimed as property on account of its great abundance. That part of it which is taken into different countries is the Edan, wood. What is called the flowers of the clove in our countries is that which drops from its blossom, and is like the blossom of the orange. The fruit of the clove is the nutmeg, which is known by the scented nut. The bark which forms upon it is the mace. All that has here been related I saw with my own eyes. From this place we went on to the port of Kukula. It is a beautiful city surrounded with a stone wall of such a breadth that three elephants may walk abreast upon it. The first thing I saw upon its shores was the wood of the Indian aloe, placed upon the backs of elephants. This they lay up in their houses just as we do firewood, except that it is cheaper among them. The merchants will purchase a whole elephant load of it for one cotton dress, which is with these people more precious than silk. Elephants are in very great abundance here and are used for riding and burden. Each man ties his elephant to his door. The shopkeepers tie them to their shops, and in the evening they will ride out, purchase, and bring home anything they may want upon them. This is the custom of all the people of China and Kota. The king of Muljava is an infidel. I was introduced to him without his palace. He was then sitting on the bare ground, and his nobles were standing before him. His troops are presented before him on foot, no one in these parts having a horse except the king, for they ride on elephants generally. The king, on this occasion, called me to him, and I went. He then ordered a carpet to be spread for me to sit upon. I said to his interpreter, How can I sit upon a carpet while the sultan sits upon the ground? He answered, This is his custom, and he practices it for the sake of humility. But you are a guest and besides you come from a great prince. It is therefore right that you should be distinguished. I then sat, and he asked me about the king, Jamal Odin, to which I gave suitable replies. He then said, You are now my guest for three days. You may then return. I one day saw in the assembly of this prince a man with a knife in his hand which he placed upon his own neck. He then made a long speech, not a word of which I could understand. He then firmly grasped the knife, and its sharpness and the force with which he urged it were such, that he severed his head from his body, and it fell on the ground. I was wondering much at the circumstance when the king said to me, Does any among you do such a thing as this? I answered, I never saw one do so. He smiled and said, These our servants do so out of their love for us. He then ordered the body to be taken up and burnt. He next went out in procession to the burning in front of his prime minister, the rest of his nobles, his army, and the peasantry, and on this occasion he made provision for the family and relations of the deceased, whose memory is greatly honored in consequence of this act. One who had been present at the assembly told me that the speech he made was a declaration of his love to the sultan, and that on this account he had killed himself, just as his father had done for the father of the present king, and his grandfather for the king's grandfather. I then returned, but was sent for by the king to be his guest for the three days. After this I proceeded by sea, and after a voyage of four and thirty days came into the calm, that is, the still, sea. It has a red appearance which is thought to be occasioned by the lands near it. This sea has neither wind, wave, nor motion, notwithstanding its extent. It is on account of the calm state of this sea that three other vessels are attached to each of the Chinese junks, by which these junks, together with their own cargoes, are carried forward by oars. Of these there are twenty large ones which may be compared to the masts of ships. To each oar thirty men are appointed and stand in two rows. By this means they draw the junks along, being connected by strong ropes like cables. 
This sea we passed in seven and thirty days, which we did with the greatest ease. We then came to the country of Tawalizi, which is thus named after its king, as is also his whole country. It is extensive, and the king will oppose the emperor of China. He possesses a great number of junks, and with these he will fight the Chinese until they offer conditions of peace. The people are all idolaters, handsome in appearance and resembling the Turks. They are much inclined to a copper color. They have great bravery and strength. Their women ride on horseback. They excel in throwing the javelin and will fight like men in battle. We put into one of their ports, which is near Keluka, one of their largest and most beautiful cities. The magistrate of this place is a daughter of the king, Wahi Arduya. She sent for the persons who were in the ship and entertained them, and when she was informed of my being there, she also sent for me. I went to her and saw her upon the throne of government. Before her were her women with papers in their hands on the affairs of state which they presented to her. She saluted and welcomed me in Turkish. Then she called for ink and paper in my presence and wrote with her own hand the bismillah, and showed it to me. She then inquired about the countries I had seen, and of these I gave her suitable information. She said, I wonder at the great wealth of India, but I must conquer it for myself. She then ordered me some dresses with money and provisions for my journey, and treated me with great politeness. I was told that in the army of this queen there is a regiment of women who fight with her like men, that she made war upon a certain king who was her enemy, and that when her army was near being put to the rout she made so furious an onset upon the king with her regiment that she overcame him, put him to death, and routed his whole force. She then took possession of all he had and brought the slaughtered king's head to her father, who accordingly gave her the government of these parts. The neighboring princes have made her offers of marriage, which she has refused to accept except on one condition only, namely that such persons shall overcome her in the tournament. Of this, however, they have always been, of this, however, they have always been afraid, dreading the reproach of being vanquished by her. End of section eleven. Recording by Philip Gould. Section twelve of the Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 23 China. Arrival in China. Its Great River. Its Course. Culture. Population. Plenty. Porcelain. Idolaters reigning monarch, a descendant of Genghis Khan, Mohammedan colleges, etc. Luxury of the Chinese, wealth, paper money, revenue, how the porcelain is made, skill of Chinese artificers, painters, pictures of travelers, registry of ship's crew, care taken of merchants' property at inns, etc., female slaves cheap, inns subject to the magistrate, the port El Zaytun, meets an officer of the emperor of Delhi, provided with a house, etc., sets out to visit the king, Sin Kilan, Mohammedan town, Meets with a Jogi, return to El Zaytun, arrives at Fan Jan Fur, description of it, Bayram Katlu, El Kansan, Jews and Christians here, jugglers, the Khan killed in battle, funeral, successor, disaffection, return. We then left the countries of Tialisi and arrived after a voyage of seven days with a favorable wind at the first of the Chinese provinces. This is a most extensive country and abounds in good things of every description, 
fruits, agriculture, gold and silver, and in these it is without a parallel. It is divided by a river called the Water of Life. It is also called the River of Sibar, like the name of a river in India. It has its rise in the mountains, which are in the neighborhood of the city Khan Balik, called the Mountain of the Apes. It then proceeds through the middle of China for a distance of six months, until it passes by Sin El Sin, both banks of which are covered with villages and farms, just like the Nile of Egypt, except that this is much more populous. In China grows the sugar cane, and is much better than that of Egypt. All the fruits of our countries are found in China, but they are much more plentiful and cheap than they are with us. As to the China earthen war, it is made only in the districts of El Zaitun and Sin Kilan. It is made of earth of the mountains of those parts, which is burned through like charcoal. To this they add the stone, which they keep in the fire for three days. They then pour water upon it, and it becomes like dust. It is then fermented for some days, the best of it for five and thirty days, that which is inferior for fifteen, ten, or fewer. Of this war, some is transported to other countries. The Chinese hen is large, but the cock is still larger and greater than our goose. Its eggs are proportionately large. The Chinese are all infidels. They worship images and burn their dead, just like the Hindus. The king of China is a Tartar and one of the descendants of Genghis Khan, who entered the Mohammedan countries and desolated many of them. In all the Chinese provinces there is a town for the Mohammedans, and in this they reside. They also have cells, colleges, and mosques, and are made much of by the kings of China. The Chinese generally will eat the flesh of dogs and swine, both of which are sold in their markets. They are much addicted to the comforts and pleasures of life, but they do not much differ either in their luxuries or their dress, for you will see one of their merchants, whose wealth is almost immense, clothed in the coarsest cotton. The only difference generally observable among the inhabitants of China consists in the gold and silver plate which they severally possess. In the hand of every one of them is a staff upon which he supports himself in walking, and this they call the third leg. Silk is most plentiful among them, for the silkworm is found sticking and feeding upon the trees in all their districts, and hence they make their silk which is the clothing of the poorest among them. Were it not for the merchants, it would bring no price whatever, and still a cotton dress will purchase many silken ones. It is a custom with their merchants for one to melt down all the gold and silver he may have into pieces, each of which will weigh a talent or more, and to lay this up over the door of his house. Anyone who happens to have five such pieces will put a ring upon his finger. If he have ten, he will put on two. He who possesses fifteen such is named El Sashi, and the piece itself they call 
a racala. Their transactions are carried on with paper. They do not buy or sell either with the dirham or the dinar. But should anyone get any of these into his possession, he would melt them down into pieces. As to the paper, every piece of it is in extent about the measure of the palm of the hand, and is stamped with the king's stamp. Five and twenty of such notes are termed a shat, which means the same thing as a dinar with us. But when these papers happen to be torn or worn out by use, they are carried to their house, which is just like the mint with us, and new ones are given in place of them by the king. This is done without interest, the profit arising from their circulation accruing to the king. When anyone goes to the market with a dinar or a dirham in his hand, no one will take it until it has been changed for these notes. With respect to the earth which they lay up, it is mere tempered clay, like the dry clay with us. It is carried upon elephants, and then cut into pieces, just like charcoal. They then harden it with fire, but in a more intense heat than that of charcoal. When it is reduced to ashes, they knead it with water, dry it, and again burn it in the same manner until the particles entirely disappear. Of these they make the China vessels, as we have formerly stated. The people of China are in other respects the most skillful artificers. In painting, none come near to them. Of what I myself witnessed was the following. I once scarcely entered one of their cities, some time after, I had occasion again to visit it, and what should I see upon its walls, and upon papers stuck up in the streets, but pictures of myself and my companions. This is constantly done with all who pass through their towns, and should any such stranger do anything to make flight necessary, they would then send out his picture to the other provinces, and wherever he might happen to be, he would be taken. It is also a practice with them that when a vessel leaves China, an account, as well of the names as of the forms of the men in it, is taken and laid up. When the vessel returns, the servants of the magistrates board it, and compare the persons in it with the descriptions taken. And if one should happen to be missing, the commander of the vessel is taken, unless he can prove that the man has died by some sickness or other circumstance, or that he has left him with his own consent in some other of the Chinese provinces. After this, they require of the commander a register of all the goods in the vessel, which they obtain. The people of the vessel then leave it, and the king's servants take possession of and clear it, and if they find anything in it not entered in the register, the vessel, together with its freightage, is forfeited to the king. This is a species of oppression which I witnessed nowhere else. When any Mohammedan merchant visits those Mohammedan towns which are among the Chinese, it is left to his choice whether he will take up his lodgings with a native merchant or whether he will go to an inn. If he prefers 
lodging with the merchant, an account of all he has is taken, and the native merchant is made surety for the amount, who spends upon his guest just as much as is proper. When the foreign merchant wishes to go, an inquire is set on foot with respect to his property, and if anything is found to have been made away with, the merchant who was made surety makes it good by fine. But should the stranger prefer going to an inn, his property is delivered up to the innkeeper, who is made surety for it. He then expends what is necessary upon him, and this is put down to account. When he wishes to leave, an account of the property is taken, and should anything be missing, the innkeeper who is surety is forced to make it good. If, however, he wishes to have a concubine, he may buy a female slave and reside with her in the inn. Female slaves are very cheap in China, because the inhabitants consider it no crime to sell their children, both male and female. They do not, however, force them to travel with their purchases, nor, on the other hand, do they hinder them from doing so, should they prefer it. In like manner, if one wishes to marry, he may do so, but in any case he is not allowed wantonly to destroy his own property. For they say we are unwilling that, that it should be reported among the Mahomedans that our country is a place of wantonness and profligacy, or that merchants lose their wealth among us. The care they take of travelers among them is truly surprising, and hence their country is to travelers the best and the safest. For here a man may travel alone for nine months together with a great quantity of wealth without the least fear. The reason of this is there is in every district an inn over which the magistrate of the place has control. Every evening the magistrate comes with his secretary to the inn and registers in a book the names of all the inmates who are strangers. He then locks them up. In the morning, he comes again with his secretary and compares the name written down with the person of everyone in the inn. The register so made out, he sends by a messenger to the presiding magistrate at the next station, from whom he also brings back vouchers that such and such persons have safely arrived with their property. This is done at every station. When any person happens to be lost, or anything is stolen, and this is discovered, the magistrate, who has the control over the inn in which the loss is sustained, is taken into custody on that account. In all the inns, everything that a traveler can want is provided. The first city I came to in China was El Zaitun. There are, however, no olives here, nor indeed in all China or India. This is merely the name of the place. It is a large city, and in it they make the best flowered and colored silks as well as satins, which are, therefore, preferred to those made in other places. Its port is one of the finest in the world. I saw in it about one hundred large junks. The small vessels are innumerable. It is a large estuary of the sea, running into the land until it meets the great river. In this and other Chinese towns, each inhabitant has a garden and some land, in the center of which is his house, 
and on this account it is that their cities are so large. On the day of my arrival at this place I saw the emir, who had been sent ambassador to the emperor of India, and who returned with us to Malabar, when the junk foundered and went down. He, however, escaped with his life. He told the officer of the Diwan of me, who placed me in a very handsome house. I was afterwards visited in this by the Mohammedan judge, the Sheikh El Islam, and a number of the Mohammedan merchants who treated me with great respect and made a feast for me. These merchants are on account of their residing in an infidel country, extremely glad whenever a Mohammedan comes among them. On such occasions, they give him alms of their wealth, so that he returns rich like themselves. When the magistrate of the city heard of my arrival, he wrote immediately to the Khan, who is their emperor, to acquaint him of my having come from India. I requested of him, however, that he would send a person to bring me to Sin Kilan, to the emir of that place, until he should receive the Khan's answer. To this the magistrate agreed, and sent a person with me who conducted me to him. I embarked, therefore, in a vessel on the river, and made a voyage of twenty-seven days, in each of which we put into some village about noon, bought what we happened to want, then said our prayers, and proceeded on in the evening. On the next, this was repeated, and so on, till we got to Sin Kilan. At this place, as well as El Zaitun, the earthen war is made, at later of which the river called the water of life enters the sea, and which they therefore call the conjunction of two seas. This Sin Kilan is one of their greatest and best formed cities. In the middle of it is a great temple which was built by one of their kings. This he endowed with the revenue of the city and of the surrounding villages. In these are apartments for the sick, the aged, the blind, and the great fakir sheikhs, and the endowment affords them provisions in great plenty. A picture of this king is painted in the temple and worshipped by the inmates. In a certain part of this province is a town in which the Mohammedans reside. It has a market, a mosque, and a cell for the poor. Here is also a judge and a sheikh al-Islam. Nor is there any doubt that there must be in all the towns of China Mohammedan merchants who have a judge and a sheikh al-Islam to whom their matters are referred. In this place I resided with one of the merchants and remained among them for fourteen days, during which time not a day passed without my receiving presents from them. Beyond this city, neither the Mohammedans nor infidels of China have another. Between it and the obstruction of Gog and Magog, there is, as I was told, a distance of sixty days. The people who inhabit that place eat all the men they can overcome, and hence it is that no one goes to those parts. I did not see anyone, however, in these parts, who had either seen the obstruction himself, or who had seen one who had seen it. I was also told in Sin Kilan that a considerable personage was in that neighborhood, who was upwards of two hundred years old, that he never ate, drank, spoke, or took any delight wherever in the world. His powers were so great and so perfect, 
and that he lived in a cave without the city, in which also his devotions were carried on. I went to the cave and saw him at the door. He was exceedingly thin and of copper color. He had marks of a devotional character about him, but had no bird. When I saluted him, he seized my hand and smelled it. He then said to the interpreter, This man is just as much attached to this world as we are to the next. He said to me, You have seen a wonder. Do you remember when you came to an island in which there was a temple and a man sitting among the images who gave you ten dinars of gold? I answered, I do. He rejoined, I am the man. I then kissed his hand. He then considered for a little time and went into the cave, seeming to repent of what he had said. And as he did not come out again, we forced ourselves and went in after him. Him, however, we did not find. But there was one of his companions who had before him a number of the paper notes. These, said he, are your feast, so go back. I said, we wait for the old man. He replied, if you stay here for ten years, you will not see him, for it is his practice that when he has exhibited one of his mysteries to anyone, that man sees him no more nor suppose that he is absent. The fact is, he is now present. I much wondered at this, and returned. I have, on a former occasion, related the affair of the jogi who gave us the dinars, when among the images in the temple of a certain island. After this I told the story of the old man to the judge of the town, and the sheikh al-Islam, who said, such is his general practice with those strangers who go to see him. But no one knows what religion he is of. The person, continued he, that you supposed to be one of his companions was the old man himself. I have been told, too, that he had disappeared for about fifty years, but returned to this place within the last year that the sultan and others beneath him visit the old man, and that he gives each of them presents suitable to his station. He gives presents, in like manner, to the poor who visit him. In the cave in which he lives, there is nothing to attract the attention, and his discourse is of times that are past. He will occasionally speak of the prophet, and say, had I been with him, I would have assisted him. He also speaks of Omar ibn Khattab, and with peculiar respect of Ali, son of Abu Talib. I was told by Alhad Odin of Sanjar, the head of the merchants, that he one day entered the cave, when the old man took him by the hand. I had, said he, immediately the idea that i was in a large palace that the sheikh was sitting in it upon a throne with a crown on his head and his servants standing before him i thought i saw the fruits falling into streams there and taking one to eat i found myself in the cave standing before him and him laughing at me i had however a severe fit of sickness in consequence of this which did not leave me for some month after this i visited him no more the people of this country think he is a mohammedan but no one has seen him pray though he is constantly fasting i now returned to the city of el zaitun by the river and soon after my arrival came the answer of the khan to his lieutenant there 
in which it was ordered that I should be honorably provided for and sent to the presence either by land or by the river as I might choose. They accordingly provided me with vessels and servants, and I proceeded at the charge of the sultan by the river, leaving one village in the morning and arriving at another in the evening. This we did for ten days, and then arrived at the city of Fanjanfur, which is a large and handsome place, situated in a plain and surrounded with gardens, something like the plain of Damascus. Here I was met by the church, the presbyters of Islamism, and the merchants, with the emir of the city and the officers of his forces, by whom the emperor is entertained in the most honorable manner. I accordingly entered the city. It has four walls. Between the first and second of these are the emperor's servants, who watch the city. Between the second and the third are the troops of cavalry and the city magistrate. Between the third and fourth are the Mohammedans, where also I took up my residence with their sheikh, Zair Odin. Within the fourth wall are the Chinese, and this is the largest part of the city. It was strange enough that one day, when I was at a feast which they had made for me, in came one of the great Mohammedan fakirs, whom they welcomed by the title of the Sheikh Kawam Odin. After the salutation, and his joining our society, I was wondering at his appearance, and had looked on him for some time when he said, Why do you continue looking at me, unless you know me? I then asked him of his native place. He said it was Subta, Ceuta. I said, Well, I am from Tangiers. He then renewed his salute and wept, and at this I wept too. I then asked whether he had been in India. He said, yes, at the palace in Delhi. When he said this, he came to my recollection, and I said, Are you El Bashri? He said, yes. He had come to Delhi with my uncle, Abul Qasim El Mursi, when he was young and before a bird had appeared on his cheek. He was then one of the most clever at retaining the Quran by memory and of those termed benchers. I had mentioned him to the Emperor of India, who accordingly wished to retain him in office, but this he did not accept of. His wish was to go to China. The emperor had given him three thousand dinars, and he had then set out for China. In China he was put in office among the Mohammedans and became possessed of great wealth. After this, he sent me several presents. His brother I met some time after in Sudan. What a distance between these true brothers. In Kanjura, I resided fifteen days. I then proceeded by the river, and after four days arrived at the city of Bairam Katlu, which is a small place, the inhabitants of which are very hospitable. In this place, there were not more than four Mohammedans with one of whom I resided for three days, and then proceeded by the river a voyage of ten days, and arrived at the city of El Kanza. The name of this place is similar to that of the poetess El Kanza, but I do not know whether the word is Arabic or not, or whether the Arabic has any agreement or not with their language. 
This is the largest city I had ever seen on the face of the earth. Its length is a journey of three days, in which a traveler may proceed on and find lodgings. It is as we have already said of the manner of building among the Chinese, so construct that each inhabitant has his house in the middle of his land and garden ground. The city is divided into six cities, all of which are surrounded by a wall, and of which we shall presently say more. When we approached this city, we were met by its church, the presbyters of Islamism and the great merchants. The Mohammedans are exceedingly numerous here. This whole city is surrounded by a wall. Each of the six cities is also surrounded by a wall. In the first reside the guards with their commander. I was told that in the muster rolls these amount to twelve thousand. I lodged one night in the house of the commander. In the second division are the Jews, Christians, and the Turks who worship the sun. These are numerous, their number is not known, and theirs is the most beautiful city. Their streets are well disposed, and their great men are exceeding wealthy. There are in the city a great number of Mohammedans, with some of whom I resided for fifteen days, and was treated most honorably. The third division is the seat of the government. In this resides the chief commander of all China, with the forces. When I entered its gate, my companions were separated from me, on account of the press, and I remained alone. I was here met by the prime minister, who carried me to the house of the commander of the forces, the emir Karti. This was the person of whom I have already given some account cast his eyes upon the goat's hair garment which had been given me by the friend of god the sheikh jalal odin of shiraz this fourth city is the most beautiful of all the six it is intersected by three rivers i was entertained by the emir karti in his own house in a most splendid manner he had brought together to this feast the great men of both the mohammedans and chinese we had also musicians and singers i stayed with him one night at the banquet where present the khan's jugglers the chief of whom was ordered to show some of his wonders he then took a wooden sphere in which there were holes and in these long straps and threw it up into the air till it went out of sight as i myself witnessed while the strap remained in his hand he then commanded one of his disciples to take hold of and to ascend by this strap which he did until he also went out of sight his master then called him three times but no answer came he then took a knife in his hand apparently in anger, which he applied to the strap. This also ascended till it went quite out of sight. He then threw the hand of the boy upon the ground, then his foot, then his other hand, then his other foot, then his body, then his head. He then came down, panting for breath, and his clothes stained with blood. The man then kissed the ground before the general, who addressed him in Chinese, and gave him some other order. The juggler then took the limbs of the boy and applied them one to another. He then stamped upon them, and it stood up complete and erect. I was astonished, and was seized in consequence by a palpitation at the heart. But they gave me some drink, and I recovered. The judge of the Mohammedans was sitting by my side, who swore that there was neither assent 
descent nor cutting away of limbs but the whole was mere juggling on this very night i entered the fifth city which is the largest of them it is inhabited by the common chinese people among whom are the most ingenious artificers in this place are made the kansawia garments the most wonderful things they make are dishes composed of reeds glued together and painted over with colors such that when hot meat is put into them they do not change their color ten of these may be put into one another and the person seeing them would suppose them to be only one for these they have a cover which contains them all and their softness is such that should they fall from a height they would not break they are wonderful productions after this i entered the sixth city which is inhabited by sailors fishermen sheep caulkers and carpenters i was told after this by the wealthy mohammedans that some of the relations of the great khan had revolted and that they had collected an army and gone out to give him battle they had collected an hundred companies of cavalry each company of which amounted to ten thousand the sultan had on this occasion of his own particular friends and stipendiaries fifty thousand cavalry and of foot soldiers five hundred thousand he was also opposed by the greater part of the nobles who agreed that he ought to abdicate the throne because he disregarded the regulations of the yazak laid down by his ancestor Genghis khan they accordingly went over to the side of his uncle's son who had set up a claim against him they also wrote to the khan advising him to abdicate the throne and promising that the province of el kansa should be apportioned to him this he refused to accede to and gave them battle but after a few days he was put to the rout and killed before he had arrived at his palace the news of this soon came to the city and drums and trumpets were sounded accordingly during the space of two months for joy at the accession of the new khan the khan who had been killed with about a hundred of his relatives was then brought and a large sepulchre was dug for him under the earth in which a most beautiful couch was spread and the khan was with his weapons laid upon it with him they placed all the gold and silver vessels he had in his house together with four female slaves and six of his favorite mamluks with a few vessels of drink they were then all closed up and the earth heaped upon them to the height of a large hill they then brought four horses which they pierced through at the hill until all motion in them ceased they then forced a piece of wood into the hinder part of the animal till it came out at his neck and this they fixed in the earth leaving the horses thus impaled upon the hill the relatives of the khan they buried in the same manner putting all their vessels of gold and silver in the grave with them at the door of the sepulchres of ten of these they impelled three horses in the manner just mentioned at the graves of each of the rest only one horse was impaled this was a notable day all the people of the city chinese mohammedans and others were present to the occasion and had on their mourning which consists of a sort of white hood i know of no other people 
who do so on such occasions. When, however, the former emperor was killed and Firun, the son of his uncle, who had made war against him, had been put in power, he chose to fix his residence at Kora Karun on account of its nearness to the territories of his uncle, the king of Turkestan, and Mawara el Nar. But those nobles who had not been present at the death of the former Khan revolted. Upon this occasion they stopped up the roads, and the disaffection spread itself like a flame. The leading men among the Mohammedans advised me to return to the city of El Zaitun before the confusion should become general, and accordingly they petitioned the minister of King Firun to give me permission, which he did, with an order for my maintenance according to custom. End of section 12、13、of the Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 24. Returns by the River to El Zaitun. Sails for Sumatra, driven by adverse winds. At length gets to Sumatra. Marriage ceremony. Sails for Hindustan. Arrived at Kalam. Calicut. Zophar in Arabia. Mosque at El Tarayat. Port of Shia. Kelba. Telhan. Hormuz. Khuzestan. Lar. Janjabul. Khaldun. Hakun. Saman. Saba. Shiraz. Isfahan. Basra. Kufa. Ambar. Damascus, Aleppo, El Khalil, Damietta, Cairo, Idab, Jeddah, Mecca, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Yarba, Fez, Tangira, Tangiers, Gibraltar, Gibraltar, Andalusia. I then returned by the river descending from El Kanza to Kanjafur. And thence to the city of El Zaitun. When I got there, I found some junks bound for India, and got into one belonging to El Malik El Zahir, king of Sumatra, whose servants are Mohammedans. In this we sailed with a good wind for ten days. The sky then became obscure and dark, and a storm arose, in consequence of which the vessel got into a sea unknown to the sailors. The people in the junk were all terribly afraid and wished to put back, but it was impossible. After this, we saw one morning at daybreak a mountain in the sea at the distance of about twenty miles, and towards this the wind was carrying us. The sailors wondered at this because we were far from land and because no mountain had been observed in that part of the sea. It was certain that if the wind should force us to it, we should be lost. We then betook ourselves to repentance and prayer to Almighty God with all our hearts, and in addition to this, the merchants made many vows. The wind then became calm in some degrees, when after sunrise we perceived the mountain we had seen was in the air, and that we could see light between it and the sea. I was much astonished at this, but seeing the sailors in the utmost perturbation and bidding farewell to one another, I said, Pray, what is the matter? They said, What we suppose to be a mountain is really a roch, and if he sees us, we shall assuredly perish. There being now between us and him a distance of ten miles only. But God, in his goodness, gave us a good wind, and we steered our course in a direction from him so that we saw no more of him, nor had we any knowledge of the particulars of his shape. After two months from this day, we got to Java, and shortly after landed at Sumatra. Here we met with the king of the place, El Malik El Zahir, just returning from a victory and bringing many captives with him. He received us very honorably and supplied us with everything necessary. He was then about to marry his son and heir. I was present at the wedding and witnessed the closeting. It was a strange ceremony. I never saw anything like it elsewhere. 
It was this. They set up a large sort of pulpit in the courtyard of the palace, and covered it with silk. The bride then came from the inner apartments on foot. With her were about forty ladies carrying her train. These were the ladies of the sultan, his nobles and ministers. They were all unveiled and exposed to the gaze of high and low. This, however, is not customary among them except on the occasion of some noble marriage. The bride now ascended the pulpit, preceded by musicians and singers, male and female, who danced and sang. After this came the bridegroom, who was the king's son, mounted on an elephant and sitting on a throne placed on the back of the animal. Over his head was an awning. He had a crown on, and on the right and left were about a hundred young men, sons of governors, ministers, and generals. These were all clothed in white and riding on horses caparisoned. On their heads were caps set with gold and jewels, and every one of them was beardless. When the prince came in, dirhams and dinars were scattered among the people. The sultan himself sat and witnessed the whole. The prince then alighted and walked to his father, and taking hold of his foot, kissed it. He then ascended the pulpit to the bride, who rose to him and kissed his hand. He then sat by her side, the lady standing before them richly dressed out. The falfel nut and beetle leaf were then brought in, and the bridegroom, taking some in his hand, put it into her mouth. The bride next took some and put it into his mouth. The bridegroom then took a beetle leaf and put it into his mouth, then into hers. The bride did the same to him. The covering of the pulpit was then let down upon them, and the whole was carried into the interior of the palace. When the people had feasted themselves, they all dispersed. I remained in this island for two months as the king's guest. I then was put on board one of the junks, the sultan having presented me with some lignum aloes, camphor, cloves, sandalwood, and provisions. I then set sail for Kalam, where I arrived after a voyage of forty days. After this I went to Calicut in Malabar. I then went aboard a vessel, and after a voyage of eight and twenty days came to Zafar. This was in the month of Morum in the year 48, i.e., A.H. 748, April, A.D. 1347. At this time I found its king, El-Malik El-Nasir, son of El-Malik El-Mogith, the same person who reigned when I formerly visited this place. From this place I sailed to Mascot el Toriat, then to the port of Shia, then to the port of Kelba, the name of which is the feminine form of Kelb, a dog, then to Telhan, all which places are subject to the government of Hormuz, but are considered as belonging to Amman. I then proceeded to Hormuz and stayed there three days. From this place I went to Kuristan, Khuzestan, and from thence to Lar, then to Janjabal, from this place to Khaldun, where I remained three days. I then proceeded to Hakan, then to Saman, then to the city of Saba, and thence to Shiraz, when I found Abu Ishaq, the reigning king, but who was then absent from Shiraz. I then went on to Mayin, then to Bazdakash, Yedzkash, then to Khalil, then to Kansak, then to Isfahan, then to Tostar, then to El Hawer, Hawaiza, then to Basra, then to Meshkidali ibn Abi Talib, then to Kufa, then to Sarsar, then to Baghdad, where I arrived in the month of Shawal in the year 48, i.e. 748, the king of which was at this time the Sheikh Hassan, son of the aunt of the Sultan Abu Said. After this I proceeded to the city of Ambar, then to Heat, then to Haditha, then to Anna, then to El Raba, then to El Sakna, then to Tadmor, then to Damascus of Syria. The whole time of my absence, from which had been twenty full years, the chief judge of the sect of Shafia was now Tadik Adin al Sabki. From this place I went to Aleppo and then returned to Damascus, then to Jerusalem, then to the city of El Khalil, Hebron, then to Gaza, then to Damietta, then to Fariskur, then to El Mahala El Kobra, or the Great Station, then to Damanhur, then to Alexandria, then to Cairo. At this time there was a general plague throughout Egypt. I was told that the number of those who died daily in Cairo amounted to 120,000. The reigning prince at this time I entered Egypt was El-Malik el Nasser Hassan ibn El-Malik el Nasser Muhammad ibn Kalawun.
I then proceeded from Cairo on the way to Upper Egypt for Idom. There I took shipping and got to Jedda, then to Mecca, may God ennoble it. I arrived at this place in the month of Shaban, in the ninth and fortieth year, A.H. 749, and in this year I performed the pilgrimage. I then returned with a Syrian caravan to Taiba, the city of the Prophet. I visited his grave and returned with them to Jerusalem. I then hired a passage back to Cairo, but as a desire of seeing my native country now came upon me, I prepared to take my journey to the west. I travelled accordingly to Alexandria, and in the month of Safar, A.H. 750, I set sail and arrived at the island of Jarba. From this place I sailed in another vessel to Fez, then to Safakis, then to Milyana, then to the city of Tunis, then to Tilimson, then to the palace of Fez, where I arrived in the latter part of the month Shaban in the year 750. The reigning king at this time was the commander of the faithful Abu Anan. I presented myself to him and was honoured by a sight of him. The awe that surrounded him made me forget that of the king of Iraq, his elegance that of the emperor of India, his politeness that of the king of Yemen, his bravery that of the king of the Turks, his mildness that of the emperor of Constantinople, his religious carriage that of the emperor of Turkestan his knowledge that of the king of sumatra for he so overwhelmed me with his favours that i found myself quite unequal to express my gratitude in fez too i terminated my travels after i had assured myself that it is the most beautiful of countries the poet has truly said of it ask me my proof why in the west countries you find the sweetest best tis this Hence rides the full-orbed moon, and hither hastes the sun at noon. It was now my wish to visit the tomb of my father, and accordingly I left Fez for Tangiers. From that place I went to Subta. It then occurred to me that I should have pleasure in the warfare for the faith. I therefore set sail from Subta to Spain, and the first place I saw was the Hill of Victory. This is one of the greatest refuges of Islamism and one which forced sorrow down the necks of the idolaters. From this place commenced Islamism in the great victory, for here landed Tariq ibn Zaid, the slave of Musa ibn Nasir, at the time of his passing over to Spain. From this circumstance it was named after him and called Jabal Tariq, corruptedly Gibraltar. It is also called the Hill of Victory because his beginnings had their commencement here but a despicable foe had had possession of this place for about twenty years until our lord the sultan abu el hassan reduced him and sent his son with an army which he strengthened with many reinforcements and obtained a complete victory he then rebuilt and strengthened its fortifications and walls and stored it with cavalry treasure and warlike machines this was one of his good deeds the effects of which still remain i proceeded from the hill of victory gibraltar which is one of the most extensive and handsome strongholds of islamism where i had met its celebrated and learned men of whom one was my maternal uncle's son abu el qasim ibn batuta after i had remained there some days and then went to the city of marbella which is a strong and handsome place from this place i went to the city of malaga one of the chief cities of andalusia its charming districts lie together and enjoy the advantages of both sea and land it abounds with excellent production, so that eight radis of grapes are sold for a small dinar. Its figs and pomegranates are unequalled. From this place I travelled to the city of Tabsh, from that to Hama, which is a small town and in which there are warm springs. I then went to Granada, the chief city of Andalusia, which for its structures and suburbs is unequalled in the whole world. It is divided by the well-known river Chenille, Besides this, however, there are many other rivers, as well as cisterns, gardens, orchards, and palaces, surrounding it on all sides. The king of Granada was at this time Abu el-Walid Yusuf ibn Nasir. I never met him on account of a disease under which he then laboured. His noble and excellent mother, however, sent me some dinars for my support. I here met some of the learned men of the place, of whom the most surprising was a young man named Abu Jafar Ahmed ibn Rizwan el Jadhani. His astonishing peculiarity was this, that although he was brought up in a desert and had never either studied or given himself any trouble about learning, yet he produced poetry so good as scarcely to be equalled by the most accomplished writers. The following is a specimen. Friend, 
From whom tis pain to part, take thy station in my heart. Through my eye, its lucid door view the structure o'er and o'er. There enthroned thou'lt always see every chamber filled with thee. But when from thee with pain distressed I feel the void within my breast, my vacant eyes too well declare their favorite inmate is not there. But when thy charms my spirits fill, I close my lids to keep thee still. End of section 13. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 14 of The Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Lou in New York City. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee. Chapter 25 Africa From Granada I went to the Hill of Victory, and from that place took shipping and sailed to Subta, then to Asila, then to Salah. This is, according to Abulfeda, an ancient and thickly inhabited city, having on its west the ocean, and on its south a river, with gardens and vineyards. It is said that Abd el Mumin its high priest built a large palace on the bank of the river on its south and adjoining the sea and that his followers choosing the parts adjoining built the city which was called el media salah it is added is a moderate sized district of the extreme western division and the nearest part of it to spain its soil consists mostly of red sand the river is large and is subject to the reflux of the tide. The city abounds with provisions. The districts subject to its rule are on its south and are called Tamazna, abounding with cultivation and pasturage. I then traveled from Salah by land to Marrakesh, which is a most beautiful city of extensive trade and territory. One of its poets has thus described it. Morocco blessed in sight in health brave in nobles great in wealth here will the homeless wanderer find welcome to cheer his drooping mind one only doubt can now remain such as to give a moment's pain whether the eye or ear can boast the privilege of blessing most from this place i went to miknasa near fez and situated on its north it is remarkable for the great number of its olives. Ibn Said has said that Miknasa consists of two white cities separated from each other the distance of a horse's course. It is one stage from Fez, and its river is called the Fulfal. Fez is, according to Abul Feda, two cities between which runs a river and contains several springs which supply streams both cities have in all thirteen gates the water thus supplied runs into the streets houses and baths a thing witnessed neither in the east nor the west the place was founded since the times of islamism ibn said has related after el hijazi that when they began to dig for the foundations they found an axe a faz in the excavations and hence it took its name it is said that there are within the city and upon its river about three hundred water mills constantly worked by the stream the people are remarkable for the comforts of life which they enjoy el faz is its citadel which is situated on the highest spot in it and through which the river runs there are here three mosques in which there is preaching and from it to subta is a distance of ten days the source of its river is half a day's journey from the city. It then runs through meadows and among flowers until it enters the place. Fez is said, in the Atwal, to be a village of Tangiers. Then I went to the palace of Fez and presented myself to the commander of the faithful, the Sultan Abu Anan. May God give him happiness. 
After this, I bade him farewell with an intention to visit Sudan, and came to Sigilmasa, which is a very handsome city. It produces very many good dates, and in the abundance of these it may be compared with Basra, except only that those of this place are the best. I lodged at this place with the theologian Mohammed el-Bashiri, the brother of him I had seen in the city of Kajanfur in China. I proceeded from this place in the beginning of the month Maharam and of the year 753, February 1352, with a large company of merchants and others, and, after a journey of five and twenty days, arrived at Tagari, a village in which there is nothing good, for its houses and mosque are built with stones of salt and covered with the hides of camels. There is no tree in the place. It has nothing but sand for its soil, and in this are mines of salt. For this they dig in the earth and find thick tables of it, so laid together as if they had been cut and placed underground. No one, however, resides in these houses except the servants of the merchants who dig for the salt and live upon the dates and other things which are brought from Sigilmasa, as well as upon the flesh of camels. Sigilmasa is eastward of Daha and is the capital of the district so called. It has a river which comes from the southeast, divides, and passes by the east and western parts of the city. It abounds in gardens and has eight gates. At which gate, soever of these you go out, you will see the river, the palms, and other trees. Around all the gardens and palms there is a wall intended to keep off the predatory Arabs, and this encloses a space of forty miles. The city adjoins the desert which divides between the western districts and Sudan. No building is to be seen either to the south or west of it. Ibn Said has said that its inhabitants poison dogs and eat them, and that its soil is soft and easy of culture. To them come the people of Sudan from their different districts, and load themselves with the salt, which among them passes for money, just as gold and silver does among other nations. And for this purpose they cut it into pieces of a certain weight, and then make their purchases with it. A handful of salt purchased four or five good-sized fish. The water of Tagari is poisonous. We found it injurious. Of this they take, however, to carry them over the desert, which is twenty stages in extent, and is without water. After passing this, we arrived at Tasala, a stage at which the caravan stop and rest three days, and then prepare to enter the great desert in which there is neither water, bird, nor tree but only sand and hills of sand, which are so blown about by the wind that no vestige of a road remains among them. People can travel, therefore, only by the guides from among the merchants, of which there are many. The desert is, moreover, exposed to the light and is dazzling. We passed it in ten days. We then came to the city of Abu Latin in the beginning of the month Rebia el Awal. This is the first district of Sudan, which, as they say, belongs to a lieutenant of the sultan of the countries of Faba, which means lieutenant. When we had got to this place, the merchants stowed their goods in an open area and charged some blacks with the custody of them. At this place I lodged with a man from Salah, but it was my wish to return from Abu Latin as soon as I had witnessed the vile dispositions of the blacks and the contempt in which they held the white people. It then occurred to me, however, that I would complete my knowledge of these countries, and accordingly we remained at Abu Latin fifty days. It is an exceedingly hot place, with a few small palm trees in it under the shade of which they sow the melon. The water of the place is found in pits, having been absorbed by the sand. Mutton is in great plenty. Their clothing is all brought from Egypt. The greater part of the inhabitants are merchants. Their women are exceedingly beautiful and more respectable than the men. The character of these merchants is strange enough, for they are quite impervious to jealousy. 
No one is named after his father, but after his maternal uncle, and the sister's son always succeeds to property in preference to the son, a custom I witnessed nowhere else except among the infidel Hindus of Malabar. But these are Mohammedans who retain their prayers by memory, study theology, and learn the Quran by rote. As to their women, they are not shy with regard to the men, nor do they veil themselves from them, although they constantly accompany them at prayers. Anyone who wishes to marry one of them may do so, but he must not take her with him out of the country, and even if the woman should wish to go, her family will not allow her. It is a custom among them that a man may have a mistress of women strangers to him who may come and associate with him even in the presence of her own husband and of his wife. In like manner, a man will enter his own house and see the friend of his wife with her alone and talking with her without the least emotion or attempt to disturb them. He will only come in and sit down on one side till the man goes. Upon a certain day, I went in to the judge of Abu Latin, who was an eminent man, at that time my host, and with whom I had formed a friendship. I saw with him a handsome young woman and wished to leave him, for I knew his wife and that this was a different person. The woman smiled at me but did not blush. He said, This is my female friend. She is no stranger. I remonstrated with him and said, This is a strange woman. You are an eminent Ghazi and judge of the Mohammedans. How then can you be alone with her? He said, this is our custom, nor is there any suspicion from our being in society together. He did not, however, benefit by my advice, nor did I visit him after this. I then proceeded from Abu Latin to Mali, the distance of which is a journey of four and twenty days, made with effort. The roads are safe, so I hired a guide and proceeded with three of my companions. These roads abound with trees, which are high and so large that a caravan may shade itself under just one of them. As I passed by one of these trees, I saw a weaver weaving cloth within a cleft of its trunk. Some of these will grow so corrupt that the trunk will become like a well and be filled with the rainwater, and from this the people will drink. Sometimes the bees will be in these, in such numbers that they will be filled with honey, which travelers take for their use. It is affirmed by Ibn Jazi el Kelbi, the epitomator of this work, that there are in Andalusia two chestnut trees, such that a weaver may sit and weave cloth in them. Ibn Battuta proceeds. The gourd grows so large in Sudan that they will cut one into halves, and out of these make two large dishes. The greatest part of their vessels, moreover, are made of the gourd. After ten days from our leaving Abu Latin, we came to the village Zagari, which is large and inhabited by black merchants. Among these lives a number of white people of the Abadzia sect of heretics. We then left this place and came to the great river, which is the Nile. Upon it is the town of Karasanju, from which the Nile descends to Kabara, then to Zaga, the inhabitants of which were the first in these parts to embrace Islamism. They are religious and fond of learning. In the south of this district is the city of Zagawa. The villages of the people of Zagawa and Taju are extended through the space situated upon the windings of the Nile. They are people of the same stock, except that those of Taju are the handsomest and best behaved. It is said in the Azizi that from Dongola to the country of Zagawa westward is a distance of twenty stages. From this place the Nile descends to Tambaktu, then to Kaukau, both of which we shall give some account. It is said by Ibn Said that Kaukau is the residence of the sultan of these parts, and that he is an infidel. Opposite to him on the west are the Muslims of Ghana, and on the east those of El Kanam. This place has a river named after itself, but the place itself is to the eastward of this its river. It is said in the Kanun that Kaukau is situated between the equinoctial line 
and the beginning of the first climate. It is said in the Azizi that the latitude of Koko is ten degrees, and that the inhabitants are Muslims. In the city of Ghana is the residence of the king of the districts of Ghana, who lays claim to being a descendant of Hassan, son of Ali. To this place travel the western merchants from Sigilmasa through an immense desert of fifty days, and from it they bring nothing but red gold. Ibn Said has said that it has a Nile, which is a branch of the Nile of Egypt, and that it flows into the ocean in a longitude of ten and a half degrees, and in the latitude of fourteen degrees, so that between this place and Ghana is a distance of about four degrees. Ghana stands on both sides of its river. It is also said that Ghana contains two cities, one of which is inhabited by Muslims, and the other by infidels. The Nile then proceeds to the town of Muli, which is the extreme district of Mali. It then goes on to Yui, the greatest district of Sudan, and the king of which is the most potent. No white person can enter here, for if he attempt to do so, they will kill him before he reaches it. The Nile then descends from this place to the countries of Nubia, the inhabitants of which are Christians, then to Dongola, which is the largest district they possess, the king of which is named Ibn Khans Odin, who became a Mohammedan in the times of El Malik El Nasir. The Nile then descends to the cataracts, which terminate the regions of Sudan, dividing them from Upper Egypt. From Karsanju, I went to the river Sansara, which is about ten miles from Mali. I then went to the city of Mali, the residence of the king. I there inquired for the residence of the white people and lodged with them. They treated me very honorably. The Mohammedan judge of the blacks, who was a celebrated haji, made me his guest and sent me a present and a cow. I was sick for two months in Mali, but God restored me. It happened that Manai Suleiman, the Sultan of Mali, a most avaricious and worthless man, made a feast by way of kindness. I was present at the entertainment with some of our theologians. When the assembly broke up, I saluted him, having been brought to his knowledge by the theologians. When I had left the place, he sent me a meal, which he forwarded to the house of the judge. Upon this occasion, the judge came walking hastily to me and said, Up, for the sultan has sent you a present. I hastened, expecting that a dress of honor, some horses and other valuables had been sent. But behold, they were only three crusts of bread with a piece of fried fish and a dish of sour milk. I smiled at their simplicity and the great value they set on such trifles as these. I stayed here after this meal two months, but saw nothing from him, although I had often met him in their friendly meetings. I one day, however, rose up in his presence and said, I have traveled the world over, and I have seen its kings, and now I have been four months in thy territories, but no present or even provision from thee has yet reached me. Now what shall I say of thee when I shall be interrogated on the subject hereafter? Upon this he gave me a house for my accommodation with suitable provisions. After this the theologians visited me in the month of Ramadan, and out of their whole number they gave me three and thirty mithkals of gold. Of all people the blacks debase themselves most in presence of their king. For when any one of them is called upon to appear before him, he will immediately put off his usual clothing and put on a worn-out dress with a dirty cap. He will then enter the presence like a beggar, with his clothes lifted up to the middle of his legs. He will then beat the ground with both his elbows and remain in the attitude of a person performing a prostration. When the sultan addresses one of them, he will take up the garment off his back and throw dust upon his head, and as long as the sultan speaks, every one present will remain with his turban taken off. One of the best things in these parts is the regard they pay to justice, for in this respect the sultan regards neither little nor much. The safety, too, is very great, 
so that a traveller may proceed alone among them without the least fear of a thief or robber. Another of their good properties is that when a merchant happens to die among them, they will make no effort to take possession of his property, but will allow the lawful successors to take it. Another is their constant custom of attending prayers with the congregation, for unless one makes haste, he will find no place left to say his prayers in. Another is their insisting on the Qurans being committed to memory, for if a man finds his son defective in this, he will confine him till he is quite perfect, nor will he allow him his liberty until he is so. As to their bad practices, they will exhibit their little daughters, as well as their male and female slaves, quite naked. In the same manner will the women enter into the presence of the king, which his own daughters will also do. Nor do the free women ever clothe themselves till after marriage. The greatest part of them will eat stinking dead bodies, dogs, and asses. I travelled in the next place from Mali, the sultan having given me a hundred mithkals of gold, which place I left in the month of Maharam, in the year 54, A.D. February 1353, and came to a gulf which branches out of the Nile, and upon the banks of which there were very large beasts. I wondered at them, and thought they were elephants, from the great numbers there are in those parts. But when I saw them enter the water, I inquired about them, and was told that they were seahorses, which go out to graze and then return to the water. They are larger than the land horses, and have manes and tails. Their heads are like those of horses, and their legs like those of elephants. I was told by some credible ajis that the infidels of some parts of Sudan will eat men, but that they will eat none but blacks, because, they say, the white are injurious, on account of their not being properly matured and that when their sultan happens to send his ambassadors to one of the kings of the black Mohammedans, and intends to honor them with a feast, he also sends to them a black slave, whom they kill and eat, and then return their thanks for the honor and favor done them. After some days I arrived at the city of Timbaktu, the greater part of the inhabitants of which are merchants from Latham, which is a district of Mali. Here is also a black magistrate, on the part of the Sultan of Mali. I next arrived at the city of Kaukau, which is large and one of the most beautiful in Sudan. Here they transact business with the Kauri, like the inhabitants of Mali. After this I arrived at the city of Bardama, the inhabitants of which protect the caravans. Their women are chaste and handsome. I next arrived at the city of Nakda, which is handsome and built with red stone. Its water runs over copper mines, which changes its color and taste. The inhabitants are neither artisans nor merchants. The copper mine is without Nakda, and in this their slaves are employed, who melt the ore and make it into bars. The merchants then take it into infidel and other parts of Sudan. The sultan of Nakda is a Berber. I met him and was treated as his guest, and was also provided by him with necessaries for my journey. I was afterwards visited by the commander of the faithful in Nakda, who ordered me to wait on him, which I did, and then prepared for my journey. I then left this place in the month of Shaban, in the year 54, A.D. 1353, and traveled till I came to the territories of Hakkar, the inhabitants of which are a tribe of the Berbers, but a worthless people. I next came to Silmasa, and from thence to Fez, the residence of the commander of the faithful, to whom I presented myself and kissed hands. I now finished my travels, and took up my residence in this country. May God be praised. End of section 14. End of the travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translated by Samuel Lee.